All right, I think I got the message that we can start. All right, that's very good. We're up and running. I'm glad to hear that. All right, I will, uh, on behalf of the organizers, uh, Magdalena, Paula, and myself, I would like to welcome you all to our Clothing Identities Conference, which will take place for the next three days. And the conference is organized as part of the international research network, Euroweb, which seeks to rewrite, rewrite the history of Europe based on its production, trade, consumption, and reuse of textiles and dress. Euroweb fosters a pan-European network of scholars from academia, museums, conservation, as well as cultural and creative industries. Scholars from several disciplines of the humanities, philology, art history, archaeology, and history, as well as social sciences, such as social anthropology and ethnology, and the natural sciences, geochemistry and conservation, for example, join forces to bridge current cultural and geographical gaps and facilitate inter interdisciplinary research. Among the aims of this research network is to explore clothing as an expression of identity through various methodological and theoretical approaches spanning the whole geographical area of Europe and surrounding countries. With clothing, human express aspects of identity such as gender, age, beliefs, and social status. Ancient costumes combine skin and textile, wrapping and tailoring. Many clothing elements in antiquity are unisex, but are worn differently according to gender and age. Children's clothes are generally simple, but for example, Roman children express their civil status and gender through clothing. Adults negotiate the changes in their age, body, and status through garments. Poor people, enslaved people, and workers performing hard physical work wear loose-fitting garments, allowing freedom of movement. And late antique sources report on second-hand clothing as an important part of the economy. Members of the elite, on the other hand, display their wealth through luxurious garments, decorated with complex patterns, including precious metals and stones, as well as precious dyes. A legal framework of sumptuary laws and prohibitions and a normative framework of appropriate dress accompanied dress history for at least 2,500 years. Fashionable items are generated from innovations and trade, and they have the capacity to alter body perceptions and gendered features of dress. The objective of this conference is to bring together experts from various disciplines and working on diverse chronological periods from prehistory to the 21st century and geographical areas to address the question of clothing as an expression of identity. Now, our conference is divided into three main themes, and one is age and gender, and the use of textiles and dress to express aspects of identity, particularly age and gender, as part of a nonverbal communication system. How do gender and age through clothing express one's place in the economic, social, and productive spheres in ancient and historical societies? The second topic is clothing regulations, such as the existence of legal and normative frameworks, sumptuary laws and religious prescriptions aimed at regulating dress. How and to which extent did sumptuary laws and prohibitions shape ancient and historical clothing? And the third topic is clothing identities in museums. How can we rethink and remake dress exhibitions in museums in a more inclusive way and discuss a colonial, ethnic, nationalistic and religious markers and symbolism? We also welcome papers presenting various dissemination strategies to prompt interaction between textile collections and museums and the public. And today, Wednesday, we will address the topic of expression of age and gender via dress. And the second topic 
closing regulations will be discussed tomorrow, Thursday, while we on Friday will focus on the third topic of closing identities in museums. And each of the organizers, we will each host uh, one of these days. I will chair today's uh, sessions and tomorrow it will be Magda and Friday Paula Nabais. I will very much look forward to three fruitful and inspiring days and a lot of interesting uh, papers from all of you. And before we start, I will just address a few practicalities. And first, it's to all of the speakers. I kindly urge you to keep to the 20 minutes allocated to present your paper. We have a very tight program, especially today, and we cannot exceed the time. And please note that the session chair, today that is me, will let you know when the 20 minutes are up and you need to end your presentation. I'm really sorry, but if it ends up like that and if it's necessary, I will have to turn off uh, your microphone. And that actually also goes for all the listeners here in Zoom. Uh, please turn off your microphones when somebody else is presenting their paper. It can cause a little bit of confusion and disturbance if you leave your microphones on. And after each paper, there will be time for very few questions, depending again on the time. So if you have a question, please turn on your microphone then and post your question, or you can also just write it in the chat. And that's here on Zoom, but also on YouTube. You can also post uh, questions via uh, the YouTube channel. Uh, and a last thing is also for the speakers. Perhaps we'll encounter a, a cancellation, we never know, or maybe somebody run into technical problems. So we please ask you to be ready at the beginning of your session. So maybe we will ask you to present a bit earlier if necessary. So hopefully, so everybody be ready in time. Thank you so much. All right, that was all the practical things for now. And yes, we're uh, on time. Do you do a, does my co-organizers have anything to add for now? Uh, yeah, just perhaps uh, in case if there is any cancellation, I'm sorry, but then it will mean that we have a longer break or like the session will end short, like earlier than planned, just because we published the program. And so if people want to join for a specific paper, we will not make like changes. And perhaps just for today, we got uh, like a last minute change uh, because Giacomo Bardelli uh, cannot attend today. Uh, he has health issues, but possibly as we had already a constellation for tomorrow, he will take the tomorrow slot, but we will see and confirm that. But yes, for, for tomorrow, we have a longer lunch break. And I think that would be all from my side. All right. That is very good. Thank you, Magda. But for the first session, luckily, we are on schedule and people are ready. So that's good. So we'll keep that as planned. So without further ado, I would like to welcome our first speakers today, um, Marco, Antonio, Andrade. And please excuse, excuse me if I pronounce anybody's name wrong. I, I tried to rehearse, but it's, it's tricky. But Marco Antonio Andrade, who unfortunately cannot be with us today, he's on field work. So the presenting authors will be Katarina Costaira and Rui Mataloto, who will speak on the paper entitled Weaving the Parker's Web. Weaving Related Artifacts in Funerary Contexts of Southern Portugal During the Fourth and Third Millennium BCE. And I have an author biography. I'll just read a little bit about Katarina Kustaira, who is a PhD researcher at UNIAC, Center for Archaeology at the University of Lisbon, an archaeologist at Camara Municipal de Sintra. Her research focuses on weaving and textile technologies of the third millennium BCE in southern Portugal. She has experience in the area of rescue archaeology, digitization of cultural heritage and management of archaeological geographical data. Since 2020, she has been actively involved in EuroWeb, in which she is National Management Committee member, and she integrated the Management Committee of the Digital Atlas of European Textile and Dress. So welcome to the both of you, Katarina and Rui, and uh, please, the floor is yours. 
Good morning. I share. Okay. Textile production is one of the least known aspects of the societies that inhabited the southern Portugal during the third millennium BC. This is due fundamentally to the lack of interest that has existed on the part of Portuguese archaeological research. In the regard, it should be noted that until very recently, the morphology of the artifacts considered as textile tools has generated doubts and skepticism about their functionality. Research carried out in recent years has made it possible to begin to investigate the uniqueness of the tools used to produce textiles, as well as the relevance that this activity may have had for the societies that use them. This contribution intends to present the megalithic contests in southern Portugal, where loom weights and spindle rules are documented, debating the possible meaning of their presence in funerary environments. Um, the southern Portugal covers Portuguese Extremadura, Ribatejo, Alentejo and Algarve, the regions belonging to Mediterranean Portugal. The intensification of archaeological excavation carried out in this region in the last two decades has greatly increased the number of excavated settlements and funerary monuments datable to the end of 4th and 3rd millennium BC. The sites have different locations, sizes, and architectures. In many of these sites were identified remains and artifacts related to weaving, like flax seeds, spindle rolls, loom weights, bone needles, and sometimes flax fabric remains. The abundance of weaving and textile remains in different types of sites, such as ditched enclosures, walled enclosures, and open settlements, a lot of them in the same region, it reinforces the local and domestic aspects of weaving, but marks it an important reg regional resort capable of producing fabrics for exchange and interregional level. Uh, in addition to the scars of direct traces of fabrics in Portuguese calcolithic archaeological records, it is important to study other traces related to weaving and fabrics, such as garment complements, decorative motifs, in other supports like symbolic figurines and geometric patterns of ceramic decoration, and anthropological remains with traces of bone and dental wear associated with repeated activities, such as weaving and sewing, and the position of body with evidence of wearing funeral garments or wrapped in fabric. In Portuguese calcolithic sites, we identify spindle rolls with metric and morphological features similar to those identified in pieces from the other areas of Europe. With available data, the presence of spindle rolls is scarce, both in terms of the number of provenient sites and in terms of their quantity in each site. In regional terms, there is a greater expression of these tools from the sites located in Alentejo. Clay loom weights are, in most calcolithic contests in Portugal, the only and most frequent elements that allow an approximating to weaving. In Portugal, in Portugal, there is a great variety in the shape and size of calcolithic loom weights. This diversity seems to be related in many cases to different areas where the tools were found. Plaques are found in all Portuguese regions. They are usually square, oval, or rectangular shaped, have two or four perforations. These plaques are small in size and light in weight, but we can register variations in regional terms. The plaques identified in northern and central Portugal are more robust than plaques identified in southern. The metric and morphological differences of the plagues can also be related to chronological difference with the sets of more robust oval plagues corresponding to later phases of third millennium. The function of these artifacts is also unclear, although they have been associated with table weaving plagues or loom weights, and experimental reconstructions have shown that it is possible to use looms with these plagues. The crescents have a curved shape, a section of diverse morphology and a perforation at each end. The crescents are identified only in Alentejo and Algarve. 
the Iberian Christians are thinner and lighter than Christians from other areas of Mediterranean and Europe. As with the plagues, the metric variation of the crescents seems to change over the third millennium. But in, the, in this case, weight and thickness seems to decrease towards at the end of this millennium, making the rebuilding of looms more difficult. Plagues and crescents are very frequent in the archaeological records of southern Portugal, appearing preferentially in settlements and more restrictly in funerary contests. Uh, can I, can I, Katarina? Okay, I go on from here. Um, uh, well, in, in Portugal, in southern Portugal, in the area that we are studying, um, <clears throat> there are known uh, thousands of uh, burials, uh, and in Alentejo, hundreds of um, one specific type of, of burials, which are um, the dolmens. Uh, the orthostatic tubes uh, that have been used mainly in the late fourth and um, the third millennium. However, it, 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 um, it is also known uh, both in Nolintejo, uh, but especially in Estamadura, the Ipogeas, and also the Karsic Caves. Uh, corbel thotted tombs uh, or tholoi types are also known in this um, in all the, this region, both in uh, Alentejo and Estremadura and, and also in, in Algarve. And we we know um, in the presence of uh, uh, weaving uh, artifacts related with all these uh, different kinds of uh, um, archaeological um, funerary contexts. Uh, however, most of the, the, the sites that we know have been uh, uh, dug in the last quarter of the, the 19th century and mainly in the first half of the 20th century. So we don't have many of these sites uh, fully excavated with the proper or what we consider today the proper um, techniques. So the, the information about context is mostly um, very scarce please. Um, well, we can see here the different types of sites that we've mentioned, the, both the, the simple tombs uh, or simple, mega, uh, simple megalithic uh, chambers, like the one on the top uh, uh, left, or even in big, large passage, passage graves, like the one that we have uh, in the bottom uh, left. But also the Ipogeas and, and Karsic uh, uh, cavities, uh, well, you know, in a way carved in the in the, the bedrock, but also the vaulted chambers and the pit graves, uh, where we know also some of these uh, elements that we are studying and presenting here. Please. <clears throat> so uh, inside of this, uh, we know a very um, multiple number of uh, grave goods. Uh, most of them related with other kind of activity in lithics. Um, uh, stone tools and also some uh, votive uh, elements like the, the schist plates, where we can see very interesting um, decoration that could remind us uh, what could have been the textile uh, production in this uh, region. Uh, as you can see in the, in the bottom, um, these schist plates have patterns that could, in a way, uh, mention the, the kind of uh, uh, decoration that textiles could have. Um, please, Katarina. Okay, so uh, we must uh, uh, know that most of the, the this kind of, um, uh, of sites have been uh, built uh, in the late fourth and until the beginning and middle of the third millennium. However, the use that we are uh, um, use of this kind of sites could uh, spend until uh, uh, more recent moments, like the end of the third millennium or even the beginning of, of the, the, the second uh, millennium BC. Um, please, Katarina. Okay, so. Um, <clears throat> Most of uh, uh, the, the sites that we have uh, are uh, fi fi uh, findings in megalithic tombs, uh, mainly in Alentejo, 
but also, as I said before, in Ipogeus, last number, and mainly in uh, Estremadura, Portuguese Estremadura, the region of Lisbon, and uh, where we can also find one or two cases of uh, incarcerated cavities, but also corbelid vaulted tombs, where, which are more common also in the south, uh, especially in, Al in Algarve. Please. Well, uh, the 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 number of this uh, schist of, of plagues um, with mainly two perforations are known from ancient excavations. When I say ancient, I should uh, say from the uh, late 19th century and early 20th century excavation of these big dolmens, uh, mainly in the region of uh, Central Alentejo, where we can find different kinds of this uh, big uh, uh, plagues with two uh, uh, perforations uh, found inside uh, of these uh, megalithic tombs. Uh, please, Katarina. Here we can see uh, the, the kind of uh, big plagues with two perforations, very thick, which are not common in, in settlements um, uh, areas, but they are very well uh, represented. Uh, here in this, in this type, with four perforations similar to the to the previous ones, uh, but in smaller uh, size, uh, are also known in um, uh, in this kind of monuments, mainly in Alentejo, where they are very very typical. Um, please, and here we can see different uh, uh, types. But especially this one with two perforations in very, very thick are also known in uh, the region of Extremadura, where uh, there were also found and more related with the kind of uh, monuments uh, that we know there too. And the kind of, uh, of uh, loom weights that we are very typical in Extremadura. This specific type with the elliptical oval plagues with two perforations uh, are uh, one kind that could be telling us uh, the differences to a later moment, um, probably near the Bronze Age, which where, where they become bigger um, than the, nose, the ones that we know before with only two preparations and it's get this oval uh, shape, very thick, very uh, much uh, uh, heavier than the previous, previous ones. And in one, in one uh, specific situations, like this, the Shkural type, uh, it's very well finished uh, and also have some traces of painting or uh, um, of ochre on the top of it. It's a very, very uh, different um, element. Uh, so could tell us probably it means something a little uh, different. Um, here we have a more of these situations of elliptical and oval plates with four perforations and as you can see, uh, the decoration is very scarce in this kind of um, uh, elements, uh, but in one situation we can uh, found in one of these two uh, dolmens, uh, it has been decorated with the symbols that looks like arms, which we can also see in schist plagues. And so this could remind us the relation of the symbolism uh, that is also present uh, with this kind of, of uh, um, weights. Please, uh, Katarina. Uh, here, the, the, the number of, of loom weights known in the region of uh, Stremadura, uh, Lisbon and Stubal near the, the, the coast, it's very limited. And we only know two situations, one from uh, uh, Nipogeum, uh, which is the one in the, in the left, and another one probably uh, from a uh, um, carbon vaulted uh, uh, tomb, which is San Martino, and that has also big uh, um, uh, dense decoration. And both of them are very typical from the, the ones that, uh, from these regions and the ones that we know in settlements. So they are very well connected with the, the, the same types that we know in settlements. Uh, otherwise, the, the things that we have in uh, Alentejo seems uh, slightly different. These uh, thick crescents are very, very scarce. Um, it's only known in two situations in Alentejo, in, in, in dolmens, 
but at the same time, or at the same time, also in uh, Algarve. And they're very thick, way thicker than the most that we know in Alentejo um, for the third millennium, but they are getting uh, bigger uh, sizes and getting similarities to the ones that we will know later in Bronze Age too. Well, this, this one with central roof, it's something that we really don't know if it's a decoration or has a, some kind of uh, um, use. Uh, the presence of this uh, small uh, or uh, very thin uh, loom weights uh, in, in this kind of sites, it's very, uh, um, in, it shows up in different uh, contexts related with uh, dolmens, but also, but also with tholoi uh, or vaulted carbon uh, tombs. Uh, it's very interesting, but because most of them show uh, sh very uh, uh, broken in small pieces, and they are spread mainly uh, in the in the mound that covers the monuments. So the presence of this kind of um, loom weights could be related with something completely different from the ones that we have seen before. Uh, they were probably introduced when they built the tomb that usually covers uh, these kind of monuments. So they can mean something a little bit different uh, from the ones that we have uh, seen before, which are complete. And these ones are very, very uh, uh, fragmented and could relate to the, the, the cover of the, the burial monument to uh, uh, the relation to the settlement uh, uh, at the same time. So they could mean something completely uh, different. The presence of uh, the spindle worlds are even more uh, uh, scarce. However, uh, it's mainly uh, or could be uh, related to the fact that most of the time they are not identified as spindle worlds, but sometimes with um, uh, beads which uh, they are not, um, but we are starting to see that they are find, found in this kind of uh, uh, monuments too. And they are also artifacts related with the, um, with the weaving and at the, the same time with textiles and at the same time have a very specific uh, mythology uh, uh, related with them. And so we need to pay more attention to the presence of these elements in this funerary uh, uh, contexts. Please. Well, um, <clears throat> what we are trying to uh, uh, understand now is this relation of funerary monuments uh, and the presence of uh, weaving elements uh, or artifacts related with weaving in this um, funerary context. And at the same time, trying to, um, in a way, see where it starts this symbolism of weaving elements in places of death and the myth of the parque or the moiras uh, that spins the thread of life. Uh, so the, in a way, the, the textile production and their economic, social and symbolic relevance in prehistory, it's getting more and more uh, um, uh, present and the, the, the identification of these elements in funerary context uh, is telling us exactly like that. In a way, we can see diversity and unity in a transitional meaning of weaving because uh, we have different um, uh, loom weights in Extremadura uh, but uh, in also in, in from Alentejo, but at the same time we can see that in both areas they are also present in this funerary context. So the meaning of weaving and the relevance of it is also shown in different regions. So that's why, besides the the, the different types of monuments where they show up, they uh, uh, share the same uh, uh, meaning probably, um, and at the same time the long life of some of these monuments can uh, um, make us pay attention to the fact that some of these presences of uh, big um, loom weights could tell us that they are being reused uh, inside of ancient dolmens, probably at the beginning of Bronze Age or in the late third millennium uh, BCE. And uh, of course, this is just the beginning of uh, a longer uh, research uh, where 
in a way we can see this representation of the path, the, the past, and then at the same time trying to achieve uh, the challenges to the future about gender, the age, the mobility uh, uh, related with uh, weaving and uh, with the, the scarce number of good funerary contexts excavated in the last uh, 20, 30 years. Um, it's not easy, but it's the path that we want to, uh, uh, to, to go on. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much to the both of you for this excellent paper. That was very, very interesting. And thank you for sticking to the time perfectly. I'm very impressed, exactly 20 minutes. So, but that means that we have time for a question or two. If there's somebody who would like to pose a question, either here among the speakers in Zoom or via YouTube, perhaps. <clears throat> And you can either post it just directly turning on your phone, uh, a microphone, or just post it in the, the chat. And Paula, is there anything from YouTube? No. No. All right. Well, we will no, have time. Is, huh? Yeah, sorry. There is just a small, like, uh, like so perhaps the question will oh, come that's, ah, yeah, no, no. all right <laughs> i didn't know that it's just news to me with the youtube channel but we'll give it a minute then or if not we will have a bit of time for a discussion at the end of the session if people remember a couple of questions oh here is one from elsa Ivanes. thank you elsa and Elsa writes, despite the lack of controlled excavation conditions, do you have information about the gender of the associated dead? Serena? Oh. Went to, well, I uh, we can see. Well, no, uh, unfortunately, until now, we don't have any information about, about the, the gender. It's something that we need to work a little bit better, but most of the excavation are the lack of bones of human uh, remains. Uh, it's, it's very big it's, and, and we don't have that kind of information. Unfortunately, we are hoping that in the next years with controlled excavations, we can get more information about it. Thank you. And we have a second question from Nahum Ben Yehuda and I will just read it out loud. What materials are the spindle whorls made of? Are any of them in glass or any other material? No, they, they are all in clay hmm. for the, the third millennium. The, yeah. the spindle whorls are in clay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we have also a question from YouTube. Uh, on the chat, and Annika Hameling is asking if this practice of depositing loom weights in funerary context continues after the third millennium. Uh, actually, it's something that we are, we are trying to uh, understand now. We believe that uh, most of the, the these presences that we have here is uh, related with the end of the third millennium, maybe to the beginning of the second millennium. But something seems to change uh, in the second in the second millennium. Uh, so in Bronze Age, we don't really know. First, we don't know much about uh, the burial uh, the burials, and most of them are not uh, related with until now that we know any kind of uh, weaving elements or loom weights. Uh, at least for now, what we know in this region, of course. I can I can add something, and um, in some sites of the Bronze Age, sometimes we have uh, uh, in the in the same site Ipogea and uh, pits with uh, some loom weights, but we don't uh, understand the relation uh, between the um, this these two uh, structures. So we need to to continue the research. Thank you. All right, are there any further questions? No? 
All right, then I would like to thank you once again for your excellent paper. It's very interesting. Thank you so much. Um, yes, and then I, we should continue to our next uh, paper for today. And that our next speaker is Tina Polotti. And uh, I would just like to present Tina. She's an archaeologist and she received her PhD in 2016 from the University of Crete. Her thesis, which examines the functional and symbolic role of cloth and clothing in rituals in the Aegean Late Bronze Age, constitutes a combined study of the related iconography and the Linear B archives. She has participated in excavations and research programs of Bronze and Early Iron Age sites on Crete, mainland Greece, and the northeastern Aegean, among which the ongoing Kukumisi archaeological project a multifaceted field and study research program of the prehistoric settlement on the islet, island of Kukunisi Lemnos under the auspices of the Academy of Athens. Tina Bolotti is currently uh, conducting a postdoctoral research uh, project at the National and Cabodistrian University of Athens. And her project is focused on the textile production in the Bronze Age settlement of Kuku. Kukunisi. And Tina's paper for today is entitled Equal in Ritual, Unisex Types of Clothing in Aegean Second Millennium BC uh, Religious Actions. So welcome, Tina, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad to see you again. Okay, I suppose that you can see my screen. Yes, we can see your screen, but you can share it full screen as well. Okay. Is it is it okay now? Well, it works, but I think if you go down um, and okay. to the right and you press the button, um, with the full screen button, it's next to where you zoom. Okay. The button right of your screen. Now, of my screen. No, share. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 don't worry, don't worry. On screen, I do not. That's it? No, it's not. No, it's not. In your PowerPoint, if you're, are you in your PowerPoint? If you go yes. down to your lower corner, your lower right corner, you will see a percentage of zooming. And then the button a little bit to the left. No. Okay. Well, yeah, that would work if you, yeah, that yeah. one. More. More, 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 more. Yeah, if you take uh, your mouse and yeah, to the lower right corner of your screen. Lower right corner of yes. my screen. And it says yes. to the far bottom right, that says 68%. Try to go a little bit to the left. There's a funny icon uh, next to the book, to the right of the open book. You see uh, an icon, try to press that one. No, sorry. No. Othoni, Othoni, no, 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 no. Sorry. No, no, no. I suppose that you are going to see, okay. Yes, it works all right like this. Okay, let's start, I think. Okay. Equal in ritual, unisex types of clothing in Aegean second millennium BC religious actions. Okay, to see my time. <laughs> Although ritual, uh, the ritual exaltation of uh, women constitutes a long standing tradition in the Aegean Bronze Age archaeology from the late 19th to early 20th century onwards. It was only after the 1980s that uh, scholars started to refocus attention on the religious roles of men as well, since uh, the latter had been assumed as the prime uh, motivating uh, forces and agents of a cultural process, whether in politics or production during that era. 
considering Bart's statement, this one, okay. This paper examines two unisex, two unisex types of clothing intimately connected with cult activities in the Aegean second millennium BC. The so-called hide skirt and the long robe, uh, robe uh, with vertical band. The hide skirt a, a garment with deliberately primitive appearance as indicates the characteristic pointed tail on the bottom of its lateral side. We will see, uh, we will see it later. And um, has long tradition in Minoan and Crete from Middle Bronze Age onwards and doubtful presence in the Greek mainland. On the other hand, the long robe with vertical band has a Mycenaean origin in all probability and it seems to be widespread in Crete from the 15th century uh, BC onwards during the Mycenaean occupation of the island. Sorry, Tina. Hey. Sorry, yes, I'm sorry. We, we're still on the first uh, slide. Is that intentional or? No, it's, it's, it, it's not changing slides. No. That's the first one. Yeah, we're still on the, your first slide, like your title slide. Okay. You see now? Yes, the next? yes. Now okay. we see the next, thank the you. The next fly, yes. slide, okay. It's okay now? Now it works, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Aiming at reweaving the fabric of ancient uh, societies, I will attempt to challenge the misconceptions caused by a long tradition of androsending paradigm, paradigms, uh, as well as to reappreciate the varied manifestation, uh, manifestations of ancient uh, gender beyond modern stereotypes of femininity and masculinity, and the roles of both sexes in the prehistoric Aegean. In order to discuss the topic, we cannot avoid referring to the thoroughly uh, discussed Hagia Triada sarcophagus from the middle 14th century BC, the most important document of Minoan religions, as well as the most difficult to interpret in its general significance, which combines traditional Minoan elements with contemporary, contemporary Mycenaean ones. The paintings decorating all four sides of the sarcophagus have been vigorously discussed by many scholars occupied with Aegean Bronze Age religion. Especially the ceremonies depicted on the long panels A and B of the, of the sarcophagus attest the simultaneous use of various types of ritual garments, among which predominate the so called hide skirt and the long robe with vertical band for male and female figures, respectively, uh, while on the side panels we gain, in all probability, a side of deity's attire. I would like to stress here the detected sartorial similarity between goddesses and priestesses, which is almost generally applied to the iconographic codes of that era, and the ambiguity related to their identification. The height skirt. The so-called height skirt is actually a peculiar type of dress with a characteristic a pointed tail on the bottom of its lateral side. Despite the fact that uh, the corpus of the extant uh, representations with persons in hide skirt is not large enough to allow complete decoding of uh, the significance of the garment, its connection with cult activities remains uncontested. In the sarcophagus, uh, five uh, participants in, uh, sorry, in the rituals um, depicted are dressed in are dressed in hide skirts. On the side A, the woman who is pouring the contents uh, the contents of a vessel into a bucket between the double axis and the three male figures who carry who carry the offerings to the god, hero, deceased, whatever interpretation 
uh, do we prefer? And on the side B, the woman who stretches her hands above the bowl over the altar. While the three men have a naked torso, the two women wear an open bodice decorated with broad bands. Paribeni, uh, who published uh, the sarcophagus, was the first to argue that this garment was made of animal hide, a view uh, supported afterwards by Arthur Evans as well as by Martin Nilsson. The my known identity of the garment seems undoubted as well, since the vast majority of the, re the related iconographic evidence comes from Crete. There, the hat skirt appears to have a long tradition, as it is attested in all probability already, already in the middle Minoan two period. In two vases, a fruit stand and a bowl from the old palace period at Festos. Nevertheless, the bulk of evidence dates to a uh, late Manoan one, uh, provided mostly by ceilings and by steels and ceilings from peripheral palatial centers. More precisely, uh, I will not uh, refer to uh, the exact provenance of these seals and ceilings you can see on the screen, and I continue. Its presence is, uh, of uh, this type of garment is uh, testified uh, in Knossos since Middle Minoan III, Late Minoan uh, 1A, thanks to uh, two joining fragments of a relief fresco from the north entrance of the Knossos Palace, restored by uh, Bernd Kaiser. You see that uh, your uh, left-hand side, um, and while a woman counterpart is depicted in the, lit, uh, the late Minoan II corridor fresco uh, as proposed by Christos Boulotis. Being unattested in the Cyclades, it is documented so far in two cases from the Greek mainland in a golden, golden signet ring of Gnosian origin from the Mycenaean necropolis in Elatia Lonaki and in a Lendoid sealstone from Mycenae. The possibility of its adoption in the Mycenaean mainland during a period of intensive cultural interaction between the two regions of the Aegean in the early late Bronze Age. Um, the two aforementioned examples from mainland indicate, indicate only a possible but not certain presence of this type of garment there. Needless to stress that the first one is considered to be a, of Cretan origin, uh, the golden signet uh, ring from Malonaki, and uh, Knossian in all probability, buried as a heirloom in the tomb 62. Um, the Agia Triada sarcophagus is so far the latest iconographic evidence of this garment. According to uh, Charlotte Long, uh, the hat skirts might be regarded as a survival of an earlier type of dress preserved by religious uh, conservatism. Actually, it seems uh, that they were chosen here on purpose in order to create a link between the Minoan past and the Mycenaean present of uh, the island of Crete. The Mycenaeans would, would not have ignored this reality. Actually, we have always to keep in mind that wall paintings as the only expression of monumental pictorial art should be expected to give us insights into the ideology of the ruling class as meaningful images, mirrors of a mentality or even propaganda. And something else at last. In the earlier Minoan iconography, the hide skirt is worn exclusively uh, by men, at least mainly by men. Only in the sarcophagus, it is worn by women as well. Is this another indication of Mycenaean involvement in the ritual reality of the island? We'll see. The long robe with vertical band, the other garment type under discussion. Let us now turn to the long uh, robe with a vertical band. 
this type of, of uh, dress first appears on the Tiris, on the Tiris gold signet ring, which is stylistically dated in the late Ladi II period. Um, it is worn by the seated female, the goddess, undoubted, undoubtedly, according to calling reference criteria on religious iconography, who receives in a supernatural setting the liquid offerings by the procession of, of Jaime. Uh, the Agia Triada Sarcophagus, as already mentioned, constitutes a focal document in our dis discussion. There, the long rope with vertical band is depicted apparently nine times, nine times, uh, nine times in total, worn by both sexes. Among them, uh, the bucket carrier in the libation scene, uh, scene on side A uh, offer the most complete depiction of a female priestly attire, except. Uh, the long robe, she also wears um, an elaborate headdress, uh, a polos, uh, while uh, one, late, uh, one lendoid seal stone, at least, is discernible uh, on her left wrist. Uh, the same dress is also worn by the fragmentary priestess of side B. The latter, with her hands towards the sacrificed bull, was restored wearing the polos on her head in analogy to the priestess of side A. Four out of five uh, women following her are clad in straight robe as well, more elaborate though. However, due to their fragmentary state of preservation, their precise role in the ritual seems uncertain. Two men are dressed in the same type of garment. The leader player on side A and the flute player on side B. In Agia Triada again, okay, uh, long ropes with vertical band are attested in two more frescoes, the so-called Piccola and uh, the so-called Grande Processione. In the Grande Processione, which can be ascribed to the painter uh, responsible for the sarcophagus as well, this particular garment is worn by a partially preserved female figure, as well as by two men, a leader player and a bucket carrier. Uh, the latter appears uh, as the male counterpart of the similarly acting priestess on the sarcophagus side A. Nevertheless, uh, the earliest secure appearance of the log robe with vertical band in print is in the late Minoan II, that means 15th, mid, uh, mid 15th century BC, a uh, Knossian procession fresco. It is actually worn by the men of Group A on the east wall, which Evans restored as musicians. Uh, based mainly on the Agia Triada, uh, on the Agia Triada sarcophagus. They are long monochrome robes with linear decora uh, decoration, horizontal or curved, and in one case rosettes, on the vertical band, have a three-zone lower border, border, which recalls the analogous tripartite articulation of the garment, which belongs to the so-called goddess, you see a red frame on, uh, on, this, on this slide. This is the so-called goddess in the Gnosian procession fresco uh, from the same fresco. Uh, after re-examining uh, the preserved part of her garment, of which only the three richly decorated lower border zones have been preserved, as you can see, this one, okay. Uh, I proposed in 2016, in the 12th International Congress of Cretan Studies, 12th Cretological Congress, uh, uh, a new restoration of her uh, published in 2019. You can see it on your screen, my new restoration, uh, my uh, new restoration proposal of uh, her dress. Uh, for this restoration, I was based 
on a late lady, my senior, a fragmentary fresco from Pilos. This one. It depicts a half-sized half size woman uh, walking to the right while her feet overlap a carved footstool, either in all probability, judging by, by its white color. This footstool with uh, its closest, closest parallel to the composition of the famous Tyrion, Tyrion signet uh, ring, I have shown it uh, earlier, um, designates respectively the Pillian woman as the leading processional figure, a high priestess, as argued reasonably by Mabel Lang. The priestess, however, does not wear the usual flounce uh, hair, a uh, typical uh, female uh, garment uh, in the Aegean area in that era, uh, but uh, she wears a long robe with vertical band of which only the lower part has been here preserved as well. Linear and architectural motifs decorate the, the elaborate border of her dress constituted by two horizontal bands. Without commenting uh, on the dress type, Mabel Lang rightly noted the structural similarity of this uh, garment with a much earlier garment, uh, that of the, go the goddess from the late Minoan to Gnosian procession fresco. They have at least uh, 100, 150 years of uh, a, a gap, a chronological gap of uh, 100, 100, 150 years between these two frescoes. A fact that she attributed to a common tradition, as I do believe. To conclude, I have uh, two minutes, one, how much? <laughs> to conclude, at least. Uh, taking, taking into consideration all the above, mention the aforementioned things i would like to note briefly for the so-called height skirt a type of gar a type uh, garment worn by both men and women in ritual actions in my non creed from middle bronze age onwards although its presence in the greek mainland is doubtful for the long robe with vertical band that it is a garment of Mycenaean origin, in all probability, adopted by the, Man by the Minoans after the 15th century BC, when the Mycenaeans are supposed to have set settled on the island of Crete. Cretan fresco evidence, the procession fresco itself, the Ayatrada sarcophagus and related compositions, as well as uh, the late Aladic two signet ring from Tiris and fresco parallel from a Mycenaean palatial centers clearly document this specific type of robe as appropriate to deities, members of the priesthood, females and males, and elite individuals in general. Thank you for your attention. Oh, <laughs> and I'm you. waiting, I'm waiting for your questions. Yes. Thank you so much, Tina. This was really interesting and fascinating images and depictions of, of dress. And yes, I would like there's time for questions. So is there anything uh, in the chats, either here on Zoom or on YouTube? Please do not hesitate. Okay. Yeah, okay. You've been very convincing, Tina. Okay. <laughs> I think that must be the answer. Thank uh, you. Magda, are there any uh, questions on YouTube? Via YouTube. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. For now, no. But no. I told we have like a few seconds lag, but I think they would have appeared so far. Yes. So, All no. right. But in that case, I think we okay. should say thank you to Tina for your excellent presentation. You're thank welcome. you so much. And maybe in the end of the session, if there are any questions, please do not hesitate. Then there's still time to ask uh, Tina about her, her research. So uh, thank you, Tina. All right. And then I would like to 
welcome our next speaker, Francisco uh, B. Gomez, who is also a very important part of uh, Euroweb. Um, and I will just present him before I give the word over to him. So Francisco is currently a junior research fellow at UNIARC, the Center for Archaeology of the University of Lisbon, and at the School of Arts and Humanities, also at the University of Lisbon. He received his PhD uh, from this university in 2016 with a thesis on the early Iron Age funerary record of southern Portugal from the 8th to the 5th centuries BCE. And since then, he has been developing research projects aimed at further exploring the contacts between the local communities of southwestern Iberia and the Mediterranean world during the Iron Age and their impact on the social, economic and cultural development of the former. In the framework of these projects, he has paid particular attention to the role of dress and adornment in the development and representation of social and cultural identity discourses. And it was through this topic that he became involved with Euroweb, in which he now serves as a science communication coordinator. And I would also give a great thanks also to Francisco for helping us with setting this online conference up. We couldn't have done it without Francisco. So thank you. And Francisco will present a paper today entitled The Body Politic, Dress, Gender and Bodily Capital in the Late Bronze and Early Iron Ages of Southwestern Iberia. So thank you, Francisco, and the word is yours.
Francisco, I'm sorry, I'm terribly sorry to interrupt, but uh, on YouTube, people are sig signalizing that there is no sound. So uh, I don't know if it's from the beginning of your presentation and it's perhaps related to the fact that you are managing YouTube and I don't know, but like there are three people saying that there is no sound. Okay, I'm sorry for that, but <laughs> I think. I think that now people should be able to hear me on YouTube. Let so, me know if there are any further issues. Yeah, yeah. I will just check with the, like, yeah. Yes, now, okay. okay. Now, apparently. Okay. I mean, people hear me, but do they hear you? Let's just check. <laughs> Can you hear me? There's a delay too, so on YouTube I'm still changing the settings and now people should be able to hear me. Okay. I, I am just asking by, you know, on my phone to confirmation because, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we have confirmation, okay. so uh, I will... Okay, so, good. Sorry, no, everyone. You're... We are using yeah, a software to broadcast it and the, the sound inputs are different when other people are presenting and I am presenting, so that was the issue, but it's solved now. Very, my apologies. Uh, Man, sorry. So, to continue, among the main groups of fibulae characteristic of the Late Bronze Age, the two most characteristic ones are the so-called adocchio fibulae, which closely resemble some of the models in use during the period in Sicily and elsewhere in the Central Mediterranean. Uh, sorry, Francisco, would you like to to start from the beginning because like we are we are absolutely on time, and I think like people on the on YouTube are asking if it's possible. Sure, it I can do that. I can do as that. As the chair, I can say it's totally possible. I yeah. agree with you, Marga. If you like, Francesco, if you don't mind, maybe it's easier to... Well, yeah. sure, I can do that, no problem. Yeah. So Thank you. Yeah, sorry for that, really sorry. Let's Thank do, you. Uh, let's rewind. <laughs> okay, so from the top again. Just one second, let's go. Okay, so I will say good morning again, because apparently people on YouTube didn't uh, get that before and I would like to congratulate the organizers of the conference again for the excellent work and to thank them for having me to share um, some, info, some, some thoughts on the relationship between clothing, the body and identity building during the Late Bronze Age and the early Iron Ages of Southwestern Iberia. Uh, as some of you may be less familiar with this area, I will first address each of these periods separately offering a necessarily very short introduction to the historical developments which took place regionally during each of them before highlighting the available data regarding clothing, bodily adornment and bodily appearance for the period in question. This will serve as the basis for a discussion, which I will introduce later, about the diachronic changes in some patterns of use of clothing and more generally body-related elements and its potential significance. Beginning with the Late Bronze Age, which we can tentatively date between the 13th or the 12th and the 9th or the 8th centuries BC, we can say that throughout southwestern Iberia this was a period of increased social hierarchization, albeit with some interregional variations which cannot be fully explored in this uh, venue. Such variations notwithstanding, the rise of more concentrated um, and hierarchized settlement patterns structured around large hilltop, often fortified settlements together with the appearance of large concentrations of wealth in the form of both bronze and gold objects are all indicative of this increase in social hierarchy. While we still do not fully understand the socio-economic foundations of this move towards more vertical socio-political structures, they seem to coincide with an increase in the trans-regional connectivity of local communities, which during this period appear to have maintained regular contacts with both the Atlantic and the Mediterranean networks. Perhaps it was the very geographic position of this area which acted as a sort of meeting point and gateway between those two networks, which favored the development of local communities and the consolidation of social political elites, which appear to have risen to prominence at this time. Whatever the trigger for this increased hierarchization may have been, there are many indications that the status and the continued social preponderance of the leaderships of these communities rested, at least to an extent, on a complex ideological system made up of a web of practices and discourses in which materiality played a key role, which, is, which allows us to track them in the archaeological record. Among such practices and discourses, commensality and very likely reciprocal gift exchange uh, loom large. 
However, in this context, it is worth highlighting that the ideological system also encompasses specific patterns regarding the personal appearance of these high-status individuals, whose bodies and clothing were instrumental in the construction and representation of their social persona. To an extent, these patterns regarding personal appearance can again be seen as a reflection of the connectivity of local communities and their particular position at the intersection of Atlantic and Mediterranean networks. In fact, certain aspects of the array of bodily adornments in use during this period, particularly gold jewelry, but also some bronze accoutrements, seem to adhere to shared Atlantic models and tastes. However, as the contacts with the Mediterranean world increase in intensity, so does the impact of dress, styles and fashions which ultimately originated in the inner sea. As regional environmental conditions are not conducive to the preservation of organic remains, these new dress styles can be traced mostly by the introduction and eventually the local development of metallic dress complements, chief among which the fibulae. This type of dress complements corresponds to an innovation of the late Bronze Age with no known regional precedence, and the typology of the fibulae themselves clearly indicates that their introduction, and by extension that of the garments with which they were worn, relates to the arrival of prototypes sailing from the central Mediterranean. Among the main groups of fibulae characteristic of the late Bronze Age, the two most characteristic ones are the so-called adocchio fibulae, which close really sem resemble some of the models in use during this period in Sicily and elsewhere in the central Mediterranean, and the so-called elbow fibulae, which seem to be the result of a local adaptation of models ailing from that same area, which rapidly gives rise to a characteristically regional uh, array of closely connected types and variants of brooches with a comparatively wide distribution in the Iberian Peninsula. Unfortunately, as mentioned earlier, we know very little about the types of garments that were worn with this dress complement, but it has long been assumed that Mediterranean textiles, most likely high quality and or visually striking textiles and garments, were also a significant part of the package of elements introduced to Iberia, and more specifically southwestern Iberia, as part of the flux of goods, ideas and fashions which took place during this time. One striking uh, hypothesis suggests that the arrival of such textiles and garments may have been the trigger behind the appearance, during this period, of a series of highly decorated pottery styles in southwestern Iberia, which significantly, and despite adopting different decorative techniques, share a common repertoire of motifs whose characteristics and disposition could be evocative of patterned weaves. In, particularly, uh, in particular, pottery with burnished decoration, and later, possibly already in the transition to the orientalizing period, the carambolo style and other closely related painted wares sport geometric motifs often in repeating patterns filled and completed by reticulated designs which can easily be envisaged as evocative of the woven structure of textiles. While very suggestive, the pos this possible relation between the decorated pottery and the woven patterns of imported textiles remains of course hypothetical and in need of further exploration, namely through comparative and experimental approaches. Unfortunately, no other iconographical material is as of yet available to reinforce, or for that matter to disprove, such a relation. Nonetheless, iconography does offer some additional insights into the possible relations between clothing and the construction of the social personae of elite members during this period. Here in particular we should consider the insights offered by the iconographic stellae, which represent one of the more emblematic but also one of the more informative expressions of the regional late Bronze Age discourses of power, status and identity. In fact, and after a period in which anthropomorphic representations lost weight, generally speaking, in southwestern Iberia, towards the later part of this period we see the emergence of a group of stellae representing human figures, usually accompanied by more or less complex panoplies of high status and prestige goods, which emphasize their status, but also afford us some clues about the ways in which their social personae are built and the ideological basis of power and social influence in these communities. In this regard, we should note here the frequent representation of fibulae in the so-called warrior stellae, one of the more representative uh, um, iconographic expressions of this period in the area. In these stellae, usually interpreted as representations of male individuals whose social personae are shaped by a socially prevalent warrior ideology, fibulae are part of a broader array of Mediterranean and Mediterranean-type prestige goods and show that Mediterranean-style fashions and possibly garments were an integral part of the discourses of status, power and identity of these high-ranking individuals. On the other hand, it is also worth pointing out that these same stellae also feature a number of elements relating to bodily care, such as razors, mirrors, combs and tweezers, highlighting that here, as in other areas of Bronze Age Europe, 
the social persona of the, of the warrior was closely linked to specific bodily regimes aimed at projecting an idealized self-image, what Paul Verhoeven has called the warrior's beauty. This evidence, together with some related data glimpsed from some of the rare bur burials dating to this period, show an emphasis on the construction and representation of a specific ideal of masculinity, in which corporality, including dress, played a key, a key role. Although with more interpretive doubts, the iconography of the late Bronze Age Stella also affords some insights into the corresponding image of women, represented in this case in the so-called diadem stellae or stellae with headdresses. The figures in these stellae, which are significantly less numerous than the previous ones, are the latest expressions of a long lineage of figures dating back to prehistory, which have usually been interpreted as representations of female individuals. Compared to the panoplies represented in the warrior stellae, commented before, the late Bronze Age diadem stellae uh, represent a more limited array of elements, as the emphasis seems to have been very deliberately placed in the elaborate coiffures which, if a suggestive hypothesis put forward by Marta Diaz Guardamino is correct, were possibly supported by textile nets or headdresses. Other elements of dress are unfortunately not well represented in these putative uh, female representations, except for the suggestive example of Torrejón Rubio II in Cáceres, in Spain, in which a fibula is prominently featured as is what seems to be a bell. While the interpretation of these representations remains mired by several uh, interpretive uh, questions, they offer a potential counterpart to the warrior stell I discussed earlier and seem to point towards a somewhat different strategy regarding the construction of what appear to be gendered identities. In the case of disputative representations of women, the focus, or at least the iconographic focus, is on one particular visual, visual aspect of the individual's personal appearance, namely hair or headdress, uh, by contrast to the variegated panoplies of the warrior stellae and the apparently more pronounced discursive emphasis on bodily care in putative male representations, but also in some male burials. I will make some further comments on this point in a minute. Before doing so, however, I would like to quickly move on in time to the early Iron Age. I will start with a quick reminder that at the beginning of the first millennium BCE, the dynamics of contact and connectedness, uh, connectedness between southwestern Iberia and the Mediterranean shifted considerably due to the arrival in the Atlantic Far West of the Levantine people we have come to know as the Phoenicians, which established direct trade but also socio-political relations with the local communities and eventually settled in the southern coasts of the Iberian Peninsula. The establishment of direct contacts between the new arrivals and the local communities set in motion a wide-reaching process which I cannot describe in detail in the framework of this presentation. I will, however, point out that these contacts seem to have destabilized the delicate balances on which regional socio-political networks were predicated, shifting the center of gravity of those networks from the interior areas to the coast and to areas easily accessible through waterways. In the latter areas, uh, the close interaction between local groups and the Phoenicians led to the development of what has been characterized as an orientalizing horizon, which in socio-political terms is marked by a move towards the institutionalization of social and political hierarchies framed by what seems to, to, be, uh, to have been a rapid process of urbanization. This process seems to have had uh, different consequences in the more interior areas. While exceptions do exist, in many areas the existing social and political fabric seems to have gone through a process of destructuration, and when local communities re-emerge in the archaeological record, they seem to show distinctive organization patterns which have often been interpreted as the reflection of the emergence of a rural sphere which reflects, complements, and in some cases, in some respects, maybe opposes the aforementioned rising urban world. While such wide-reaching social, political, and even to an extent cultural exchanges had obvious reflexes on the ideological sphere, the traditional views which envisioned the wide-reaching process of acculturation by which Phoenician and Phoenician-inspired uh, cultural traits replaced the local ones have been superseded in recent scholarship, which emphasizes some degree of continuity of the regional ideological structures and the socially valued practices connected with it, which seem to evolve more gradually and organically and at much more differentiated rhythm than once thought. While the full exploration of this complex process of evolution is well beyond the scope of this presentation, it is worth noting here that in this new social, political and cultural landscape, we can trace a continued focus on the body as a locus for the construction and display of identity through clothing, adornment and bodily care. In particular, the renewed role of funerary practices and spaces as arenas for the negotiation and display of social discourses affords us with very interesting snapshots of the role of clothing and personal appearance more broadly in such identity building and affirming processes. 
Regarding clothing, we are once again limited in our analysis due to the lack of preserved textile material, but also by a lack of direct iconographic evidence. Again, for this period, the main indications we do have about clothing and dress styles are the metallic dress complements, namely fibulae, and for the first time in significant quantities, the metallic fastenings for belts and sashes. It should be noted that, as far as we can tell, these elements were essentially local and there is fairly limited evidence for direct Phoenician influence in the way they were developed and used, which raises the question of whether this applies to the garments too. Personally, and given the reputation of Phoenician dyed textiles in the ancient Mediterranean, I find it hard to believe that these were not a significant, possibly even a major part of the package of high-status prestige goods. Although evidence is scarce, one way or the other, I find more convincing the hypothesis that textiles were imported but then adapted, like many other elements, to local tastes and fashions. Again, some styles of pottery decoration based on geometric and reticulated motifs could support this idea, as some patterns of the so-called Medellin type wares and other connected painted wares are highly suggestive of weave structures and even in some cases possibly even stitching and embroidered decoration. More recently, Martin Almagro Gorbea has also hypothesized that some more complex motifs represented in orientalizing sculptures, and especially in pottery with figurative decorations, may also have been derived from textile patterns and embellishments. Whatever the case may be, the Phoenicians did play an instrumental role on another perspective by acting as a connector between relatively distant communities and a catalyst, and possibly a mediator, in the construction of new socio-political networks, the operation of which required a shared language to display status, power, and identity. Personal appearance, including clothing, bodily adornment, and bodily care, seems to once again have been a key feature of this shared language, and shared fashions operating as part of it may explain why we find certain elements of dress with a macro-regional and trans-regional distribution in contexts with different, eminently local characteristics. But what can we say about the specific dress styles of local communities during the early Iron Age and their significance for the construction and display of social identities? I have addressed this um, question in previous talks, namely in other Euroweb uh, events and conferences, so in the absence of significant new data, I will just try to offer you a brief summary of the available panorama. As mentioned earlier, our, our best data regarding this topic hails from funerary settings, although in some cases the specific fine conditions limit our interpretations of the data. The study of the patterns of use of dress complements in the more well-preserved, uh, excavated and published funerary sites of this period does however offer some interesting insights, which are worth recalling here. The anthropological data from sites such as La Angorrilla in Seville, Medellin in Badajoz, or the necropolis of the Beja region in southern Portugal clearly show that during this period certain dress complements and by extension certain garments and or styles of dress show a trend towards specific gender dissociations. Certain garments, um, um, sorry, despite some variation, belt and uh, sash fastenings uh, in particular seem to have a strongly gendered distribution with the so-called Celtic belt buckles associated with profusely decorated belts in hide materials being closely associated with male individuals while the so-called Tartessian belt buckles, which could in fact be the fastenings of woven belts or sashes, appear overwhelmingly in female burials. As for fibulae, their gender associations are less clear-cut, although a tendential association with male attire can be detected. Perhaps significantly, some data could suggest that this association seems to be stronger where older fibulae models, namely double spring fibulae, are concerned, and to grow increasingly flexible uh, as time goes by, and new models are introduced, to the point that in Medellin, in the late orientalizing, um, the late orientalizing Hispanic annular fibulae, are almost equally distributed by burials of both sexes. All in all, the data from this funerary site seems to indicate that, contrary to the late Bronze Age, in which, as we have seen, special emphasis was put on male attire as part of a broader construction of masculinity associated with warrior ideology, during the early Iron Age, a more readily identifiable investment in the attire of both sexes can be identified. If I am permitted a short excursus at this point, which I think is important to the overall discussion of this data, this increased archaeological visibility of female dress and attire during the early Iron Age needs to be further contextualized with other data regarding adornment and bodily care. While I cannot el elaborate much on these topics here, I would like to point out that in many early Iron Age funerary sites, especially those of rural communities, we see not only the introduction of specifically or tendentially female dress complements, 
but also a strong concentration of adornment elements, namely in exotic materials with a high social value, such as glass, glass faience, carnelian and amber in female tombs. On the other hand, in some contexts we once again find an array of elements relating to bodily care, such as cosmetic kits or elements thereof, for example tweezers, and perfume containers. Very significantly, however, and in contrast to the late Bronze Age, such elements are overwhelmingly associated with female burials, showing a, shift, uh, a shifting social emphasis from male to female bodies, which could also help explain the increased archaeological visibility of female dress. In light of this data, we are therefore left with the question of why exactly this shift takes place. A simple invocation of Phoenician influence as an explanatory mechanism, while tempting, does not seem to hold up to close scrutiny, so an interpretation based on the internal dynamics of these communities seems necessary. Elsewhere, I have proposed uh, that um, um, this shift may relate to changes in political economies and more specifically changes in the strategies of accumulation of a specific type of symbolic capital to use Pierre Bourdieu's useful concept, which we could identify as bodily capital. In the late Bronze Age, such, such strategies seem to have focused primarily on male bodies, as they were at the core of the pervasive warrior ideology, which acted as social glue and as the guiding principle of representation, not just of individual, but also very likely of social and collective identities. During the early Iron Age, the focus seems to shift increasingly towards female bodies. This is relatively easy to understand in rural contexts. Uh, on the one hand, the rise of small, likely kinship-based social political units potentially fostered the recognition of the role of women as the glue which ensured group cohesion. On the other hand, the fragmented nature of rural social political landscapes meant that each group's social reproduction was contingent on matrimonial exchanges which potentially put women and their bodies at the forefront of intergroup ties, thus carving an increased role for women in the representation of the group and the projection of its, of its identity and agendas. In urban settings, where it should be said this process is perhaps somewhat more subtle, at least in the funerary record, the reasons behind this shift are at the moment harder to grasp, but they may have something to do with the very consolidation of social hierarchies. In light of what we know of the socio-political evolution of regional communities, one can at least envisage a scenario in which the more unstable and socially negotiated leadership roles of the late Bronze Age progressively give place to established and hereditary leadership roles, thus shifting the emphasis from the contingent identity of the leader and his performative adherence to a specific ideal of masculinity and towards ideas of lineage and the transmission of leadership, perhaps coated in religious connotations through the bloodline. This would again entail a renewed, fo a renewed focus on reproduction, which would extend the existing strategies of accumulation of bodily capital to also encompass women and female bodies as part of the very mechanisms of power transmission. To quickly conclude with this presentation, I hope to have shown that despite the enduring lack of direct evidence for garments, a close study of the evidence that we do have regarding clothing and dress styles for the late bronze and the early iron age of southwestern Iberia not only shows that they were instrumental in the construction of uh, display and display of social identities, and particularly gendered identities, but that they can also be seen to have been at the core of changing social, political and identity strategies throughout this period, and to afford fundamental insights for the understanding of the historical development of local communities. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for uh, Francesco for this excellent paper. It was very interesting and uh, well presented and everything. And I'm sorry about the technical issues. It's, uh, yeah, well, it's new to many of us. And uh, yeah, but it worked out. So thank you so much for doing everything again. Thank you. And in fact, there's still a little time for a couple of questions for Francisco, uh, either here via Zoom or via the YouTube channel. So please. Ask away. We'll just give it a little time also with you. Oh, yes, I have a question here from uh, Ariana Esposito. Uh, so we can observe concom concomitant phenomena in terms of choice of material culture between certain vases and certain ornaments thus linked to practices of care and beauty that can be qualified in sub-regional social identitarian terms with distinctions according to the nature of the settlement. Very interesting, thank you. 
Well, so it's actually not really a question, but it was a very good comment, very interesting. Thank you, Ariana. Yes. Anyone else? Uh, I'm sorry, I do have a very naive question because I'm absolutely not specialized in that period and area, but like on your last slide, this like very schematic representation of what I guess is a woman and a man. Like he does I do I understand well that the, the man figure wears like a horns or something on his head or it's know if people on YouTube will be able to hear my answer. Now they should. Okay, so uh, yes, uh, um, several of these uh, warriors tele from the late Bronze Age have this uh, sort of um, headgear, which is usually interpreted as helmet, uh, as um, horn helmets. But we do not, we do not have them in the archaeological record, but that is uh, something that is common with this uh, stella. We have a number of elements represented in the stella that we do not necessarily find in the archaeological record for whatever reason, like chariots, like um, uh, musical instruments, and then also some of these elements of mm -hmm. what is interpreted as elements of armor. Yeah, but this, this kind of like, I don't know, cattle family or something is or confirmed, yes, by the archaeology or something. Sorry, okay. sorry, I didn't get I mean, that. But I mean, perhaps like in like you do not have evidence in the graves, but otherwise, I mean, the the presence of such kind of animals with horn is well attested, yes, for that period in the archaeological material or no, there is no there is no archaeological correlate to this to this type of helmets, okay. nor mm -hmm. for the chariots, nor for the uh, musical instruments, uh, nor not even for the mirrors that I also showed. Then we do have the fibula, we do have the um, we do have the the combs sometimes, and some of the other elements are in, appear in the archaeological record. We do not really understand why this is. If this was just some elements that were really um, the distribution of which were very very restricted, and so we don't find them on the archaeological record. But the idea of them just is transmitted and then is represented through iconography exclusively, or if maybe they were mostly that it's more difficult to accept maybe, but maybe they were entirely made of uh, perishable materials, a little bit hard to envision, but we don't have them in the archaeological record, generally speaking, no. Just iconographic representation. That's interesting. Thank you very much, Francisco. You're welcome. All right. Are there any other questions or comments? You're also welcome to turn on your microphones and No? All right. You have all been very convincing. And what about on YouTube, just to be sure? Yeah, for now, no YouTube comments. I mean, except congratulations to Francesco for the paper. Yeah. <laughs> put a comment on the chat. Uh, oh. Yeah, from Ana Maria Desiderio. Oh, yes, I can see that. Yeah, she just wrote a comment, uh, writing very interesting. Maybe I missed the passage, but what about the production areas of the ornaments? Is are they only of local uh, production? Um, for the um, for the fibula, it's it's hard to tell because we don't necessarily have the the workshops. But for the late Bronze Age fibula, some early uh, examples which may have served as prototypes may have been imported, but for the most part, it is considered that they are. Um, original production, original productions inspired by uh, by Central Mediterranean models. This is certainly the case for elbow fibulae because that is a model that is very specifically Iberian, despite being inspired by um, by Central Mediterranean um, prototypes. Uh, for for the uh, adocchio fibulae, it's less clear, but it's probably that is the same case. For the orientalizing fibulae, they are local productions, regional productions, and maybe in, in many cases local productions too. I hope to have replied. She says thank you. So. <laughs> Very good. Uh, if we do have, I'm sorry, I <laughs> I just had a question also for Tina. I'm sorry, it just came to my mind like after your presentation. 
so uh, my question, I, I know that you're like, um, the representations are very limited, but do you see any specific rituals maybe associated to this uh, two different kinds of dress or there's too few evidence to tell? Yes, uh, there is a, hmm. I see uh, there are some rituals detected on uh, the limited iconographical evidence we have, uh, mainly ritual processions. Uh, or um, during which uh, there is the carrying of uh, objects where, which are about to be uh, offered to deities. And of course there are sacrificial rituals as uh, the ones we saw, we see on the Agia Triada, Triada Sarcophagus, for example. Uh, on um, seals and sealings iconography, on Glypti, uh, we have, um, at in fact, snapshots of uh, ritual processions, uh, during which, as I have said, we, are, we see the carrying of objects which are about to be offered uh, to deities or to their representatives the priestess, priestess, priest. Um, that's it, that, that, that kind of uh, um, cer ceremonies, these are the kinds of ceremonies we can detect on mm -hmm. uh, Aegean late, late Bronze Age iconography. Okay, but it's not like, for example, that for sacrifice scene you see only one kind of dress, they can alternate with the, or or is it always the same dress for for like sacrifice or uh, in <coughs> in my non-Greek yes there's no um, as I've said uh, the so-called hide skirt uh, is uh, detected mainly on Crete. Uh, it is uh, doubtful if uh, it was used in uh, in the mainland Greece. I would I would not know that. We have only two, um, two examples, uh, two, two representations of this type of garment in mainland Greece, and I don't think so. It's uh, it, it not a, it's not at all certain uh, if this type of garment was uh, used there. Um, on the other hand, uh, on mainland Greece we have um, certain uh, more, I would say, more representations of the long robe with vertical band. And I think that this is the typical uh, garment, at least of female priestesses for the mainland Greece. Uh, it is a type of garment uh, which is uh, used by uh, other persons of uh, authority, with authority, male persons. Uh, mainly, yes, it was uh, the main, its main purpose was uh, in order to be used as uh, a female dress. Uh, although some uh, men were use it or we can see some men were uh, dressed in this type of uh, garden. I don't you. know if I... <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but I, I mean, I, I know I, the material, like, I can is really limited, so it's difficult to make, yes. like, very general, yes. uh, yeah, yes, it is. conclusions about that, but yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. All right, if there's no further questions, we should have a brief coffee break. We all need to reach out a little bit. And then we will continue in 15 minutes at 11 o'clock. We will gather here again and continue with the next papers. But I would like to, first of all, thank, to say thank you to all our speakers from this first session. You did really well, very inspiring already. So thank you so much to uh, to all of you. Right, so coffee time. See you in 15 minutes.
All right. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a chance to have some coffee, maybe a one minute of fresh air. So you are ready to continue our exciting program. And I will already like to welcome our next speaker, Sana Lipkin. And Sana, uh, see here, she is a senior researcher or academy research fellow in archaeology at the University of Ulu. She has special knowledge in identity and childhood theories, and methodologically, she has specialized in textile research. Her current research projects, both funded by the Academy of Finland, focus on emotions related to child death, as well as daily and afterlife of children in post-medieval Finland. Her most recent book is co-edited with Chita Kaliu Seppe, Seppe and Paul R. Mullins, and it's entitled Historical Burials in Europe, Natural Mummification, Burial Customs and Ethical Challenges. All right. And today, Sana will present a paper entitled Children's Headdresses from Medieval and Post-Medieval Finland from about 1250 to 1850. So thank you so much, Sana, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Cecil. Um, um, for um, presenting me. <laughs> really nice so um and um yeah I, i'm also sorry uh because i i need to leave uh not right after my presentation but very shortly because i'm in a hotel room i need to check out before noon so i'm oh, sorry for this no uh, of course <laughs> but i will be coming to you and listen to you uh through my phone um so, medieval uh, uh, and post-medieval hairdresses for children. Uh, in this presentation, uh, I will concentrate in the hairdresses found in northern Finland, a region called northern Ostrobotnia. Um, uh, the sites discussed uh, today are located along the Bothnian Bay, uh, very high up uh, in, in, in the northern Finland. Uh, the sites date from the late medieval uh, period to the uh, early 19th century. At the uh, Valmariniemi site, uh, which is in Gemiinmaa, um, uh, 157 uh, burials were found, and these included uh, about 180 individuals. Uh, the earliest burials uh, that were cremations are earlier than the church uh, at the site, which was built between 1340 and 1370. Uh, here textiles are unearthed uh, in altogether 11 burials, and all these deceased uh, were originally interred beneath the church floor or at the churchyard close uh, to the church. Um, there is one remain of a headdress uh, in, uh, from these burials. And they, uh, this, this headdress was found on the forehead of six to eight years old child. And uh, the fabric uh, was felted and decorated with 19 plates or studs. And uh, along the uh, felted fabric remains of reddish full and fringe yarns were found as well as tiny remains of very fragmented and dry fabric that presumably was made of uh, past fiber yarns. And this particular burial dates to circa uh, uh, 1215. And uh, uh, in the bottom left, there's a recon my reconstruction, uh, how this, uh, uh, this um, headdress would have looked like without the wrenches because I didn't know how to, how to put them there. Um, this headband as well as some other textiles found in the burials from Valmariniemi point to Eastern Karelian origin. Uh, so meaning this region uh, in, in the Eastern side of Finland. 
uh, along also um, uh, during the um, 19th century, uh, unmarried girls used similar kind of bands and uh, they were usually red, red bands. Uh, to this same cultural tradition belong also the so-called bun bands uh, that were tied around a bun of hair uh, somewhere um, in the back of, uh, uh, of skull. Uh, one such band was found, uh, this particular uh, example from High Lord Island, uh, which is um, uh, very close to local uh, center, uh, trade center in Oulu. And uh, this uh, dates to the beginning of the 16th, uh, 17th century. Uh, this was made of leather and uh, it had a bronze fire core and there were, it was decorated uh, with uh, hundreds of small beads, glass beads. Uh, there are also other similar kind of, uh, this kind of bands uh, made of leather and silk fabric. And uh, they have this uh, core of metal, bronze wire metal, or uh, the core is made uh, from um, birch bark. Uh, some uh, the, uh, these bands have been found in, in this uh, western part of Finland, uh, in Oulu and uh, in on High Lord, uh, and, but they um, uh, represent uh, the uh, connections to the east because Finland Finland at the time was um, a, a place where eastern and uh, western traditions, uh, both religious and um, and um, uh, cultural traditions interacted with with one another. So we have these uh, kind of mixed periods in our uh, collections. Um, uh, later, uh, during the uh, 18th century, and also uh, by the end of um, uh, um, 17th century, uh, children were often buried wearing a cap. Uh, sometimes these are christening caps, and other times caps were made particularly for the burial. Uh, christening caps for boys and girls were different. Uh, as with adults, boys' caps were made from fetch-shaped uh, uh, blue fabrics, and uh, the seams were often covered with red ribbons as in, uh, in this picture. There's another uh, close-up picture from, uh, from one of these caps found uh, in, in, in burials from High Lord. Uh, girls' christening caps, uh, so-called heart caps, because they have uh, on, on forehead, uh, the, they, they look like hearts. Um, these were made from two pieces of fabric and decorated, often decorated with lace. And there are, uh, this is uh, from uh, museum collections uh, from Sweden, but they have these really nice uh, decorations on, on service or may have, not always. Um, uh, during the 18th uh, century, boys were often uh, buried without any caps, so um, not always, not with cap, uh, not always with caps. Um, so uh, this is an example of uh, of those uh, caps made particularly for burial purpose. This cap was made from three different fabrics, and uh, here you can see that uh, the the uh, uh, fabrics were very different from one another. So one would assume that they weren't used in daily life like that. And um, uh, here's another, uh, this is an example from the um, uh, mid 19th century, really nice cap made for burial purpose. Uh, from this uh, Tule uh, fabric, 
that has has been decorated used for some some other purpose earlier but uh, from these pictures you can see that it was just uh, uh, kind of uh, folded on the on the head and uh, it wasn't probably original cap and uh, decorated for 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 this very purpose likewise rest of the uh, funerary attire uh, on on this baby girl Uh, caps were often decorated with popping laces. Uh, many of these uh, from the 18th century are made in Finland, uh, in southern Finland, and some of them were presumably made also in the area that, uh, that um, we are talking about. But they are uh, especially uh, from the 17th century, early 17th century, uh, there are onwards there are also many examples of um silk laces open laces that were important imported to to the region from uh, uh from capital cities in uh, in rest of uh, europe so there are uh these materials are a mix of local and international uh textile uh textile use and uh, trade. Uh, Finnish folklore suggests that uh, putting a cap in the head of the deceased was highly recommended. Uh, as archaeological data indicates, the coffins were furnished with pillows and mattresses, and uh, they were beds uh, where the deceased slept and waited for resurrection. Uh, it was believed that the dead should enjoy their time in the coffin, uh, which would keep them from coming back as, as ghosts. Uh, there are uh, many stories of people, including children, coming as ghosts uh, to complain uh, that they were feeling cold in their coffins and uh, they, because they didn't have uh, cloths, stockings or caps. And uh, to prevent this, it was advised to be proactive and uh, put these items in the, in the periods. And uh, particularly, this has been important in case of adults. So for some reason, children are seldomly buried wearing gloves. Uh, they, they, all examples that I know of have always stockings in their uh, feet. But uh, as I said, some boys are uh, buried without, without any caps. Um, in case of older children, uh, as uh, the example on the left, uh, cap is usually a cap that uh, was used by this girl uh, during her life. Uh, but uh, these uh, um, may, uh, caps made for their period purposes, they are usually uh, on the heads of newborns or very small, uh, probably uh, stillborn babies. Um, um, additionally, uh, children buried below these uh, church floors, uh, these materials are uh, uh, almost exclusively uh, from, uh, from periods below church floors. Uh, and um, for, for that reason, the preservation is, uh, is also quite perfect. And uh, in this context, um, uh, we find quite a lot of uh, floral breads in heads uh, of these children, and they hold them in their hands, and there are some floral breads like uh, this example here uh, uh, on, on their arms. Uh, they were made of fab, uh, fabric, uh, steel fabric and um, plant fiber fabrics um, uh, from paper uh, as this example here. And uh, there are uh, metal spir uh, spirals and metal, uh, metal uh, bronze fire used for this with uh, these um, breads. 
And uh, this example here, uh, there's also some paper, uh, paper flowers and textile flowers. And they, then there is this um, uh, red wool ribbon or thread uh, uh, wrapped around, uh, around the um, metal wire. And this one I really, really like. Uh, this is on on chest of a uh, of um, uh, three year uh, three months old child. Uh, very nice uh, flowers um, made uh, made from different colored yarns, light uh, light colors, light red and uh, yellow. Uh, this one is from Tornio, which is the uppermost side of the of, of 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 my collections and here's an uh, example of this uh, spiral uh fire uh, bronze fire made into spirals and uh, then kind of made into flowers and uh, uh um uh, silver yarn wrapped around them so they these have been really nice looking when they when they were put into these periods, nineteenth uh, uh, century ethnographic uh, evidence suggests that uh, this kind of uh, threads were uh, might have been a bridal crowns and bouquets, and um, these were put uh, on the head heads and hands of unmarried girls that were occasionally dressed as brides. Uh, they had not lived not long enough uh, to receive bridal crowns in their earthly life, but were provided with a life, uh, life's crowns, so-called life's crowns in burial. Uh, to ex express uh, children's innocence, virginity and status as heavenly queens, a uh, crown was a symbol of uh, a pride of Christ, so-called. Uh, this tradition of burying unmarried girls uh, as brides and boys as grooms uh, seems to be a trans-European uh, practice with roots in the 16th century. But in every single case, uh, 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 I would be a bit um, uh, and uh, I would not always buy this explan explanation uh, uh, when uh, interpreting all of these burials, but I, I think there there must be something something similar related to these to these um, ideas. And this uh, Sarah Wackling's uh, book One Hundred Memories from Ostrobotnia is one of my favorite. Uh, favorite uh, stories uh, why uh, these um, uh, accessories were put into burials and who made them because she has a local story saying that uh, it was uh, adolescent girls who were nearing their marital age who crafted these items for, uh, for they got uh, children uh, uh, and um, and uh, these occasions, uh, they, they, they crafted these with their with their friends, and um, uh, and uh, these uh, were made uh, over the night after the child had died, and uh, their future grooms were invited to these occasions. So they were a so it was a social event, and uh, my interpretation is that uh, this crafting ritual was a way of the community to subtly prepare the young or for the facts of life uh, that many children die, but those left behind needed to continue their lives. They couldn't be too uh, depressed about that young children died quite often at the time. Uh, the crafting event was in some sense very joyful and often with uh, filled with an array of emotions from falling in love <laughs> to sorrow. Uh, this is 
So to conclude, um, collections from the medieval and uh, post-medieval times, such as that uh, imperial traditions changed through time and followed uh, also the religious beliefs, social rules and norms, as well as fashions and uh, products that were brought from Europe uh, to, uh, to Northern Finland. Uh, even the simplest cap uh, in the period carries a significant load of meaningful cultural traditions and emotions of those who made these items. And of course, uh, in case of children, parents who needed to bury their, uh, their children. Uh, these um, ideas uh, and meanings, they are intertwined with uh, ideas of baptism, uh, respecting dead individuals and fear of death, as well as ideals of childhood as an innocent phase of life. Uh, examining the used fabrics uh, very closely, cut, cut, uh, how they were cut, sewn, uh, attached together, decorated and uh, uh, dressing, how these were dressed on the deceased, uh, re reveals quite important aspects of the, uh, of the communities and how they handled uh, this uh, difficult task of burying pre prematurely uh, dead children. Uh, tracing of the dead and uh, selecting suitable garments and fabric materials was strictly guided, uh, especially during the post-medieval period, by social norms and religious beliefs. And uh, in this case, uh, the textile evidence is best understood uh, while interpreting uh, with historical sources and uh, information from uh, folklore. But uh, that is uh, what I wanted to say. I wanted to keep it simple <laughs> for today. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sana, for your presentation. It was it was very moving. Um, yeah, with these burials and the care taken to uh, to bury them, and with the flowers and everything, that was very very touching, actually. And uh, yeah, well, I would like to welcome any questions for Sana, both here on Zoom or maybe via uh, YouTube. Give it a, a little while. Don't be shy. <laughs> no? No question on YouTube so, yeah. so far. Also not here on Zoom. Well, as before, uh as our previous session, Oh, yeah, sorry, Martha. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> of course you can, yeah. I was curious, uh, Sana, about, um, like you mentioned that somehow uh, this was this interpretation that the, the girls, uh, they were dressed like uh, brides. And do you have any like written evidence of that? Or it's just like, yeah, there are. Yes, yes, they, there is, uh, there, there are these um, uh, 18th century ethnographic work that has been uh, done in Sweden. And uh, this was a uh, common uh, during the 18th century. It, it was a common belief or common thinking that uh, that uh, they were brides of Christ. And uh, but uh, when when we have very small babies buried like this, I, I don't think it's necessarily the the best interpretation for perhaps in case of adolescence, it's more more um, appropriate interpretation. Yeah. Yeah, th thank you, because I, I, yeah, I was curious about this. Yeah, yeah, how this trend, yeah. thank you very much. It's quite interesting, just as a comment, so that because there's a little time, uh, last week we were in uh, Vienna for another EuroWeb conference, and we actually visited uh, the St. Michael's crypt uh, in Vienna. And we uh, saw quite similar and contemporary burials where the same phenomenon, at, at least with uh, adolescent like young women, 
on Mary buried with these flower crowns. That was uh, quite interesting and quite fascinating and really moving and small child burials as well. I'm not yeah. an expert in this, but it's just, it seems like it's a rather widespread phenomenon during this period, at least in, in Europe. I yes, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, also in Polish materials that I, I've seen there. The, uh, well, the, there are differences on how, how you craft these things and so on, but uh, the ideals are really, very, very much similar throughout Europe, I would say. Yeah, yeah. very interesting. Oh, and there's a comment from Francesca Scratti, and she's very excited to see you in person. <laughs> <laughs> because you have uh, she has used your work a lot so that's uh, a nice comment yeah thank and you. thank you francesca for sending your book i haven't thank you <laughs> for that yeah nice yes. wow. to see you too oh, and I, petra wants yes to... i see yes. yes okay i just uh, wanted to make one remark uh, the idea um of children children's burials um um, the idea that the children who die too early are missing uh, their life and uh, they are um, equipped in the grave with uh, adults' um, clothing or adults' tools or something like this. This is already uh, present in Roman burials and in late antique burials. So this is very interesting when we see children with uh, adult clothing and... Um, adult head coverings actually yes yeah yeah so the, the, i think this is something uh, not necessarily not necessarily connected to the idea of christian of course because it's too early but to the idea that the child missed uh, very important steps in in their life and uh, they are given the, the equipment for this life for the afterworld or something like this yeah, it would yeah. be very interesting to trace this uh, phenomenon in different cultures, also. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I found this phenomenon also in prehistoric Italian yeah. burials. So, ah, yeah. fine, it's really good. Yeah, fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thank you, Petra. Thank you, Sana. Are there any other comments or questions for now? No? All right. Yeah, yeah sorry, oh, I was sorry, yeah. Yes, it's just, uh, yeah, I think we have just a comment, uh, uh, like an additional comment from YouTube from Yeva, uh, who uh, says that it was also common in Latvia too, but it was about grown up at Marine Girls. Yes. To add to the discussion, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in, the, in the, this ethnographic uh, evidence, I think the youngest uh, individuals that were connected with these ideas were around six to eight years old. So not newborns. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. And once again, thank you, Sana. This was very, very interesting. Thank you so much for your paper. And good luck with checking out. Yes. Nice to see you again online. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. All right. <laughs> Thank Bye. you. Uh, and then I will take the opportunity to welcome our next speakers, two speakers for our ne next uh, paper. And this is Ana Maria Desiderio, uh, who has studied classical archaeology at the University of Salano. And she has continued her training at the University of Paris Nanterre. And here she obtained a PhD, a PhD sorry, in history and archaeology of the ancient world in 2019. And her thesis focused on cultural exchange and mobility in Campania from the Iron Age to the classical period. And through the examination of the necropolises of Pondicaniano and its territory, she questioned the relationship between ethnicity and material culture and the role of cultural contact processes in the social political development of communities. Besides her teaching activities, she continues her research on cultural contacts in the Mediterranean region between the 9th and the 7th centuries BC. And she participates in the Poseidonia Pestum research project 
Uh, yes. And she is co-presenting together with Ariana Iscusito, and who is a historian, and she uh, obtained a PhD at Cafoscari University in Venice uh, in social history in 2006. And uh, she's also an archaeologist and received a PhD in archaeology at Paris, one Pantheon Sorbonne University in 2005. Her expertise focuses on Greek colonization and the construction of social identities on cross-cultural and economic interactions in the Western Mediterranean area between the early Iron Age and the late Archaic period. And since 2009, she is Associate Professor at the University of Burgundy. She collaborates with the École Française de Rome and Centre Jean Perrin in Naples, where she coordinates a project on the mobility of craftsmen in central and southern Italy from the 9th to the 6th centuries BC. And she was a Fuji Young Fellow at Yale University in 2019, and she has over 25 years of fieldwork experience in the Mediterranean. Very impressive. So I would like to welcome Ana Maria and Ariana, who will present their paper Revising Dress Code, some case studies from early Iron Age communities of Southern Italy. So please. Thank you. Uh, Ana Maria will uh, speak for both of us and I will share uh, the PowerPoint. It's Ooh. good for you? Yes, yeah. very good, Perfect. it works. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, first of all, Ariane Esposito uh, and I would like to thank the organizers for welcoming our contribution to the conference, uh, which has uh, so far been very rich and challenging. Uh, so, since uh, the end of the 8th century BC, uh, Campania was occupied by several ethnically and culturally different communities. The relation that these communities have uh, with each other quickly simulate the formation of hybrid or mixed cultures. In this regard, we are interested in the, the objects of parure and clothing practices. The different forms of body ornaments can firstly contribute to our knowledge of clothing, since several objects, for example, bronze buttons, rings, beads, and small metal plates, were sewn onto textile or leather supports, which have now disappeared. According to some ancient traditions, the thinking of bronze had also the power to ward off evil, and the presence of embers, scarab amulet, ivory, and shells provided a kind of protection based on the inherent properties of exotic materials. A first direct immediate question concerns the ethnic value of ornaments and clothing. Adornment is really considered as a gift or uh, an acquisition. It is almost always considered as a strong marker of ethnic identity. However, as Michel Gras points out, the fibule also make it possible to identify conveyors or travelers. In the female burials of the Iron Age in Southern Italy, the exceptional local variability of the set of ornaments can be attributed to very different factors, ethnic, social, gender, but also the economic relations and mobility phenomena. Women play a key role in the circuits of exchange of objects of which ornaments are part. Diplomatic, but also ceremonial gifts, for example, in matrimonial uh, alliances, must have played an important role in the redistribution of these objects. These ornaments therefore indicate that we are sometimes dealing with a cultural phenomenon that goes beyond the simple, tra the simple transmission or circulation of goods. The point to the existence of matrimonial alliances, of course, but also to the phenomenon of inclusion or exclusion at the intra and intergroup stages and even to privileged link, uh, links on uh, an ethnic and or social level. The starting point of our analysis is the site of Ponte Cagnano on the left bank of the Picentino River in the Sele Plain. 
it plays an essential role in the protohistoric companion landscape. Several studies have shown that the community of Ponte Cagnano was permeable and received external elements of a loctonous origin from the first phases of the Iron Age. So, sorry, I can't uh, um, even switch my <clears throat> PowerPoint. No. Oh, okay. So I, uh, we, we are on the Sele Plain uh, with the, the site of Ponte Cagnano. Uh, that plays an essential role in the proto-historic companion landscape. Several studies have shown that uh, the community of Ponte Cagnano was permeable uh, to the external elements uh, of a loctonous origin from the first uh, phases of the Iron Age. The funerary data, data testify to the integration of high-ranking figures, both male and female, into specific sectors of the necropolis. They were integrated into the community in a non-subordinated uh, social position within the framework of individual mobility dynamics. In the suburban necropolis of Pagliarone, at three kilometers east of the main center, the tomb uh, 889 is located at the fringe of funerary cluster established at the, the beginning of the 19th century BC, whose occupation lasted only until the beginning of the following century. We can see the, here the, uh, the, the necropolis of Pagliarone. The warrior tomb 889 that we can see to the, on the next, uh, on, on, the, uh, on the left uh, side of this uh, chart, uh, is uh, very uh, closely related to the large contemporary grave 2066. In the absence of anthropobiological data, the funerary material has been interpreted as that of a woman. She is clothed in a rich funerary costume decorated with small bronze nails and rings. Seven bronze fibulae form a head ornament closing a veil. The fibulae have terminal disc feet, enlarged and foliated bows, arch, and threaded bows with alternating amber segments and bone discs. The deceased also wears a bronze pendant and ring and a series of amber and glass paste beads. A rich set of spinning and waving tools in impasto marks the eminent status of the deceased underlined also by the exceptional presence of the bronze spindle. The numerical distribution of spindles, spools, bobbins, loom weights, and other textile tools, and their combination in each context, could reflect, to a certain extent, the textile production process. Margarita Gleba has suggested that the spindle simply defines the deceased as a woman. On the other hand, the presence of several instruments and above all spools mean that the deceased was a specialist in textile crafts and not only a woman. The presence of work tools, as well as rich and complex personal parure, denote an important female personality in society and recognized as such in the funerary performance. Origin, status, and gender are made explicit by the richness of the clothes and the hairstyle, and underlined by the tools that connote the economic role played by the woman deceased in the community. In this respect, still in the Pagliarone necropolis, we can point out the tomb 683, a female cremation in a biconical vase dated to the middle of the 9th century BC. The abundance of fibulae with enlarged and foliated bows, arch and fitted bows with amber and bone discs, spirals, small bronze nails and rings, testifies to the richness of the funerary costume. 
in addition to this spread to the presence of spindle bores and the bronze spindle, the rank of deceased is also underlined by the rich impasto pottery service. Finally, among the great goods, we note a bronze cauldron of Cyprus manufacture. In this case, a generation after June 2066, the economic role of the deceased uh, and their insertion in the Mediterranean exchange circuits is reinforced by the presence of this exotic cauldron. Is this a diplomatic gift? In fact, the exchange system intensified in Campania in the first half of the 8th century BC, with the formation of Pitecuse, followed by the Apoikia of Puma. At the same time, in Ponte Cagnano, we can observe the gradual hierarchization of society and the transformation of territorial planning with new forms of mobility and settlements. The funerary evidence allow us to identify the rise of a prominent social segment. One of the most important female burials of this phase is the tomb 7178, discovered in the eastern necropolis of Sant'Antonio. The deceased in the tomb 7178 is closed with bronze spirals placed near the head, a silver ring and a rich necklace made of amber and glass paste. The prayer of the deceased also includes the 10 large bronze fibulae and above all, a fibula with serpentine iron bow, which in Ponte Cagnano was more common in the male costume uh, during this phase. However, this finding must be treated with uh, relative caution. Combination of both types of fibule are attested at Vei, Putte Cagnano, Sala Consilina, Fossa, Incoronata and Torregalli. In many cases, in these sites, the grace with both types belong to adult women. This observation implies may override from the usual gender models. The socially constructed sex is here the most socially important category. The eminent status of the deceased is revealed not only by her clothing, but also by the rich set of functional instruments, spindle words, spindle needle. The great good of the barrier also includes a complex service of important vessels. This rich assemblage, in which the set of bronze vases stand out for its exceptional character, underlines not only the rank of the deceased, but also her openness to circuits of circulation with the Aegean and Eastern world. Female tomb, um, female tomb 7178 is thus the expression of an emerging aristocratic segment at the head of a very wide network of relation which goes beyond the limits of the peninsula, opening to a long distance exchange. Should we see in this exuberant and uh, heterogeneous accumulation of objects, some gifts linked to the wedding? Social change occurred in the society of Ponte Cagnano during phase two. The suburban side of Pagliarone coming to an end. At the same time, in the Ager Picentinus, New coastal and river ports of coal were created at strategic points of maritime and land communication in order to take advantage of the opportunities offered by the intensification of trade. The site of Monte Vetrano, located in the interland three kilometers north uh, of Ponte Cagnano, occupies a system of three hills. In a short period of time, it has yielded about 3,060 burials dating from the third and last quarter of the 8th century BC. The bone remains from tomb 111 refer to an adult female, female uh, individual. The bronze fibula is one of the earliest examples with a sanguisuga cava bow, a technique that helps to save metal. The type is also attested at Pitcusei, but comparisons are also possible with specimens from Vetulonia and Ardea. The tomb 74 is a barrier of monumental dimensions. 
the role of deceased is marked by a rich ensemble of ornaments in bronze, silver, and gold, rings, scarab amulet, and collar. It is accompanied uh, by a set of important uh, bronze vessels, referring to the sphere of sacrif sacrifice and banqueting. The bronze disaf scepter, with a probably ritual function, as a pendant in tomb 386 from Fornaci in Capua. A model of a nuragic boat, probably hoarded, renews and exalts the ceremonial role of a high-ranking personage. We can see uh, the, the great goods on the next uh, slide. It is part of a large scale traffic system between East and West, mediated by the elites of Montevetrano. The eminent social level of deceased, indicated by the set of imported metal vessels, recalls the contemporary princely tombs of Ponte Cagnano that we see uh, previously. The Montevetrano burials indicate a phenomenon that could be described as cultural convergence. Within the elite, it is possible to identify some exceptional female figures which use the dress code and other objects, including ceramic and metal objects, to assert a social bond that goes beyond ethnicity. We observe the shared intention to refer to the same scheme of social representation, an expression of cultural and ideological models commonly adopted by the female uh, aristocracy. The funerary variability illustrates the complex dialectic between conservatism and novelty. These two tombs uh, are an effective representation of the mixed world linked by relationships of Syngenia, characterized the Tyrrhenian elites of the 18th century BC beyond ethnic differences. The hierarchies control micro and macro regional circuits, both internal and coastal, with mobility phenomena. These mobility phenomena are from the areas of central and Adriatic Italy, the Apennines, and the Eunotrian territories of Calabria and Lucania. Once again, it is mainly the female burials that illustrate this phenomenon of mobility through the display of personal clothing. Thus, the woman buried in tomb 24 of Fontanella Necropolis underlines the relationship with the middle and upper of Fanto Valley. She is dressed in a rich ensemble of arched bracelets objects that characterize the centers of Oliveto Citra, Cairano, but also the sites of Lavello or Melfi. This cultural component is recognizable by the female periors. These include arched bracelet, triangular omega-shaped or clapper-shaped pendants, earrings with sp spiral ends. In addition, certain specific vase in impasto at the value of a true cultural, cultural markers. The zoomorphic pendants of tomb 68 for Fontanelle, widely attested in the Picenian area, are related to the Adriatic side of the peninsula. Similar observation can be made for a funerary nucleus located near the Picentino River Ford, dated between the third and the last quarter of the eighth century. Within this group, there is the woman of the tomb 130 wearing a bronze ornament comprising three four spiral fibulae of Oenotrian type. The parure set of the neighboring grave 127, a woman, includes a pendant made of amber beads that descends from the left shoulder according to a custom that refers to the Oenotrian region as Latronico Alianello Chiaromonte sites. It's interesting to note that these female barriers have a combination of male and female fibulae in their funerary costume, with, uh, which at Ponte Cagnano indicate an opposition between the two genders. This custom is more characteristic uh, of the indigenous environment of Southern Italy. In the settlement of Casella, 
on, in, the, in the plane, Teresa 54 reconstructed a woman's costume based on the preserved periods. The female deceased of grade uh, 4,891 wearing a dress attached to the shoulders by two fibulae and the cloak closed by several fibulae that were found on the chest and pelvis. In addition, the dress was equipped with small bronze rings and buttons sewn onto the fabrics. These ornaments were found throughout the area between the shoulders and legs. Finally, it reconstructs a belt uh, made of amber beads, pearls, and pendants, uh, a widespread custom in the indigenous world of Basilicata. Grave, grave um, 4891 has established that burial clothing usually consisted of a robe, perhaps a double, a double cloth, over which a veil or cloak was uh, placed. The uh, original position of the zoomorphic pendant uh, showing a crouching monkey uh, is not known. The immediate, immediate visibility of female barriers with the complex barriers uh, falling to the local repertoire su suggests the greater uh, mobility of the female component. Thus, the presence of foreign women has generally been explained by the argument of matrimonial alliances. The studies carried out uh, on the urban necropolis uh, of Ponte Cagnano have allowed this hypothesis to be revised. The work of Maria Assunta Pozzo on the Eastern Necropolis of the site has shown the matrimonial exchange are only one of the possible forms of integration. Uh, the, west, the southwestern nucleus of Chiancone area uh, shows uh, um, uh, women, children, and uh, um, uh, male graves that shows uh, uh, um, links to the Oliveto Citra Cairano cultural facies. The sociology of this uh, nucleus does allow us to infer the mobility of an entire group of individuals. The accentuation of specific features of the material culture of Oliveto Citra Cairano is an expression of the funerary strategy adopted aimed at creating an alternative identity to the dominant one. Different levels of integration define two groups of non-native origin located in the Biblioteca and archaeological promenade sectors on the Western Necropolis. They include individuals buried with the ceramics or ornaments of Oliveto Citra Cairano type, aggregated with deceased, accompanied by objects that refer to the Sarno Valley and Northern Campania, to the Northern Lucanian or medio adriatic area. The most prominent features are concentrated in the barriers of adult women. This is the case of the tombs 3875, and I'm sorry, yes, Maria, I will I'm, just say, it's yes, been there. yeah, I will, uh, I will finish. Perfect, and thank uh, you. so, uh, this um, uh, dress code of these uh, two, uh, two tombs uh, communicates symbols related to an expression of collective belonging and individual differentiation. The choice of funerary representation suggests the possible intersection of ethnic uh, aspects with factors related to, to gender, age classes, or social status of the deceased. Matrimonial alliances are not enough to explain everything. Female mobility can have independent and varied origins. In terms of adornment and clothing, each component can, can or must have adopted specific choices of funerary representation, varying them in certain precise situational and relational conditions. So thank you for your attention. That was very fast, sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, very, very interesting. And Ponte Cagnano is such a fascinating site. So thank you so much for presenting your research into this really, really uh, exciting um, burial ground, oh, cemetery. Um, yes, so thank you to the both of you. And I would like to open the floor already to questions or comments 
from our fellow speakers and from the audience via YouTube. Just. No, you, you were so convincing again. <laughs> Everybody is convinced. Okay. Fine. Mm -hmm. Just open here to see. Yeah. I'll give it a little time. I have a question on YouTube for now. No. I'm checking, but no. <laughs> yeah. All right. But yeah, again, very interesting material and so rich burials. It's really, really fascinating. Um, yeah, blown away by uh, the material you have presented. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see, I'll just check the chat. Oh, and as I said, people are also welcome to just turn on their microphones and comment if you have. Yeah. All right. Thank you. No, oh, yeah, thank you for presenting. It was really exciting. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, we're completely on time. I should just let you speak because we actually have some, uh, some time because unfortunately, as Magda said earlier, uh, Giacomo Badelli unfortunately had to cancel because he has turned ill. So we hope, of course, for his quick recovery. But that's, of course, really a pity because I think his uh, paper would have supplemented, like followed your paper and presentation really well. But hopefully, if he gets better, perhaps he can present uh, tomorrow instead. Um, yes, so this is actually a quite a, a short session before our lunch break, but this is also to keep like every session, more or less on time, like the, the same papers in their announced uh, sessions for people joining later on, for example. But this means that we will have a very long lunch break, actually, until two o'clock when we meet again, maybe a couple of minutes before, that would be great. Uh, I as chair would really appreciate that. And then we will discuss, uh, we'll continue our exciting program with Francesca Scotti, Courtney Ward and Petra Linscheid who will present after lunch. Unless there are any final questions or comments? No? All right, then I would like to thank you all again and a special thanks to our speakers of this short but very exciting uh, session. And then we reconvene again at two o'clock. Okay. All right. Have a nice lunch, everybody. You too. <clears throat> Bye. Bye. Thanks, see you. Bye.
Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, Francesca. Hello. Good to see that you are ready, Francesca. We'll just wait uh, yes. two minutes. <laughs> Very good. We'll just wait a couple of minutes until we are sure we yes. have everyone with us. Okay. And back from lunch break. So. All right, on my clock, it is exactly two, and we should be ready. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So, All right. welcome back, everybody, from your lunch break. I hope you had a relaxing time and something nice to eat, because now we will continue our program and with some very exciting papers. We have three papers in this session just after lunch. And our first speaker is Francesca Scotti. I'll just present you briefly. Francesca is a specialist in Roman and ancient law, and she has published widely on this topic. She received her law degree, first honors, in 1995 at the Università Cattolica del Sacro Cuore di Milano. And in 1998, she did a postgraduate scholarship at the Faculty of Law at Exeter University. And then from 2001 till six, she has held research grants in Roman law at Universita, Universita Cattolica del Sacro Cuore di Piacenza and at the Universita Cattolica del Sacro Cuore di Milano. And since 2009, uh, Francesca has worked as a tenured research fellow in Roman law at this University in uh, Milano, and she has also uh, taught courses also in English, such as the Roman law and common law to Jewish prudential traditions in comparison. Sorry, that was difficult to say. <laughs> <laughs> and she has passed the National Scientific Qualification Procedure for Associate Professor. And today, Francesca will give a presentation entitled an example of a gift out of the inheritance concerning male garments, the role of gender in the clothing department according to Roman jurists. That sounds very interesting. <laughs> so uh, Francesca, please, uh, okay. the floor is yours. Okay, so um, thank you um, to everybody and especially to Magdalena, Cecily and Paula 
uh, for inviting me to um, talk about this subject and to give me uh, this great opportunity to let people know what I normally study, <laughs> at least in the last few years. Um, I would share um, my screenshot, uh, my, my, my screen. Uh, oh my God, I hope it's, it's okay. Oh my God! Sorry. Oh, no stress. Just uh, take it easy, and we'll get there. Okay. Oh. oh, okay. I think I have to do this. Okay, let's hope it's working. Yes, okay, um, here it is. Okay, so um, as you can see from my, the title, um, I will try to uh, talk in a very uh, brief way about um, a, lay, a case law concerning a gift out of the inheritance um, dealing with male garments. And the subtitle is the role of gender in the clothing department according to Roman juries. So um, at the first glance, we can say that uh, the topic I'm going to talk to you uh, concerns the law of successions in Roman law. And in order to help you better understand this case, I have to tell you what a, uh, a gift out of the inheritance is. A, get, a gift out of the inheritance um, could be Mm, compared to a legacy, even if the term legacy has a very general meaning. A gift out of the inheritance is um, a, a provision that is intended to give uh, some benefits, economical benefits, to single uh, persons who um, are not um, identifiable with the uh, universal successors, such as the heirs, because the heirs succeed in all the rights and duties of the head of the household. And there are a lot of consequences coming from that, but I'm not going to um, uh, examine these consequences. Um, I think it's enough that you know that uh, the head of the, of the household had this uh, possibility to uh, benefit uh, the people he loved or he, he was a friend of um, foreseeing uh, the future of certain assets. As you can see, this passage comes directly from the Digest, um, from uh, Book 34, Title 2, Fragment um, 33. This is a traditional way to uh, cite the passages um, belonging to Justinian's digest. But here, it's very important to highlight that the author of this passage is Pomponius, 
um, who was um, a jurist belonging to the classical period of Roman law, and in particular belonging to the second half of the uh, second uh, century uh, AD. And this passage um, has been taken from a commentary written by Pomponius ad quintum mutuum. It means that uh, Pomponius um, had uh, studied uh, the, the works of uh, Quintum Mucium, who was a late Republican uh, jurist, uh, very famous um, among all the following generations of jurists. He was considered something like a pillar of juristic uh, studies and, um, of course, the juristic profession. And so this fragment comes from the book four uh, of this commentary on uh, the, the works of Quintus uh, Mucius. Um, I think that due to the 20 minutes that I have to um, respect, um, I would uh, direct read the English translation with an eye to the Latin text. Uh, there is no difference between the expressions male dress and uh, clothing for men, but the intention of the testator sometimes creates difficulty if he himself used to wear a dress that was also suitable for men. So um, in this particular case, we can see that um, the jurist starts with an assertion that has a general character. Uh, he says in Latin, inter vestem virilem et vestimenta virilia nil interest. What does it mean? Um, at a first glance, it might look as a mysterious uh, sentence. It means that, that whenever we find uh, in a will disposition um, a gift out of the inheritance, um, including uh, vestem, even if um, in this will um, the singular term is used. This singular doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the um, deceased wanted to leave just one single uh, cloth, but he uh, wanted to refer actually to the whole wardrobe. And it's interesting that this sentence will be uh, confirmed by Alpians, who uh, is a, a very important jurist of the first half of the third century AD, um, which, uh, as you can see, uh, expresses himself uh, almost in the same way. Vestis am vestimenta legentur nil refert. It makes no difference whether a dress or clothing is bequeathed. So, um, again, um, still, uh, this initial sentence that we find in a Pomponius uh, um, fragment uh, remains a little bit uh, strange, but we can understand the meaning of this um, uh, assertion um, by uh, reading uh, the uh, next uh, um, words who that, sorry, um, refer um, to um, a case law that is problematic. In the digest, juries normally consider uh, case laws 
or law cases that are uh, problematic. Otherwise, they wouldn't need any attention on their behalf. And in particular, uh, when we are talking about wills, uh, juries uh, normally intervene whenever the wills provisions are obscure, are ambiguous, so that the juries have to interpret them in order to uh, reconstruct the um, actual uh, will, um, let's say, intention, mind of the uh, testator, even if these juries know that they won't achieve uh, the absolute certainty because, of course, uh, the deceased has already uh, died. So we can't ask him what exactly he wanted to, to say. Let's, let's, um, let's say that this um, provision considered in itself that is not uh, in, within the material context in which it will be fulfilled is absolutely clear because the uh, head of the household has decided to leave his wardrobe, his male wardrobe to a legacy. But the problem arises at the very moment the heir and the legacy uh, meet together to uh, go uh, to the deceased house and fetch all the male dresses uh, belonging to uh, the head of the household. And they discover uh, the existence of uh, a dress that is suitable also for women. So, uh, this is uh, naturally a problem that is due to the fact that the testator uh, left a legacy of male dresses. But now uh, in the wardrobe, um, the legacy and the heir are finding a dress that is um, also suitable for women. So the main question here is, is this dress um, a dress that belongs to the legacy or is it not? And uh, the question is due to the fact that um, men usually wear uh, men's clothing, but sometimes they could use also uh, women's clothing. But um, we must um, highlight the fact that um, even if there, there were uh, no laws against men wearing female clothing, and so no sanctions at all uh, to uh, apply to those kind of men, there was a rule that really um, uh, was uh, connected to moral issues that um, refrained men from um, wearing uh, female dresses if this could harm the dignity, the uh, men, malehood of uh, these men. And this kind of rule, ethical rule, was also um, acknowledged by uh, juries. So we could go back to um, our uh, passage taken from uh, Ulpian, and in which uh, we find not only a, a division in different categories of clothes, but also the indication of those clothes that um, the um, Patres familias could wear, even if they were intended to be used by women, 
on the condition that um, wearing them uh, couldn't, um, sorry, couldn't um, create sensor uh, discredit uh, towards them. As you can see, uh, Alpians says clothing is either intended for the use of men, women, or children, or is common to both sexes, or is used by slaves. And then we have the indication uh, of what men's clothing is, and then uh, women's uh, clothing. And um, Alpian tells us that um, women's clothing is the one intended for the use of the mater familias and which a man cannot readily wear without censor. The same um, concept will be expressed uh, in uh, the post-classical era in a little work called uh, Pauli Sententiae, that is a sort of summary of the most important uh, sentences uh, of the jurist Paulus, who lived uh, uh, in the same period uh, of uh, Ulpian. And here again, if men's garments have been bequeathed only those intended for a male use are due in respect of the dignity of um, virility. Oh, um, so coming back to our um, fragment, we can say that um, the jurist here um, gives us the criterion to solve the problem, that is to ascertain the actual mind of the testator. And so uh, what shall we do? Um, we have to pay attention um, of the habits of the testator himself towards that particular dress, not minding of uh, what is actually um, intended for the use of women or for men. And as you can see, the jurist here uh, gives us only the criterion. And by applying uh, this criterion, we can uh, argue the solutions. Um, so um, the most important thing here is the mind of a testator. So that if a testator used to wear uh, those female, that female dress, uh, considering it as a male dress, for instance, um, considering the age uh, this passage was published, we are almost at the end of the second century um, AD, it's, prob it's probable that it's likely that this dress was, for instance, um, a tunica manicata that normally was um, a, a cloth, um, used by women, but starting from this period, this uh, kind of uh, cloth um, had been uh, used also by some men. So um, it was a category that weren't so uh, definitive anymore. And um, there was no certainty that by uh, wearing it, someone could be censored. Um, of course, if we find out that uh, the testator used um, that dress uh, um, in order to um, look like a woman, so if the dress was devoted to cross-dressing, in this case, this dress shouldn't uh, be the part of the legacy. And in order to support uh, <clears throat> his theory, Pomponius cites uh, uh, again, cites Quintus Mucius, because he's studying uh, Quintus Mucius' uh, work, and um, uses an argumentum a contrario, because um, 
Pomponius refers that reports that Quintus Mucius uh, knew a certain senator who was in the habit of wearing women's clothing at the table. We are talking about the so-called cenatoria, um, that were particular clothes that were normally used um, for dining by um, the people and especially the women. So um, if this uh, man, if this senator um, um, had decided to bequeath a garment that he used um, as a male garment, even if that garment was conceived just for women, and he uh, had wanted to leave a legacy of female dresses, that particular female dress wouldn't uh, have been part of the legacy. Because again, uh, what counts here is the mind of the testator and how the testator considered the dress. Of course, um, always provided this dress wouldn't uh, create any kind of uh, negative reaction within the Roman society uh, of the time. So we have two specular uh, cases here because uh, the case um, reported by Quintus Mucius um, deals with the legacy of female dresses and uh, uh, with a senator who used to wear uh, female clothing at the table. And so if this senator had left a legacy uh, concerning female uh, clothes, um, he would have never uh, intended that particular female dress that he used to wear at table as a part of this legacy. I hope that I have uh, respected the uh, time. Oh, yes. Yes, you have. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Perfect. 19 minutes and 45 seconds. Okay. <laughs> so that's perfect. I was really afraid of no. not um, uh, respect. It so was perfect. I, okay, so now I am trying, of course, to uh, get rid of my screen. Uh, okay, okay. Wonderful. All right. Thank you very much for this presentation and for presenting these sources, which I didn't know beforehand. So that was very enlightening. Thank you so much. It's always nice to also learn something entirely new. Thank and you. I am sure there must be questions for Francesca's uh, presentation, either here or via YouTube. YouTube is a little delayed, I'm told, so. Mm -hmm. I will just check the chat. And again, you're welcome to just unmute yourselves and post a question if uh, there's something have of interest. Hmm? Well, I would just like to comment that I found it really, really interesting and really all of this information in these sources about male and female garments and that this, how they're also divided also between men, women, children, and then enslaved people and not just, you know, I think that was really interesting with regard how clothing is reflected uh, well identity is reflected in, in clothing yeah. but of course i i said what i could because there would be yeah, more. I'm, sure, yeah I'm sure there's <laughs> much more yeah i have to read some of your publications <laughs> no but because it's really linked to uh, the studies of the historians, uh, the archaeologists, and uh, so I, I got a great help from them in order to better understand the passage. Yeah, 
But it's really interesting because I cannot help thinking what kind of female dress is this senator wearing? I'm already trying to imagine in my head what he's uh, uh, for instance, he's dressed. Yeah. Mm. As I was saying, uh, probably uh, a tunica manicata. Yes. If you if you like, I just um, show it to you. Um, just yes. a second. I don't want to. So um, here you see you have a tunica manicata because oh. here you have sleeves. And so um, let's say that until the half of the second century uh, AD, it was um, a, a kind of dress that um, was worn uh, by uh, women mm -hmm. and only women. Then progressively it, it started to be used also by men. Um, until uh, the, the end of the third and the century and the fourth, in which this kind of dress became a common dress. So tunica manicata uh, was a kind of dress that couldn't really um, cause um, big problems to the men who, who would like to wear them. On the contrary, Stola, as mm -hmm. you can see, um, it was a, a sort of uh, tunic without sleeves uh, that had belts. And here you see one with just one belt, but sometimes they put two belts. And um, for instance, Stola uh, was totally um, avoided for men because if a man uh, decided would decide to wear a stola he were, he would have been considered as uh, an effeminate and uh, all the moral reprobation would have um, hit him even if not um, in a very severe way. Uh, for instance, uh, infamia was a, a sort of uh, mark that came from the censors um, and was directed to people who uh, committed uh, deeds that uh, were aiming at uh, breaking uh, the trust of other people. In Latin, uh, it was called the bona fides, for instance, but not in this particular case concerning um, clothing. Very interesting. Thank you for yeah, also showing that. It was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's my privilege as a chair. I can ask the questions I want. <laughs> Are there any questions? Yeah, uh, yes. um, uh, so uh, one person is asking if you already published on this subject, on this particular subject. Uh, yeah, I'm going to. I'm going to. This is okay. the um, object of uh, ongoing research. Okay, great. And uh, uh, we have also um, Annika Hamelink uh, who asked if you could give again the reference uh, for the Ulpian passage. She would like to go to yes. Yes, of course. Um, okay. I can share. Uh, the, where is it? Here. This is the Alpians passage. And this is a passage that actually has been studied by many classics uh, scholars. Um, but uh, in order to really deeply understand uh, the sense of the other one that I talked uh, to you about, um, it's necessary to consider other fragments concerning interpretation of um, provisions contained in, in two wills. So, um, the, the people um, who are specialized in history, in classics, in archaeology, um, 
unfortunately, um, haven't got, at least at the moment, the instruments to better understand these texts. And, and so this is why I, um, I, I offer also myself to, to help them better understand. If, if, of course, in a humble way. Uh, so the text is book 34, title two, fragment 23, paragraph two, from the digest. And um, there is also, um, if you don't have a possibility to go through the digest, uh, I mean the book uh, of the Edizio Minor of the digest that was um, edited by Theodor Monsen. Uh, there is a website, it's called the Roman uh, Law uh, Library, and there you can find uh, the most important Roman law sources. And uh, you can also find the English and uh, I think also uh, French translations, just to have an idea. Very useful. That was a good tip. I just wrote it down. <laughs> okay. You. You're welcome. All right. Are there any further Excuse me, are there any further questions? No, I don't no? see. Yours. All right. Then thank you so much, uh, Francesca Scotti, for this enlightening paper. Very thank interesting. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then I would like to welcome our next speaker, Courtney Ward. There you are, Courtney. Hello. <laughs> Courtney Ward is a classical archaeologist and researcher at the Norwegian Institute in Rome. She received her Dr. Phil in Roman archaeology from the University of Oxford in 2014 with a thesis that focused on jewelry associated with the skeleton remains from the Bay of Naples preserved by the volcanic, volcanic eruption of Vesuvius. She has worked as a lecturer at several universities, including Hunter College in New York and the University of Kent. Um, Rome School of Classical and Renaissance Studies, and she has participated in field work on a wide range of projects in Britain, Italy, Turkey, and the US. While her academic interests cover many aspects of the ancient world, her research focuses on the lives of men, of men and women in the Roman period, particularly the role of personal adornment in the creation and display of diverse gender identities. So exciting. So thank you, Courtney. And Courtney will uh, present a paper entitled Marking Motherhood, Jewelry and Gender Identity in the Roman World. So please go ahead, Courtney. Thank you. Uh, let me try to share the screen. It is, uh, I'm hoping this is, hoping this is going to work. And anybody? Yep. Okay, great. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Um, so thank you very much to the organizers uh, for the opportunity to speak at um, such an interesting conference. My uh, paper focuses on an archaeological investigation into the gender identities associated with age and maternal status that were extant in the first century AD. And uh, my focus is, again, going to be on the skeletal evidence and associated jewelry finds from the Vesuvian area. And the benefit of the Vesuvian material is that the items are preserved in the way they were used in daily life. So objects of personal adornment, uh, such as jewelry, would have been those of a living individual with a complex relationship of identities, um, as opposed to objects associated with the identity of a person in death. Um, and that's why it's quite exciting uh, to, to study. And um, what's interesting is, again, the adornment um, was what they were wearing when they took flight. So it, well, perhaps not a normal day in the life of these individuals, it's about as close as we can, we can find to, to what people wore uh, on a daily basis. So um, this paper forms part of my wider work, which has sought to identify multiple femininities and masculinities 
within Roman society, um, again, looking at personal representation within its social, cultural, and historical contexts. Um, the use and display of personal adornment was integral in creating the gender identities of men and women um, in all periods, but uh, here during the first century AD. So alongside wealth, age, sex, and social status, um, masculinity and femininity were fluid aspects of an individual's identity, which could and did change over their lifetime. So a woman of constant wealth and social status would still have possessed various gender identities throughout her life. She would have been a child, a maiden, a bride, a wife, a mother, and possibly a widow. And what I'm trying to decipher is how were these changes visualized in personal appearance? Um, the importance of motherhood to female identity in the Roman world can be seen in this um, 18th century depiction of Cornelia, the mother of the famed Gracchi. In the somewhat apocryphal story on which the painting is based, Cornelia is asked to show her most precious jewels to another elite woman. Um, the woman is showing off her most beautiful and costly jewelry. And instead of presenting an item that she was currently wearing or summoning pieces from her jewelry box, Cornelia brought her sons. Um, and while this story represents an exaggerated ideal of the perfect Roman matron, um, both literary and funerary evidence demonstrate that there was a clear connection, particularly for an elite woman between her status and her children. Um, and again, in particular, the political career of her son or sons. Um, it must be noted about my study that three of the arguably most important aspects of an individual's gender identity, namely marital, parental, and birth statuses, are not identifiable in the skeletal record. Um, due to the culture and societal values of the Roman world, it could be assumed that a woman with children was most likely married. However, restrictions on the rights of men and women of servile status to marry obviously complicate this issue. Uh, furthermore, it's only when a fetus is found inside the mother that parental status can be positively identified. Just... Okay. Um, this paper will look at the jewelry assemblages found alongside the skeletal remains of victims fleeing from the eruption of AD 79. Uh, in particular, it will focus on two young women found at the house of Julius Polybius in Pompeii and um, at Aplantis B. Both were discovered with fetuses in their abdominal cavities and in possession of similar packages of adornment. By looking at two case studies of young mothers, this paper suggests that it is possible to identify at least a rough package of adornment associated with this stage in the female life course. Um, again, marital and maternal status were arguably some of the most important aspects of a woman's identity. And despite the moralizing tale of Cornelia, these identities were expressed through specific, specific articles of adornment. Okay. Um, the first uh, case study comes from the house of Julius Polybius in Pompeii. And the house is located on the north side of the Via della Madanza and covers roughly 700 square meters. The facade of the house um, through to areas A and C were uncovered during excavations in 1913. However, it was not until the 1966 to 1978 seasons that the entire house was uncovered. Now, the house derives its name from Julius Polybius, uh, who's named in several election notices on both the building's facade and its internal walls. Um, it's been argued that the house originally was built by an old patrician Pompeian family of the Genzulia, um, but had passed into the ownership of one of their freedmen by the time of the eruption. It seems clear, however, that the owner and his family were important players in Pompeii's political stage during the 80s, 60s, and 70s. So the question arises as to whether this assumed socioeconomic identity corresponds to the 13 individuals found in rooms H, H, and G, G of the house. And that's something I'll come back to in a moment. Um, so during the excavation, I'll there we go, of uh, room HH in June of 1975, at least six sets of skeletal remains were found. And this room, which is located in the northeast corner of the garden, um, had several skeletons found lying on or near beds, except for a single skeleton that was uncovered against the north wall on top of some tiles, which suggests it was from a different context at the time. 
The presence of a single family unit was suggested based on the discovery of these individuals altogether. And then this hypothesis was furthered, let's say, by the discovery of two individuals who appeared to have been holding hands at the time of their death. Uh, analysis of the mitochondrial DNA revealed that six of the victims were maternally related. And so on the basis of this assumed relationship, it was suggested that the skeleton I'll be discussing, which we'll call P7, um, had been brought to her family's house for the final stages of her pregnancy because she was excavated along with a nine to 10 lunar month old fetus. The skeletal analyses of the victims from the, casa, uh, from the house of Julio, uh, Julius Polybius um, present a relatively uniform group of related individuals. And not to go into too much depth about it, but they seem to have had a moderate to high um, lifestyle uh, regarding health and, and, and background. Um, while it's not possible to specifically assess the status of P7, the genetic relationship to five other individuals in the house suggests she had similar wealth and she was from a similar social background. In total, five pieces of gold jewelry were discovered with the skeletal remains, um, who was a woman between 16 and 18 years old. She had a pair of gold earrings, a pair of gold bracelets, and two gold and gem finger rings. The gold earrings are of hemisphere type and are constructed of gold foil. The gold bracelets were also constructed of gold foil that was folded inwards and then decorated with an embossed bezel depicting the three graces, as you can see on the right of the screen. Uh, these construction techniques would have allowed the owner to wear gold jewelry that appeared more expensive than it actually was. The most costly item of jewelry in the assemblage, um, well, two pieces actually, were the two gold and gem finger rings. And this would not have been due to the quality of their craftsmanship, but just to the the quality of the raw materials. And they were both rings set with gems uh, as intaglios. One was a carnelian and the other an amethyst. Okay. Okay, there's the rest of the jewelry so you can see. Um, the, the numbers and the scores are something that um, I'll get to at the end if I have time, um, but uh, they're just based on the material used, the weight of gold used, and the quality of craftsmanship. And they're just a way to kind of compare pieces that are written about in the same way, oh, gold earrings, um, but are clearly would have been different in cost and, um, and would have portrayed different, at least, uh, economic statuses. So the moderate to high nature of this jewelry assemblage seems to correlate with the seemingly moderate to high socioeconomic background of the woman. And uh, what's interesting, it's very clearly associated with her. The earrings were found during the excavation near her head, the bracelets were found on either arm, and the two finger rings were found near the left hand of the skeleton. So um, if we even had a doubt, we also found, um, well, they found uh, green, bluish, and black stains on the skeletal remains where they'd been in contact with metal objects. So it seems very clear that this was indeed associated with this pregnant young woman. Um, it's noteworthy that the pieces that she wore are very common um, in her gallium and often found in association with each other. Um, again, we can assume that she was uh, a wife because she was a mother, again, based on, on the kind of mores of the period. And so this seems to provide evidence that this material culture package may have been associated with, at the very least, marriage. The design of the jewelry and the material from which they were made uh, then probably pertained more to wealth uh, than the marital status in particular. The assemblage here um, is strikingly similar to another girl, also 16 to 20 years old, from Herculaneum. Uh, the major difference was not in the types of jewelry present, but rather the materials used in their co uh, composition. The former contained precious stones, while the latter used glass paste to imitate more costly materials. It's likely, therefore, that the packages of adornment represent similar identities, young married women from different socioeconomic backgrounds. In this case, the multiple finger rings and bracelets may be associated with marriage, while the hemisphere earrings seem to be an object of adornment that bridges these two different female gender identities. Uh, the second example uh, to look at briefly 
is a plantis bee, or the villa of Lucius Crassius Tertius, uh, which was discovered accidentally in 1974 during the construction of the Scuola Media. Uh, plantis bee was built in the second century BC and contained a portico with two stories of Doric columns and gray tufa and had a, a series of storerooms. The complex occupied a large insula, but was not a luxurious house, uh, as the ground floor rooms were either unplastered or simply whitewashed um, and contained beaten earth floors. The function of these rooms is based on finds of weights, a large quantity of small unripe pomegranates, which were most likely used in the tanning of hides, and a collection of over 400 amphorae. These finds, coupled with the presence of wheel ruts and a lack of wine presses, has led to the suggestion that this complex was an emporium specializing in the bottling of wine uh, rather than a residential villa, uh, which would be Villa A nearby. Uh, in 1984, 34 skeletons were unearthed in one of these vaulted storerooms along the, sorts, the south side of the portico in room 10. Um, Several of these uh, skeletons were associated with personal adornment. The excavation of room 10 was interrupted until 1991 and renewed campaign found 20 additional skeletons. Uh, interestingly, these did not have personal adornment and that's something scholars have uh, used to distinguish either their social status or identity. And obviously I don't have time to go into much of that here. Um, however, basically, um, the skeletal remains are currently being studied and have been studied by several scholars over the past 20 years, but unfortunately there's not much published on them at the moment. Um, hopefully uh, Christina Kilgrove is, is studying them uh, currently and I look forward to, to hearing more about, about that. But one of the most notable characteristics um, is that there were several similar packages of adornment between Villa B, Herculaneum and uh, Pompeii. Two women, for example, were found with a single bracelet and hairpin. And again, they both were female between 21 and 30 um, with a kind of different socioeconomic background than, than the P7 we'd been discussing. Okay, so the skeletal remains uh, of another young woman, uh, OP27, uh, we'll call her, uh, also contained those of a fetus. And this suggests that she was in the final weeks of pregnancy at the time of the eruption. Um, again, the presence of a fetus indicates that she was uh, a mother and uh, therefore probably married as well. Oh, um, sorry, here's the, the skeletal remains um, in room 10. Okay. So this woman was found wearing a long gold chain necklace of a very fine quality and a bracelet of rolled gold sheet decorated with a relief. Um, but the assemblage that she was carrying in a box contained some of the most impressive and valuable pieces within the whole study sample. There were a pair of double pearl pendant earrings with very large and perfectly matching pearls, which you can see on the lower right hand of the screen. Um, and again, not to go too much into it, but finding pearls that size, that match that perfectly, they would have been incredibly expensive. Uh, what's interesting is the box also contained some of the poorest uh, quality pieces as well. And I think you can see that in the different construction of the two uh, snake rings, finger rings. Uh, one is very solid, very heavy, fine detail, and the other is quite a thin gold wire with just minimal detail. Um, important to, to this paper is that the box also contained a pair of gold hemisphere earrings and two gold finger rings with incised decorations. The jewelry carried in bags and boxes is obviously difficult to analyze um, as it's impossible to attribute um, its ownership to a particular individual, um, even those who were in possession of the bags. However, they can still provide useful data. Um, OP27, for example, she fled the eruption wearing only a gold necklace and gold bracelet um, while carrying higher quality pieces. However, other individuals were found wearing a more costly set of jewelry than they were carrying suggesting there is some kind of wiggle room between who was wearing what at the time. Um, it's possible, again, that this suggests that the contents of boxes were household assemblages. And this theory is perhaps implied by the presence in this collection here of diverse sets of earrings, which may relate to diverse feminine identities. So my final thoughts, so I don't run over, I hope. Um, 
A gender identity based on marriage and motherhood is one that is supported by legal texts from the Augustan age. The Lex Iulia Papia Popea, for example, granted legal privileges to women who bore children, with mothers of three or more children being granted freedom from tutelage with the Ustream Liberorum. Um, that the status and identity were important is suggested by the fact that Livia was granted the Ustream Liberorum by the Senate, despite only having had two children. Um, in addition, we know from other sources that there could be clear connections between certain aspects of gender identity and the right to wear a specific adornment. Um, pearls, for example, were included in earlier Roman sumptuary laws, such as the Lex Iulia Sumptuaria, uh, where their use was restricted to individuals of a certain age and status on specific days. The skeletal remains from the Bay of Naples show age-related peaks in the type and amount of jewelry associated with men and women, um, most notably women between 16 and 20 and men between 21 and 30. Uh, it seems that the gender identities associated with these peaks may have been associated with the transition into married life. The large amount of jewelry associated with women between the ages of 16 and 20 is likely, likely to have been connected to childbirth as well as marriage. Um, in addition, um, it's possible that these larger jewelry assemblages um, represent uh, marital status that is not evident in the skeletal record. The similar packages of adornment associated with the two pregnant young women from the Bay of Naples suggest an association with motherhood, marriage, and potentially age. OP27 was a pregnant woman between 21 and 30 whose jewelry, while different from the hemisphere earrings and finger rings found with P7, contained a similar gold bracelet decorated with the relief. It's possible that the designs on these bracelets may relate to the marital and parental status of these two women, or even perhaps just their age. Um, the bracelet associated with P7 uh, had the three graces, while the one with OP27 showed a scene of Aphrodite in her toilet. And that there was an age relation to some of the jewelry is supported by a letter written by an Egyptian woman, Irene, to her brother. Um, in the early to mid first century AD papyrus, Irene asked her brother to send her several gold bracelets from Oxyrhynchos, where he was located. She distinguished between the bracelet for herself and those for the younger girls. Hers was to be for the hand of a mature woman, while the others were to be as if to fit the arm of Matrus. Um, perhaps the bracelets associated with these two pregnant women represent those fit for younger women. A similar choice may be seen in a gold fingering with an incised carnelian found on a woman between 41 and 50 years old from Herculaneum. Uh, you can see her here. She's one of the most famous uh, skeletons known as the Ring Lady in many National Geographic and, and other, um, other publications. Um, as you can see from the two pictures, however, it's sometimes unclear even in the modern excavations exactly where jewelry was found because these are both published images um, we're both purporting to show exactly how the skeleton was excavated, um, but obviously the rings are on different fingers. So um, sometimes it does make life difficult. Um, but what's interesting here is that one of the rings is um, an intaglio decorated with a hen and three little chicks. And I think perhaps you can see the three little chicks. Um, there's one here, one here, and one here above, above the hen. And um, Although the inference by the original archeologist that this woman was a mother of uh, two to three children cannot be confirmed through skeletal analysis, it is still tempting to identify the choice of iconography with a woman expressing her identity as a mother of three. That being said, the two assemblages discussed in this paper were remarkably similar in form, albeit different in quality of craftsmanship and therefore cost. Both women were found with gold earrings, specifically gold hemisphere earrings, bracelets with images of mythical goddesses associated with beauty, fertility, and grace, and gold finger rings. Even if the decoration of the pieces in the two assemblages discussed here varied, based perhaps on individual taste or age appropriateness, the forms and their inclusion in similar packages of adornment seem to suggest a jewelry ensemble that was related to the life course of these two women, uh, young, presumably married women, who were mothers or certainly about to become mothers. Thank you. Sorry, can you get back there. Yes, thank you. 
Thank you so much, Courtney. Wow, fascinating images too. This last example is just, yeah, incredible. Yeah, well, uh, yes, I'm sure there must be many questions for your presentation. It was really interesting. Uh, I will check the chat right away. Uh -huh. See if there's some. Yeah. All right. Uh, I would like to ask a question then because I'm chair, so I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just maybe it's a silly question, but I'm thinking, have you tried comparing to local iconography? I'm, of course, thinking of the wall paintings from Pompeii and Herculaneum, Brontis, um, depicting women wearing jewelry. Of course, we cannot say something exact about their because there are depictions, but I don't know if it's something you already looked into. It's something that I am looking into. Um, as you say, it is difficult because it's very hard to identify who's married, who might be a mother, uh, except in, in certain rare cases. And um, even ones where it has been suggested, I'm thinking of the Villa of the Mysteries, <laughs> where uh, mm. the scene, it, it's been suggested it's a mother and a child. It's suggested that it's a bridal scene. It's suggested yeah. it's a, any number of things. So it does make it difficult. What I have been trying to look at is images and the kind of collection or packages of adornment. So what's worn together mm. and um, still in the process, but I do think there, there is, um, there are differences that can be seen uh, women who seem to be of different ages or at least jewelry that seems to be seen together. And those bracelets in particular do seem to be found often with the hemisphere earrings rather than the mm. much fancier kind of pearl pendants or, or, or the like. That's really interesting, I think. Yeah, again, difficult, but really, really interesting that that maybe add a, an extra perspective to your research. Oh, thank you. Oh, now mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of stuff uh -oh. going on in the chat. <laughs> uh, just let's see who's first. That's Elsa Ivanes, and she writes, thanks for this interesting paper. Would it be possible to explain how you scored uh, the artifacts? What criteria did you use? Yes, um, that's, <laughs> I could go into detail uh, another paper on, on that. But basically what I did is I was looking at kind of a closed assemblage. So all jewelry from the Bay of Naples from uh, one day really in uh, AD 79. So it was quite easy to kind of, to try to then compare um, compare the material because as I said, it gets frustrating when in catalogs, it's just gold ring, gold earring, gold necklace. It's all expensive and luxury. And what's interesting is you can see um, if I can, oh, if I can figure out how to go back. <laughs> um, oh God, what did I do? Okay. Um, so I think you can see here, the some of the, the rings in particular are made like these bracelets where it's a light sheet of gold rolled over to make it look like a solid piece. And so the scores I, I came up with were based on the material used. So I used um, Pliny's natural history mainly to see his relationship between different materials, what would have been more costly than others. And then for the gold in particular, I used the weight of the pieces because there are certain, again, bracelets that look identical in images. And when you hold them, you know, all of a sudden one is kind of 500 grams and another's 50. So you can see that the one would have been much more costly than another. Uh, so I used, sorry, uh, material, size, weight, and then quality of craftsmanship, which I, I admit is a little bit more subjective. Um, but there are definitely clear, clear pieces that were much more intricate. And again, if I don't, don't break this, uh, again, if you look at, at these two rings, this ring is much heavier. There's much more uh, time and labor that went into the, even just the quick incising of the scales. There were little tiny little glass paste beads put in the eyes, uh, whereas this one just is kind of a flatter, really light gold wire that was, again, just had like a couple cursory scales incised. Um, and so it was basically a combination of, of those. I think that's probably the, the, the very, very short Cliff Notes version of that. Wow. All right. On behalf of Elsa, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I will go for the next question from Ariana Esposito, who asks, 
Can we distinguish cases of family and transgenerational transmission? That is something that I'm incredibly interested in, but uh, at the moment have not found a lot of detail for. Um, I think the closest of that would be some of the the boxes and bags that were being carried, because I do I do think in particular that earrings uh, there were different styles for at least different age groups, I think, who could afford it, because you don't see the kind of pair of uh, the, the pearl earrings with the much younger individuals. You do find, however, skeletons of eight, nine year olds with the gold hemisphere. So that seems to be a younger uh, age. And so in the box associated with uh, Aplantis 27, the box actually contained a gold circle, gold hemisphere, and also some pearls. So it might just be either one person's kind of life cycle, or it could be just family pieces that are are there for when it's ready for, for somebody. But um, there have been some interesting papers I've, I've heard and read uh, coming out, particularly of, uh, of Merida in Spain, where in later periods, uh, I think it was third, third or fourth century, don't quote me on that, um, but you do see more wear and uh, different repair techniques uh, for heirloom pieces. But unfortunately, that's not something I've been able to find as of yet. Thank you. And there's one more question <laughs> from Ana Maria Tisiderio. Um, let's see, have you been able to make a systematic comparison with coeval necro necropolis context? I'm sorry, I... Have you been able to make a, a systematic comparison with contemporary necropolis contexts? Um, I have not. It is, again, something that's on my list, uh, my to-do list. Um, I have looked briefly. The problem is a lot of the material that I was looking at, in particular in, uh, in Rome with some of the, the jewelry associated with the Morza Matora, something uh, where you really do find them. It's a later period, so I'm, I have to kind of adjust the, the scale for co comparison. So I haven't been able to do that as of yet, but looking more broadly in the types of kind of packages, uh, even there, again, this is all cursory, but um, it, there does seem to be uh, packages where it is two finger rings with most, most often um, intaglios and a necklace and a pair of earrings or a pair of bracelets and a pair of earrings. So there does seem to be some correspondence, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't stick my neck out too far just yet. Yeah, it's a huge topic, so yes. yeah, you're all set for the next 20 years. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, 40 maybe, yeah. <laughs> all right, let's see. Oh, there's a, yep, there's one more comment from Francesca Scotti, and it, it's just a comment on Pliny. I can see it's interesting to note that Pliny the Elder used to compare the value of purple to the one of pearls, and both the assets were the object of um, sumptuary laws, yeah. That's yeah. That's a that's an interesting comment. I agree. It is, and and it's it's amazing the kind of the just the the incredible wealth of, of pearls and and uh, even hearing all the kind of late Republican tales of the great women who sold their pearls so that their husbands could go into exile. So it is quite fascinating. Yeah. Oh, and we have a question from YouTube. Uh, the question is: Did the O seven woman? Sounds like 007 woman. Yeah. <laughs> also wear a necklace like the Oblontis woman. Or P7. P7. <laughs> that makes more sense. <laughs> um, no, she did not. Um, but she did have a bag in which there was a, um, a necklace. or There was a bag found nearby with a necklace that was possibly associated with her skeleton. But I don't want to. Yeah. It's it's I was trying to keep the context as specific as possible so that um, it was it, there were there were clear uh, parameters, but um, some of the other packages of this uh, packages of adornment um, that were found with skeletons that weren't visibly pregnant uh, did have either the two intaglios and earrings um, or sorry the two intaglios and a pair of earrings and either a pair of bracelets or a necklace. So it does seem that there was a little wiggle room um, in this package, but but that was a long way to say no. Yeah. No, she did not. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Thank you.
Let's see if there are any more questions. And what about Maka? Is there any more from YouTube? All right. Then I think we will thank you, Courtney, for this enlightening paper. Very thank you very much. Thank you. I think Francesca wanted to. Oh, say sorry. You have to admit yourself, Francesca. Yes, just speak, Francesca, please. You have to unmute your microphone. Okay. I am fascinated by the fact that you have found um, so many jewels inside those. Mm, let's say remain remains, and um, I I understand that those people were caught during the uh, explosion of the volcano, <laughs> but also um, I have studied that mm, from the text of the archaeologists that um, jewels were uh, buried with their own uh, owners, right? So, because I found a, a, um, an interesting link between a, another passage of the digest um, concerning the gift out of the inheritance mm, drawn up by a woman asking um, her um, husband and uh, sons to bury her uh, with some kind of jewels. Um, sorry, it's not a gift out of inheritance, it's a request. And at the same time, she had left all her, all her jewelry to a friend. So um, I don't know, I, I think Probably this is elementary for you, but to me, it's really fascinating to see how uh, the archaeologists can support uh, what we find in legal text, texts. Um, actually, about that, it is interesting because it tends to only be young and potentially unmarried women who are buried with their jewelry. And... Um, I, I make no pretense of knowing many of the, the legal texts, but um, there are ones where it's very clear where the woman is leaving it either to her children or to a friend and um, the kind of son or husband has to do it. And I, I don't know if this is the case that you're talking about where the woman asked specifically to be buried with, I think it was a, a necklace with pearls and, and something else. And the husband and the son both said, no, uh, we're not we're not doing that. And so she was actually the legal case was because she was buried without them. And then so who should get them? Should it be the son or, or the executor or the legatee? Uh, again, don't pretend to, to be uh, uh, a legal text uh, uh, knowledgeable person. But it was it was very interesting that she asked to be buried with it specifically. And the law said, nope, it's fine that you didn't bury her with it. It's just who gets it now. So I think yes. it tends to be the kind of young unmarried. But probably it was the, the same text that I was referring to with the addition of a legacy of all, uh, of all her jewelry. Um, and then probably she didn't realize that she had already left all her jewelry because afterwards she was asking her family to bury her with uh, margaritas, uh, I know, something, um, a bracelet, I think, and um, a necklace. And the husband and the sons uh, kept for themselves those jewels. And so the jury said, I'm sorry, but you have to give them to the legatee because otherwise, the, again, the mind of the testator wouldn't be um, fulfilled. This is always the, the problem, to fulfill the mind of the testator. All right. I have to uh, say thank you, and uh, because we have a program, I'm sorry, Courtney, but thank you. <laughs> so I would like to introduce our next speaker for this session. Uh, her name is Peter uh, Linscheid, and she is an archaeologist specialized in textiles of the Roman, late antique, and early medieval periods. She studied uh, Christian archaeology in Bonn and Byzantine studies in Berlin, where she did her PhD. And her PhD dissertation 
deals with the typology, technique, and function of early Byzantine textile head coverings based on the surviving textile finds. Uh, Petra Linscheid worked and published on several collections of early Byzantine textiles from Egypt in museums of Berlin, Mainz, and Karlsruhe. Her research includes furthermore the study of Middle Byzantine textile finds from the excavations at Amorium in Turkey. And in several years, Petra uh, is research associate at the Department of Christian Archaeology, University of Bonn. And in the framework of the project Context T, funded by Gielin Leyendecker Stiftung, she is researching on Roman and early medieval local textile finds in cooperation with the Landesmuseum Bonn and the Römisch Germanisches Zentralmuseum Mainz. All right. And uh, Petra will present a paper entitled The End of the Roman Tunic Changes of Clothing in the Early Byzantine Mediterranean. So thank you, Petra. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Cecile, for this. Kind introduction. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, and now I will put it. Yes, can you see my screen, full screen? It works perfect. perfect. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, oh, no. Uh, the two presentations before took us into the Roman world. And I will start there as well, but then I will move on in time into the 6th, 7th century AD, a period in which the Western Roman Empire had collapsed and the Romans continued in the East, uh, a period which we call Byzantine Empire or early Byzantine Empire. Um, first, I want to introduce uh, the development of the Roman tunic to demonstrate the long tradition of this garment. The tunic is an omnipresent garment for men and women alike. It is rectangular in shape and characterized by straight side edges. Men's tunics are knee length, women's tunics reach down to the ankles. And this is the only difference as far as we know. Front and back side of the tunic are decorated the same way, namely with clavi, which means narrow inwoven bands. Tunics are either dated by the archaeological context or else by radiocarbon dating. What you see here on the slide are um, tunics from the first to third century AD, where we have uh, evidence from Eastern and Western Roman provinces. And um, this evidence shows that um, the early tunics are constructed from two rectangular woven to shape sheets of cloth, sewn together along the shoulder line and then up the sides. There are no sleeves. The clavi are monochrome and undecorated, they are running down the full length of the garment. There are stratified tunic finds from sites in the Egyptian Eastern Desert, like uh, the Roman Fort of uh, Maximianon or the quarry of Mons Claudianus, both sites dating to the first, second century AD. Mummy portraits from Roman Egypt uh, dating to the first and third century as well, show the same kind of tunic with the shoulder seam visible. I don't know, can you see, can you see my cursor? Yeah, here you see the shoulder seam. Um, at contemporaneous sites in Israel, like the Cave of Letters or Masada, or in uh, Kilbet Kazon in Jordan, we see the same type of tunic. From the Western provinces, the textile preservation is not that well, but fragments from Roman mines, this time in twill weave, with simple bands might have belonged to this type of tunic as well. The tunics are woven without sleeves, but a great width 
would create a sleeve-like appearance when the tunic is worn. In the third century, tunics with sleeves appear. Among the earliest are the finds from Dura Europos in Syria, with a terminus antequem of 256-257, which is the date of the destruction of this site. The tunics are woven to shape in one piece on the loom. Look at the diagram here at the right. Um, um, turning the tunic 90 degree and weaving from and starting the weaving with one sleeve and then continuing um, over the whole body of the tunic, front and back woven in one piece, and then finishing with the other sleeve um, and finishing with the sleeve end. This tunic weaving marks a sharp difference to the, earlier, to the earlier Roman tunic construction. It was especially Hero Granger Taylor and Christopher Hecken Lammens in the 1980s and 90s who were bringing this difference to our attention. From the fourth century onwards, the decoration of clavi by tapestry weaving starts as well as the addition of further decorative panels on the shoulder or in the bottom or in the lower bottom of the tunic. The first decoration consists of monochrome, floral or ge geometric pattern in tapestry with flying needle. We have dated examples from Palmyra in Syria, which is a little bit earlier, namely second century. Um, and then we have dated examples from El Bagavat and Havara, both in Egypt. In the West, we have similar tunic finds from fourth century Trier and Xanten in Germany or from Conte in Switzerland. In the fifth century, the trend towards a lavish decoration of the tunic intensifies. The decoration of clavi and shoulder and bottom panels becomes more and more colorful and includes figurative depictions. From the sixth century onwards, new types of tunics appear in the early Byzantine Mediterranean. They differ from the Roman garment in shape, construction. They differ from the Roman and late antique tunic in shape, construction, and decoration. You see the late antique tunic here at the top and the new types of garments in the lower row. The new garments were not woven to shape anymore, but they were sewn together for, from several cut to shape pieces. The sleeves are not woven uh, together with the body, but they were attached by sewing. The Roman and late antique tunic had straight side edges. The new garments instead are flaring towards the bottom. The flaring shape was achieved by cutting material from the side, as you see here on the right, or by adding triangular gussets at the lower side seams. The clavi, which were characteristic decoration of the tunic and appeared on front and back, likewise disappear. Instead, in the new garments, the shoulder and front was decorated. This way, the front of the garment was emphasized. A special group of these new garments was decorated by a shoulder band and a central, and a central single vertical band. Um, as far as we know, this trimming consists of a band in tablet weaving, which was laid double. At least some of these garments had a vertical slit in front underneath the vertical band, although this is not yet traced systematically. The ground weave uh, of the garment is always a line and tabby ground weave. 
The term tunic does not seem appropriate for this garment anymore. Um, so I will call them shirt from now on. What makes these shirts special is that they appear relatively rarely in the archaeological record of the, uh, um, they appear rarely in the archaeological record, although we have uh, 10 thousands of garments uh, from the vast cemeteries in Egypt. All in all, 15 examples are known so far. Most of these shirts came to light at Antinopolis in Middle Egypt, excavated at the end of the 19th and beginning of 20th century, housed today in museum collections of uh, the Louvre Paris, uh, the Musée Historique de Tissu in Lyon, or in Berlin in the Museum für Byzantinische Kunst. On the slide, you see here the two examples in uh, Berlin, which were heavily restored and um, complemented with modern fabric. Um, as usual, uh, the ground weave, which is preserved here at the edges, consists of a linen ground, uh, of a linen tabby weave. Two gussets at the lower side seams, here and here, uh, provide a flaring shape. The sleeves, which are lost here, but here on this archive photo, they are still present, uh, are attached by sewing. By radiocarbon dating of associated finds, the two shirts can be dated to the period mid fifth to mid seventh century AD. For a long time, these shirts were considered to appear only at Antinopolis. But recently, they were found at other sites in Egypt as well. During the excavations of Vladimir Godlevsky of, from the Polish Center of Mediterranean Archaeology and the University of Warsaw, at the cemetery of Naklun in the Fayum, a corresponding shirt was found. The tomb dates to the 5th to 7th century. The shirt was investigated by Barbara Saya on site. It consists of a linen fabric and tabby weave. The tunic is 80 centimeter, uh, the shirt is 80 centimeter in length, but it is destroyed in the lower part. The central front, the shoulders, and the neck were decorated by a ribbon and tablet weave applied to the fabric by sewing. The ribbon was 2.5 centimeter in width and it consists of a continuous uh, tablet weave of about two meter in length. Um, this um, band was bended by tucks to surround the neck opening you can see it here, then it is bended again. It runs double on the shoulder around the neck. Here again, double, and then it comes back here um, to the front. The same ribbon used single is decorating the sleeve ends. You can see here on the right foot. The sleeves are attached by sewing. The lower part of the shirt is destroyed, but we would suggest, uh, but we would expect side gores um, at this point, which I reconstructed here. The tablet weaving border, which is bending 180 degrees, is a characteristic feature of that shirt and leads to the identification of further examples of this garment. You see here in the middle two fragments from the Fayum in Egypt. Uh, from the collection um, of, uh, uh, of the Berlin Museum für Byzantinische Kunst, um, consisting of such a um, tablet weaving bended 180 degree, uh, soon onto a line and ground, and probably once belonging to a similar shirt. Important is a similar find from Halabie in Syria, which you see here on the right, which is dated by the archaeological context to 610 AD. Um, 
And this find is important because it points to the spread of this type of garment to, to Syria as well. The tablet woven trimming is loose today, but it is folded in the characteristic way. Most likely it belonged to an analog shirt. Cut to shape shirts with side gussets are well attested from Halabie, uh, but uh, this example is in a destroyed condition. The important textile finds from Halabie, which are dated so precisely um, to um, terminus until 610 AD, are in the holdings of in the National Museum of Damascus, um, and they are known by a publication of Rudolf Pfister only. The, find in, the finds um, of this shirt in, e in other regions of Egypt and as well in Syria provide evidence that the shirt with a, a tablet woven central trimming was used um, not only regionally. As you all know, in Egypt and in the Levantine region, the climate favors the preservation of textiles. For the regions further to the north, we have little or no organic preservation. Therefore, we have to look at representations. And in representations, we can trace the shirt with a characteristic tablet woven trimming uh, as well in part of the Mediterranean. Here on the left, you see two uh, very famous mosaics uh, from Ravenna dating to the middle of the sixth century, presenting the Emperor Justinian and his wife Theodora, accompanied by court officials. And we notice that the left outermost uh, person, who is obviously a court official, uh, is wearing such a garment with a um, shoulder trimming as well. In Greece, in Thessaloniki, um, San Dimitrios is depicted with two children, and they are all three, they are wearing a garment decorated by a double border on the shoulder. In all cases, we see trimmings horizontally on the shoulder and vertically on the breast. What leads us to suppose that these trimmings are tablet weavings? It is the division in the horizontal axis of the shoulder trimming, which is typical for a tablet, uh, for a tablet, bending, uh, for a tablet trimming, which is bended 180 degree. And we can see this folding here in the uh, Thessaloniki mosaic. You see again, again a close up from the um, Naklun shirt. You can see that there is a seam running here in the middle axis, joining the two, uh, joining the length of the uh, tablet weaving, uh, of the tablet woven band, which is folded here, um, 90 degree, 90 degree, uh, and so, um, yeah, forms a, a, a double band, and um, a typical feature of these tablet woven bands is the asymmetrical decoration of the tablet woven band. The long sides are patterned differently. I try to make this clear here. The long sides uh, are patterned um, differently with a purpose uh, to fold the tablet weaving 180 degree and then to complete a symmetrical pattern. To sum up, finds and representations of these garments in the arts suggest that this dress was known all over the early Byzantine Mediterranean. Um, in the archaeological record, as well as in representations, this new costume appears side by side with a traditional tunic. This is evidenced by the finds uh, from Halabie. You see here the three pictures on the right, uh, which are all contemporaneous. And you see here on the left, the typical traditional woven two shape 
um, tunic and you see here a shirt with side gussets and the broken tablet woven bands. So uh, this find makes clear that obviously in 610 AD Halabie, both type of both types of garments were used. If you if we look at the mosaics in Ravenna, we can also see that the persons wearing the um, uh, tablet woven uh, shirt, uh, uh, sorry, the tablet woven decorated shirt is depicted aside a person who is wearing the um, traditional um, tunic, which is characterized by a panel on the shoulder and by a, a panel on knee level. This side of uh, this this side by side of the tunic and the shirt demonstrates that the new costume served as a strong identification marker for its wearer. But who were the people wearing this new costume? Costume, sorry. At this point, it should be mentioned that the shirt is woven, uh, sorry, is worn sometimes, but not always, together with other items of costume which are not typical Roman, as for example, these um, mantles or um, trousers, which are also not of a uh, Roman costume uh, tradition. But it has to be emphasized that the shirt can also be worn with a traditional uh, Roman uh, mantle. So who were these people? Research on this group of garments started in the 1940s with uh, Rudolf Pfister, followed by Agnes Geyer in the 1960s, Marielle Martignani Rebert and Annemarie Stauffer in 2000, Cecilia Fluck and Julian Vogelsang Eastwood in 2004. Various answers have been proposed in research so far, mostly based on the idea of a Persian, Parthian, or Sasanian model of these shirts. As example, you see here a depiction of a Parthian costume from the synagogue at uh, Dura Europos. The shirt was, was known for a long time from Antinopolis only, which led to the idea that this garment was restricted to Antinopolis and that a group of foreigners, perhaps uh, Sasanians, had been buried there. But tracing this shirt on several fine spots and in depictions all over the Mediterranean sheds, sheds some new light on the possible meaning and origin of that garment. Interesting in this regard is an investigation by Philipp von Rummel in 2007. Excuse me, I'm sorry, you are 21 minutes. Just, oh, so, yes. okay. <laughs> yes. okay. Sorry. Okay, Thank this you. is, uh, anyway, this is my last um, remark. Um, uh, one um, research by Philipp von Rummel on Habitus Barbarus, uh, who pointed uh, to another possible source of this shirt, um, namely um, new military, uh, new mili military elite, which arrived to Byzantium during the migration period from the East meaning uh, Huns or Vandals or Goth, and which gained important position in the Roman, uh, in the Roman respectively um, Byzantine army, which, which would uh, explain uh, their appearance uh, at, the, um, at the court. So we have two possible sources for this costume, the Oriental Persian origin or the Northern tribes. This question still has to be solved, but it deserves further study. But it became evident that the shirt, which uh, that the sh that this shirt, with its conscious distinction from the Roman tunic, was used as a strong social marker um, to a special early Byzantine elite group. So the title of my paper is The End of the Roman Tunic. Um, and this is, as you may guess, 
because in the following century, centuries, it is the shirt that became the most popular garment in the medieval Mediterranean, um, influenced furthermore by Arabic garment traditions. So thank you very much for your attention. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Petra, for this enlightening uh, presentation about the development from tunic to shirt. That was very interesting. I enjoyed it very much. So I can see, well, there's already a comment in the chat, and that's from uh, Nahum Ben Yehuda, who finds uh -huh. this uh, presentation very fascinating. I agree. Thank you. Are there any further questions or comments from speakers or from our audience in YouTube? No? Maybe it's because they know that the next thing is a coffee break. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, there's one here from Francesca Scotti. Were the clavi attached or woven in? The, the clavi were woven in. Yeah. So in the, in the original, um, I should have uh, mentioned that in the Roman tunic, uh, the clavi were woven in. Um, later on, at the stage when um, the clavi decoration gets very colorful and fancy, they were produced separately and then soon onto the garment. But um, let's say for the first five centuries, they were woven in. Thank you. And uh, Magda, do you have any? Yeah, there's a question on YouTube, actually. Um, so Annika would like to know if uh, we do see this shirt on women in iconography, or perhaps uh, it's somehow associated to women uh, in archaeological finds. This is a good point. Um, in fact, uh, the archaeolo in, uh, in the archaeological finds, we only find them in male graves. Also, uh, in the iconography, we see them with men. Um, even I would tend to think that this is a typical male garment. This is a good point. This would need further study, but uh, at the moment it looks as if this is a, a male garment. Okay, uh, uh, I, there's a last one, if we have just two minutes, uh, from uh, Jenny uh, Sharama, and uh, she asked, is this change somehow related to differences in waving technology? E yes. Um, yes. Um, the, the step is, is uh, from uh, weaving to shape, to cutting to shape and tailoring, which means um, uh, if you weave, uh, weaving to shape was the Roman and um, Roman and late antique way of producing garments, not only for tunics but also for, uh, for 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 the penula, for example, or for um, oh, what else we have? Yeah. Um, but then, um, I don't know when it started, let's say sixth century, um, the tendency is for uh, producing length of fabric and then you cut the fabric and you join the pieces uh, to have a, have a tailored garment. Of course, this happened earlier when you reuse textiles, then they were also cut and sewn together, but... Um, um, let's say from sixth century almost, this was the principle. You, you, you produce length of cloth, you cut them and you sew them together. All right, thank you. That was thank very you. interesting, but I think I will finish our session here. Um, and then we will have to continue afterwards because we are already running late. Uh, which is totally worth it because this was very interesting. But I suggest that now we have a 10 minute uh, coffee break. 
and we meet again. Yeah, well, in 10 minutes, and now it's well, 15.41. So yeah, um, about, yeah, in 10 minutes, we uh, meet again and continue our program. And of course, we will leave Zoom open. So maybe if some of the authors have questions for each other, you're of course welcome to stay here online if there is something you need to discuss. But uh, yes, so now it's coffee break and I will say, the last session of today will be chaired by uh, Magda and uh, Paula as well, who will uh, manage YouTube and this final session. So, but again, thank you to all the speakers. You have done amazing. It's been really, really interesting. I enjoyed every, each and every paper. And now we should get some coffee. <laughs> See you soon. No. Ah, oh, signore, ma dov'è? A moment. I'm not familiar with all these things. Let's see. Okay. Um, let me see. Now I have made a terrible... Vabbè. Uh, here. Now, let's see if I succeed in uh, sharing it with you. Okay. 
Okay, I'm arriving. Okay. <sighs> why? It doesn't work. I can't understand why. Yeah, uh, I, I think you, you cannot share the screen if, uh, if the host of the meeting allows you. Uh, doesn't uh, allow you. I think you cannot um, just open. I see. Uh, you can share the screen. Yeah. Everyone can, yeah. So, oh. because okay. I'm trying, can you see? No, no, so you want to try. So, you need to click on the on the bottom of the zoom. You have a little green arrow. Yes, up. yes. When but you click on it, several windows appear. You need to choose, the yes, window. yes, but they. They are not there. Let me see. Um, I just need to tell that in five minutes to resume. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I know. There's yes, no there you go. Time. It opens. We can see yes. it. We can see it. And now, can you see it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, Ulpiano, dove? Ecco. Here. Um, I found very difficult to understand this sentence that comes from paragraph one. I can read it in uh, the English translation. Uh, under the term clothing are included all goods made of wool, flax, silk, or cotton, which are intended to be worn uh, or used as garments, girdles, cloaks, uh, wraps, uh, carpets, or coverlets, and any designs. And this is the part. And any designs, stripes, uh, that in Latin are... Uh, picture clavicue, designs, ah. stripes, or embroidery, um, sued to such articles are classed as accessories of the same. Because in Latin, um, the sentence is que sunt insite picture clavicue qui vestibus insuntur. It means that according to Ulpian's opinion, uh, these ornaments weren't woven, but they were just sewed. And so this would explain the reason why he's considering them as accessories um, that in legal terms mean that these parts, these um, uh, adornments are not uh, part of the principal thing, but are something that is attached to it, and it helps it to better function or to be nicer. And that's why I were asking you uh, this question, because mm -hmm. I went through uh, the text of your other texts of your colleagues, and some of them uh, wrote, as you told me, that these uh, adornments were wo uh, woven. Others, uh, on the contrary, would read, would uh, write, sorry, that they were uh, sued. So, uh, to me. Mm, it's a kind of a problem because mm -hmm. uh, the uh, point of view of Alpian uh, uh, should be, um, how can I say, uh, made uh, false by the uh, findings, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the archaeological okay. uh, yeah. findings. Yeah, I, I, I see the I see the problem. I see the problem. Um, first of all, I think you, you shouldn't. Um, we should be careful to take these terms uh, used in the literary sources too uh, literally. So uh, um, often things are, for example, talking about embroidery. Embroidery is extremely rare. I I would think uh, he he means tapestry. Which is much more frequent. So, um, and I, I would not exclu exclude that um, uh, 
I, sorry, I have to say a man. When a man talks about textiles, he is not very precise. So he looks at uh, some pictures uh, in the garment and he says, ah, they are attached. I, I, I would think hmm. he's just um, talking like this. I, I wouldn't take this as a, a, a textile technical, uh, technical precise, technically precise description. This is what, what I would think. So you have never seen in your own experience uh, clavi uh, that were sued? Never. Doch, doch, doch. There, there are. There are clavi which are sued when they are reused. And ah. uh, uh, yeah, and there has been a lot of uh, uh, recycling and reusing, reusing the decorative parts of textiles happens very often. Also in the in in the uh, in the first to third century, I this see. is a very common thing. And then you cut them out, and you reuse them. And but normally they were woven. Norm yeah, yeah. Normally they are in woven. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. yeah thank you. <laughs> we will have time, like, for discussion at the end. If you are like, sorry, not, sorry. You know, Okay, it's very interesting. I it's monopolized just, you, I know, no, but no, no. this is a uh, great But it's chance. just that we have to keep the program, and I know that also our next speaker uh, has also, like, you know, other duties. She she, she must uh, leave soon, so I will, like, not uh, prolong this. But, I mean, at the end of this uh, last session, uh, you are very welcome to, to go on with the discussion. I, I will be also very, very interested to, to hear more about that. Uh, so uh, our next speaker today is Elsa Ivanes. She's an archaeologist specialized in textile production of ancient Sudan and Nubia. Uh, she also um, uh, re makes her research in the Chan Operatoire, economic significance of spinning and waving, as well as the use of textiles for clothing and burial. Um, after her uh, text more memory project, um, uh, that uh, was a uh, host at the Center for, Te for Textile Research in Copenhagen. She just very recently uh, achieved a second very interesting uh, research uh, dedicated to methodolo methodological approaches to funerary textiles in ancient Sudan, which has hosted at the University of Warsaw in my institute. And very recently, Elsa was also awarded a near uh, starting grant for uh, her text research uh, about textiles in the Sudan. And I think we, she will tell us more by herself. Elsa, uh, sorry for this uh, late introduction, the floor is yours. Elsa, are you okay. with us? Uh, okay, Elsa, uh, as a person, Elsa is coming. So just give her, give her a second and she will be ready. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> Good. So I just introduced you, Elsa, and you are like, uh, you can start. <laughs> so this is start. I, will... I am very sorry. I thought it was starting um, at four for some reason. I apologize. So I will uh, share my screen right now. Can you see it in slideshow? Yes. yes, we do. Okay. <laughs> Apologies for the mishap. All right. Uh, so thank you very much uh, to the organizers uh, for inviting me to this session on uh, age and gender and clothing and identities uh, in the past. Uh, today, I will take you to uh, ancient Sudan, to the kingdom of Meroe, which uh, is a little bit late antiquity, so a little bit the same period as uh, Petra um, showed you material for uh, right before. And I should tell you before uh, I uh, start that this presentation will contain images of children, human remains, so please be advised. So uh, just to set the context a little bit, uh, we are in the Meritic Kingdom, which is dated roughly to um, 350 BCE to 350 CE. Uh, we are in modern Sudan and Nubia. Um, and I will show you a material that belongs to the Kushite culture, here exemplified by their capital at Meroe with this pyramid field. 
the material that I will show you today comes from Cassie Brim, which if you see my cursor is right here in the north, which corresponds to the modern, um, to modern Egypt. So it was at the very northern tip uh, of uh, the Meritic Empire. I will also talk to you about other sites in Nubia, namely Karanog, Kustul, Sai Island, and Sedinga. So just to give you a little bit of a flavor of uh, the Meritic Kushite culture, um, what we know of it from archeology span is quite a, let's say mineral, um, monumental world uh, with temples, uh, palaces built by the royal family, but also by the, the authorities that were um, controlling this vast territory for the royal family. And these people were buried into um, chambers, grave chambers, dug underneath mud brick, uh, smaller pyramids. And this is this type of uh, material mainly that I will be using for this presentation. But uh, my starting point is actually not coming from a funerary context, but from the urban settlement of Cassibrim that I mentioned a little bit earlier. It is Um, formed by uh, loincloth, which you have here um, on the right of the picture, and an apron, uh, which is uh, fragmentary. And these two pieces are sewn and assembled by a knot and a rather crude sewing right here at the corner. Uh, today, they are stored in the British Museum, and I apologize for the rather um, bad picture, uh, because the piece is actually sandwiched between two uh, tools and soon on uh, by a conservator. So we see the face of the apron and actually what I believe is the reverse of the loincloth, but that's the situation um, of the material now. Um, so um, yeah. Um, I will just show you a little bit. So here, if you see my cursor, would be uh, the waist uh, line of the lawn clubs so will be noted uh, on the navel. And this pointy part here will be brought between the legs and secured at the knot, a little bit like a diaper, if you will. So what we see here is in fact the area that would have been on um, the seat of the person. And these two flowers here would have decorated, let's say the hips uh, of uh, this person, just to show you a little bit how it could have been worn. Uh, here you have examples from a relief in Philae and a reconstruction drawing. So you have a uh, long cloth that would have been uh, probably quite voluminous on the hips. And then at the top, uh, this sort of like decorative embroidered apron. It is, as uh, this um, representation show, a very, um, it's completely associated to males. And I will uh, let you pondering the rather evocative shape of the apron um, that make it uh, indeed a very, very male attribute. Let's put it that way. So um, to actually look at uh, the loincloth in more specifically, it is assembled by two pieces of fabric uh, that are sewn down uh, the middle here vertically. And it is sewn in shape with rolled hems uh, maintained by overcast stitches. The two panels of fabric in that case are made of the same textile, which is a cotton tabby. The threads are uh, S-twisted. It's a very common type of textile production for the Meritic uh, time. And in that case, it had 11 threads per centimeters in both systems. Um, this particular piece uh, shows quite a lot of traces of repairs. Uh, stitches, um, for example, here um, down in the point, but also darning and sewing in this corner. It is decorated with very typical embroideries uh, made with blue threads, uh, which are plied thread in Z direction. Um, you see lines made of stemmed stitches. Here are the lines in vertical. Here also the stems of the flowers, which um, is formed by a spiral of chain stitches surrounded by sort of like radial uh, stitches, something that is called um, what we have sort of like dubbed uh, sunburst flowers. And these flowers are very typical of this specific type of uh, garment, both the loincloth and the apron. Uh, they also appear here, as you can see on the apron. 
So in that case, um, you have here only the, the right panel as seen from the, the viewer uh, that is preserved. It was originally assembled uh, vertically by um, a vertical seam here. So you would have like another piece similar, uh, like um, assembled in a sort of like symmetric way. Uh, it is also seen in shape uh, with rolled M, uh, hems maintained by overcast stitches. The only difference that we have from the loincloth here, um, as far as textile production goes, is that the base layer, so the natural color um, textile, is actually made of uh, a balanced tabby of two two uh, tabby. So you have two threads uh, per system. Uh, in that case, seven pairs um, and 11 pairs. Uh, of course, uh, because uh, we don't have starting borders or anything, we do not know the um, weaving direction here. Uh, but yeah, so um, a basket weave in that case. And it is decorated with embroidery. So we find again the same uh, sunburst flowers, but also uh, by something that is a little bit more rare, uh, which is a piece of applique. And uh, the applique fabric is made of cotton still, still as twist, twisted, but this time um, with blue threads made of uh, entirely blue threads. Um, and it is uh, one one. Um, simple tabby. And also in the top here of um, the apron, we have a different uh, pattern of a sort of like a rosette uh, pattern. So if we reconstruct uh, this apron and look at dimensions, um, we can see that the waistband of the loincloth is uh, approximately 58 uh, centimeters and um, the, width, the length, sorry, is 39 centimeters which if we compare with um, let's say modern um, size tables uh, for clothing, we realize corresponds to um, what I estimate to be a six to eight year old child uh, will be 115 to 130 centimeters high, um, which means that uh, the apron reconstructed would have covered both uh, legs quite generously. And um, if we estimate that it is maybe like preserved maybe in half lengthwise, but probably the apron was reaching at least to the knees. So that's the um, sort of like status quo, I would say for this um, ensemble, that it would have been worn during life by a six to eight year old boy. So of course, as an archeologist, as I was quite um, very curious um, by this uh, garment. So I was asking, who was the child was wearing this item of clothing and I started digging around on what I could find about um, children in the Meritic Kingdom. And I quickly realized that the child as such is actually a missing part of Sudanese archaeology. It is very rarely represented or clearly identifiable in iconography. We can see here the case of the prince uh, Araka Karatator uh, on Kare at Naga in the first uh, century, um, who is represented behind his parents, the queen and the king, uh, with the exact same size and a very codified uh, costume as well. So he doesn't, he's not represented as a child per se. We of course know uh, of quite a lot of uh, children in a funerary assemblage, but to date there has not been really dedicated study to the funerary gesture and burials um, specific to children. And as far as the material culture is concerned, uh, we can uh, isolate um, very, very few objects that were specifically dedicated to children. We have very few examples of toys uh, whether it be because they were never recognized um, in the corpus or just because they were not there as a specific item. Um, one exception is maybe this type here of feeding cups uh, that appear in Nubia as well as in Central Sudan. Um, but it has not been really like studied as a specifically children artifact. So I turned uh, instead towards the theoretical um, let's say, tenants of the archaeology of childhood that has started to appear since uh, the first uh, article published in 1989 by Gretel Hammer, The Child is Born, A Child's Word in Archaeological Perspective. Um, and um, that kind of like opened very interesting doors um, in this research. So first, um, it's sort of like states that we need to define the idea of a child as a specific biological age category, as well as a cultural construct. 
uh, and after that, we need to look for direct evidences of children, either the funerary remains or the material culture that was directly associated to them. And we need to understand the lives of children and the nature of childhood as a part of a sort of like a child's world that is ever evolving um, in ever like dependency or um, independence from the adult world, but uh, in both ways. Um, children always have their own agency in sort of like modulating their own uh, social economic surroundings. And so in a way, studying children uh, equivates to uh, studying um, individuals that are learning to be adults. Um, what we can see through the material, um, the archaeological material, is the different processes of socialization that sort of like brought them uh, to receive and to assimilate the cultural tradition of the adult world. So in many ways, we can frame the archaeological, um, the archaeology of childhood as a sort of pendant to the adult's world. And that was very telling for me in the case of this specific garment. So I started to hunt, I would say, traces of childhood in the meritic uh, archaeological world. And first, I could see that they were very much present in the funerary assemblage, already with a fully developed material um, assemblage, uh, funerary material, that was not different uh, in many ways from the one present in adult grave. In uh, the case of this grave here from Meroe, you see a six to eight year old child, a boy presumably, uh, surrounded with a lot of libation and food offering material, uh, and offering stand here in the corner uh, with a lot of different bowls, with food offerings, a lot of textiles actually also, personal ornaments, toiletries, equipment, and things like that. So a, a fully developed um, funerary vocabulary uh, that is not specifically um, associated to children. The only one thing in this grave that could have uh, associated this child to a child's world was a little figurine of a mouse, presumably a toy, but um, we don't know much from this uh, piece and I cannot find a picture of it, unfortunately. Uh, we also see uh, several necropolis that see that show a clear overrepresentation of children in the anthropological record. You so you see here um, extract from the anthropological report of uh, a mission from uh, the site of Sedinga, uh, showing thirty percent of um, skeletal material belonging to immature grave. And as this picture show. Um, shows you can see that this um, child here was buried with quite a lot of jewelry uh, and in that case uh, probably wrapped in a shroud and then placed in a coffin. Uh, so again quite a lot of potential to study in the future uh, funerary gestures applied to children. When we start uh, looking, on the other hand, to um, written sources, I would say, we can see that children are quite clearly integrated in the meritic noble families, and they seem to be acting as guarantor of family ties and status. Usually, we picture the meritic family as very strongly based on clan identity with uh, hereditary sorry, aristocracies, and we see that social identities are often enforced through the expression of titles, administrative, military, or religious, not as much uh, through names, uh, interestingly. They would quote titles before they would quote name, uh, if, for example, they're running out of space. And also family ties. So um, we tend to uh, now understand words such as, I'm a relation to, I'm the sister of, the mother of, the father of, the wife of. Um, as uh, this example here on the right show of an um, uh, offering table from the lady Neberisi. And you can see here uh, in this example that she says she is the mother of title plus name. The child is already associated to a specific title. I didn't put it because we, didn't, we cannot translate it, so it was not very interesting in, in my demonstration, but just to see that really uh, the status of a child here in funerary inscription is very much associated already by um, an administrative function. And this type of like parentage section in mortuary inscriptions, um, so a very much like tend to emphasize the patrilinear relation as well as the matrilinear descendants through uh, the maternal uncle. So what does iconography can add to this? 
Uh, I put here a certain um, different examples from the site of Karanog, where you see um, children, or at least individuals who have been identified as children, and in all cases, they are represented naked. You have here at the top a um, scene that is engraved on a bronze bowl that is showing uh, the daughter of um, this couple here receiving uh, food products. She is shown um, naked and clearly um, like on a smaller scale as the adults. Uh, but she's already uh, nubile. She's already she's not a very young uh, children. As you can see, the breast is clearly um, drawn. So not a small child. Um, uh, already. The two funerary stella here at the bottom right of the slide show um, a daughter and a son of these type of noble families, and they are both uh, represented naked as well. However, uh, we know that a lot of people must have been naked on a daily basis in the Meritic Kingdom. Uh, we can think of other sort of like um, social statues, other clans, other uh, tribal groups uh, evolving in this environment. And you have here a picture of a cow herd, um, so um, a boy looking after uh, the herd during the day. Uh, and it's it's um, this specific individual is associated to a child because he is shown naked, but actually nothing is telling us that he's specifically a child. Um, so the question of nudity in representation of children is actually very interesting in this case and quite um, ambiguous in many ways. So to sum up, uh, we have a very blurry picture of childhood with a rare appearance uh, of the child in your archaeological record uh, beside the feeding bottles and um, the skeletal material. We don't really have a clear iconographic representation of babies or young children either, as we know, for example, from Pharaonic Egypt. But uh, children, even the dead ones, clearly show already uh, that they are fully socialized in an adult-oriented world. And the children already have the attributes of their noble family, uh, especially the titles, and that seems to be regardless of age. So in that case, what can we learn through dress practices? I will uh, show you now several examples, the few that I managed to find uh, of other children garments. Here you have an example of a leather loincloth that was found in situ on a naturally mummified body of a child in Sai Island. Uh, it was triangular in shape with attaching strips and noting at the noted sorry, at the navel. Uh, the lever was very thin and cut uh, very sharp without any sewing. It was also decorated on the outer surface with a sort of like um, polka dots uh, pattern. And uh, looking at the size again of the waist, we see that it measured 35, 45 sorry, centimeters, which seems to be congruent with a one and a half to two years old child. Uh, same estimation given by uh, the anthropologist on the site. Other examples of uh, children garment are these two uh, tunics. So the one on the left is a short tunic um, discovered um, in Kustul in a rather uh, later period in the fourth to sixth century CE. It is made of a very dark wool uh, in balanced simple tabby with two uh, clavi as well as extra uh, weft twining decorating um, the front and back in red, yellow and red and green green bands. Uh, the size on the body uh, would have been 49 centimeters wide and 42 centimeters long. So from, you have to picture, of course, when it was uh, folded here um, around uh, the neck opening. And on the right, uh, you have another uh, short uh, tunic, this time found in Cassie Brim, uh, like um, our uh, long cloth and apron. It was also made in tabby and is also decorated with blue threads. In this case, a row of blue uh, bubble tassels at the bottom. The neck opening um, is not woven in, but it was uh, cut and then rolled and hemmed um, along around um, the opening here. And interestingly, it has a quite similar size as uh, its neighbor here from Kustul. It was also 49 centimeters wide and it was 33 centimeters long. And the excavator in that case, so the people studying this textile, um, John Peter and Phil T. Wild, um, associate this uh, short tunic to also a two-year-old uh, child. Uh, 
um, children as well as adults actually uh, wearing tunics also show um, show up in our iconographic record much more rarely I have to say but uh, I think this stella here is very interesting uh, it comes from the site of Jebelada also in lower Nubia it shows the tomb owner and his son or maybe nephew and they are both dressed in the exact same way with a long um, tunic with long sleeves decorated with clavi um, in this case, it's quite interesting because you have a rather traditional monument and attitude, but uh, both characters are wearing a garment that is coming from the Hellenistic world. Um, to sort of like bring water to our uh, meal here, it's a clear parallel between the adult male um, and uh, the child male, and that is definitely strongly reinforced by the use of the same clothing. And this sort of like mirrored dress practices is also visible in our case um, with our um, um, loincloth and apron. So I'm showing you again here this document, this relief from um, Philae, the procession of the meritic dignitaries. And I would like to attract your attention to this uh, couple here. So we have an adult, uh, A, here on the slide, who is named Bekemete, is viceroy and general of the lands, which is basically the second in command uh, in Lower Nubia. Very, very high military and civil functions. And is followed by the figure B here, Sana Kebalili, uh, who, is who is said to be the Meseketo, which we think we can translate as is his little one. So he's clearly designated as Bekemete's successor. In our case, it's very interesting because we are really wearing the same type of loin cloth. So not uh, like the neighbor, the sort of like long wrapped around uh, skirt, but really this loin cloth that is brought back and noted um, at the navel, then covered by um, this type of apron. In this case, I would like then uh, to propose that this type of garment here exemplified for um, ch children's size can be understood as a uniform as it is defined by uh, Philippe Bruno in his um, sort of like theoretical uh, article, um, Le Vêtement. Um, I think it is a uniform because it dresses both the person, the persona, not uh, just the individual subject. So it has very strong social implications. And it is also uh, very replicable. The garment seems to be uniform throughout its multiple repetition. I will show you some examples of that later. It sort of make manifest on the person a very general social and cultural theory that presumably was recognizable throughout uh, the entire kingdom. As you will see, it didn't really change through time and space. Uh, the form of the garment is quite fixed and adapts itself to spatial dispersion and temporal succession of its different uh, wearers. So I will try uh, also, yes, I should also say that it adopts a very, very similar style in both technique and aesthetic. So it's quite easily associating, associated to a very specific ethnical political milieu. Here you have examples of this, of uh, different iteration of this type of garment here, a very well-preserved apron from Jebalada. Here, um, the same type of flowers that was used on a loincloth in Karanog. And uh, we have also iconographic representation as far so south as Meroe. So even if we don't have preserved apron from this region because of more um, wet or humid condition, we have the same type of apron showing up in the iconography, making it very clear uh, that this style with this um, blue uh, decoration, cotton uh, fabric with embroideries, this type of construction was uh, used throughout the kingdom from the first to the late um, fourth century CE. Um, so in this case, the male garment loincloth plus apron obeys, I think, to this um, definition of a uniform because regardless of age, it really identifies the status of its owner as part of the noble class enrolled in the military and the civil administration. So here you have a type of garment that seems to me at least uh, to mediate between adults and children. And it makes very visible 
uh, for everyone to see really on the body uh, of these people, the transmission process between generations of both function and status that were presumably understandable by the entire population. I would like to thank you for your attention. I'm very sorry to have been late again. That was a confusion on my part. And uh, I would like to say that in many ways, uh, this um, presentation was preliminary thoughts that I hope to develop in a future project that will be starting soon at the Center for Textile Research here in the University of Copenhagen entitled Fashioning Sudan. And that is all about um, reconstructing different narratives of identity from dress practices. Thank you. Thank you, Elsa. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I think we kept to the time. I must say I was also like, like that. I cannot hear you. I don't know why. I think we, <laughs> we kept the time. So we have still like a few minutes still left not. for discussion. If, if anybody I can't hear like. you, Magda. Am I the only one? You can't hear me? Uh, Elsa, can you hear us? Sorry, it was my bad. Okay, so we have two computers following the same conference in the same room. <laughs> I hope you don't have YouTube on top of it. <laughs> okay, uh, does, uh, is there anybody who would like to ask a question? Uh, yes, I see Petra, you raise your hand, please. Yeah, thank you Elsa for this uh, insight into this very rare garment. Um, the loincloth, and um, I wanted to mention there is one very similar loincloth in the Coptic Museum in Cairo, which is published in a catalog recently. Do you know it? I don't know the new catalog, but it might be um, because some of this uh, loincloth and some of these pieces from Cassie Brim I know has been sent a long ah. time ago um, to Cairo and and Nettie Adams kind of like uh, talked to them and gave a few rather old like black and white pictures and several publications. But I never had the chance to really hunt them down and to know where they are now. And because we, all the um, like reshuffling of the textile collection lately uh, due to the clothing, closing of the textile museum, the change of the, the gem and all that, I am very happy to know that you found one at the Coptic Museum. I never had the chance to go, so I'm very interested in the publication indeed. Yeah. yeah, okay, I will send you uh, uh, scans of it, and yeah. uh, I, uh, I don't know the, the size from the top of my head, the size of the object, but uh, the shape and the decoration is nearly identical, so, yeah. Um, yeah. I think all in all, I have been able to trace 19 uh, pieces that belong to this very specific loincloth plus apron um, assemble, um, I would say, garments, like uh, worn together. And most of the time, all of them actually, beside the one I showed today, are adult sizes. Um, a lot of them come from Cassie Brim. And I think those like older example that uh, Niti Adam studied briefly must hopefully be together in Cairo. So hopefully at the Coptic Museum then. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other questions on YouTube, so I will allow myself just a very short one uh, regarding the apron uh, decorated with um, uh, with uh, one, two, three, the blue. Uh, sorry, the, the the word escapes me. But the, the the first apron you showed with the blue applique. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know if the blue cotton tabby is this tight? Or... Uh, this is a good question. To be honest, I have been uh, studying this piece quite a long time ago when maybe my eyes were not as familiar <laughs> with this uh, type of things. So far, I can see in this type of like meritic cotton garment, uh, it's the threads who are dyed. So after spinning, mm -hmm. and you can see that because when you sort of like open yeah. the thread, you can see the thread is white inside. I don't have example of piece dyed textiles so Neither far the material that's why i asked you yeah. i checked that. i checked yesterday in my notes and i did note it was dyed after spinning so if i can trust my old self then that's my my opinion but i i, I think i would like to go see this uh, piece again it would be great if we could also have better pictures uh, that shows both sides 
because at the time I, it was impossible to turn it over. I can see that Nahun has asked uh, if I mentioned the date. I may not have mentioned it. It was written in the slide. It's uh, We don't have like a real radiocarbon date on this uh, piece, but probably first, second, maybe third, but I would say first or second century CE. Yeah. Okay then, so uh, I think we can now proceed to our next speakers, Elsa, once again. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so um, the next paper will be delivered by uh, Egle Kumpikaite and Daiva Milasine. Uh, so Egle Kumpikaite uh, graduated from Kaunas University of Technology and after a few years, uh, working as a woven uh, fabric designer, uh, she completed her doctoral uh, dissertation in the same university in 2004. Since then, she worked uh, here as an associated professor. Uh, and one of the main topic of her scientific work is the analysis and investigation of folk textile and uh, its reconstruction. Uh, Daiva Nilasjene uh, graduated from Kaunas Polytechnic Institute uh, and obtained her PhD at the Kaunas University of Technology um, in 2005. She took uh, part in many uh, international uh, projects and internships uh, in many countries such as Latvia, Poland, or Czech Republic. Uh, recently, she worked on a project uh, dedicated uh, to acquisition of antibacterial copper particle layers and their application to long-term protection measures. And currently, she's uh, engaged in uh, Lithuanian Ukrainian cooperation program and Erasmus study program projects related to ethnographic textiles. And uh, today, they will present us a paper um, entitled The Woman's Merit of Statues According to the Headdress in Northeast Lithuania. And I'm giving you uh, the floor now. Thank you very much. Hello to everybody. Just a minute, I will share my slides. <clears throat> Just a minute. Do you see? Absolutely. In slides. Yes. Okay. So I am Aglia, and uh, I prepared this presentation with my colleague and friend Daiva. Uh, and at first, uh, I will talk about uh, the topic of presentation. And uh, then, uh, very short, uh, Daiva will show a few reconstructions of uh, folk textile. Uh, so, <clears throat> The marital status of Lithuanian women can be predicted only according to their headdresses. Married women uh, cover their head very carefully and going out uh, of home without headdress was very reprehensible. However, the girls uh, could go without headdress or the headdress was uh, more open. The aim of uh, my presentation is to analyze and predict Lithuanian um, women uh, marital status according to their headdress. Uh, uh, there are five um, uh, different ethnographic regions in Lithuania, but today I will talk just about the uh, northeastern ethnographic region uh, called Oksteitia. <clears throat> Girls uh, wore crowns in all Lithuanian regions and in Oxitia as well. Crowns were hats with the open top. Uh, they were used during different fests and uh, sewn. So, so uh, from multicolored sashes and ribbons, which were folded and laid one to each other to the hard background. 
They were decorated with beads, blister, and laces. A bundle of loose ribbons also were attached to them for decoration. The other kind of uh, crowns in Ukshtetia were gallon. Uh, they were made from brocade ribbons of golden or silver color of different weight. Uh, they were sewn with a yellow red background in such a way that it would be visible through the edges of gallon. As you can see around the Brocade gallon is a thin red background. <clears throat> the girls wrapped the gallon around their heads, crossed the ends at the back of their heads, and fastened silk ribbons for decoration. Uh, also, kolpoki were used uh, in uh, Okshtetia. Kolpoki were headdress of bridesmaids. They were made from cardboard, colorful paper, paper and ribbons. Their top was usually decorated with artificial flowers. Kerchiefs, kerchiefs uh, were worn every day by married women and girls in Ukshtetia. To the middle of the 19th century, they were linen white, rare, checked white with red or blue. From the middle of the 19th century, uh, the both yellowish or cashmere with flowers and especially uh, white embroidered with white threads, kerchiefs became popular. The kerchiefs were tied uh, under the chin in this ethnographic region. Yats uh, were worn by varied married women in Ukshtetia. They were sewn from linen, woolen, silk, velvet, sometimes brocade fabrics, crocheted from cotton threads. Some of them covered only the top of the head. The other ones covered all the head and were tied under the chin. In Ukshtetia, the hats with the ears uh, sewn from better fabric were worn. The hats were of one color, white or motley. From the beginning of the 19th century, women wore kerchiefs under the hats. Wimple was uh, wimple in the last two pictures was one of the oldest dress of married women in Ukshtetia, worn for every day and for fests. Uh, their length was uh, three, four meters. <coughs> when it is thrown over her head, both ends of it uh, reach the ground. And its weight was 50, 70 centimeters. The thin uh, and white linen fabric decorated with uh, the most often with red cotton, uh, both thread uh, called jichkai, 
was used for the wimple. Mm. And uh, bending the wimple is quite complicated. Uh, it is very archaic uh, Lithuanian women had dress, but uh, it uh, was worn in this ethnographic region uh, uh, even until uh, the middle of the 20th century. And the conclusions, the marital status of northeastern Lithuanian region of Shtetia, women uh, can be predicted only according to their headdress. Married women cover their head very carefully, and um, the girls could go without headdress or their a headdress was open and did not cover their hair. So, thank you for your attention. Sorry, my <laughs> presentation is not very long. <laughs> so, thank you. Uh, and now, I am sorry. Uh, no, no, I, no, I okay. give, uh, I I I give uh, uh, the word to Daiva. <laughs> yeah. That's what I understood. Very, yes, for a very short. <laughs> very short word. <laughs> I am. Um, can I uh, uh, share some photos? Okay. Um, I will um, show you uh, uh, what it looks like in reconstruction of national costumes today in our ensemble. Um, yes, Daiva songs uh, in some uh, ensemble of uh, folk dances and uh, songs. Uh, you can see or not, you see? Yes, I am grandmother and my uh, variant is only this. Um, this is... Wimple. Um, Wimple. Yes. Um, it, it, it is in one side and in second. Yes. It's, and it, uh, it is in action. You can see also women with this variant. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you, Daiwa. It makes this uh, costumes uh, much more living than just someone pictures. So it's, uh, it's really nice to see them moving. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do we have any questions, comments, reacts for uh, to the presentations of um, Egle and Daiva? Uh, I know we have a short lag with YouTube, but uh, among the speakers. Okay, so if not, uh, I guess we can proceed to the next paper because today we have a long day with four sessions. So. I think we all be happy to not make it more longer than it was planned. Uh, so our next uh, speaker today is uh, Yeva Pigozna. She's a researcher of Latvian history, uh, dress history, and she presently works at the Institute of Latvian History at the University of Latvia. She's the author of two monographs on the colors of Baltic archaeological textiles and development of Lat Latvian peasants dressed through centuries. Uh, her recent, recent postdoctoral research project was devoted to the dress of the Eastern Latvia in the 19th century. And uh, she will present us today her reflections of person's age in peasant's dress of the 19th century Latvia. Uh, Yeva, the floor is yours. Thank you. I hope you hear me. Uh, first, I must say that the title of my paper should rather be Reflections of Person's Age Group in peasant's dress of the 18th and 19th century Latvia. 
the focus of my research is on the lower classes of society, peasants, servants, and craftspeople living in the current territory of Latvia. Mostly I concentrate on the traditional clothing that was worn before the transition to the European town fashion. This transition took place starting from the middle of the 19th century in Riga area and spreading further to the rural, rural areas in the 1860s. The last wearers of traditional dress have been documented in two parishes in the southwestern part of Latvia in the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. The vast majority of written visual and material sources of Latvian dress are about adults. The available information on the dress of children, teenagers, and even elderly people is very scarce. For example, from more than 500 of material sources from the eastern part of Latvia stored in the museums, none have belonged to children. Therefore, all the other sources are of even greater importance. This makes look, uh, this paper looks for the evidence on the sets of clothing of Latvian children, teenagers and young adults in the end of the 18th century and throughout the 19th century. The research is based on thorough analysis of images, material and written sources, such as descriptions of traditions that are stored at the National History Museum of Latvia, Latvian National uh, Academic Library and Latvian Folklore Archives. The aim is to find out whether there were specific garments or wearing practices or lack of garments that were connected to a particular age of young peasants in pre and early industrial era. The focus of the presentation is on the practices of wearing footwear, trousers, headgear, and outerwear by various age groups of young Latvian peasants, starting with babies. Uh, till they were close to one year old, children were tied in nappies that were made of worn out linen and woolen garments of their parents. Usually the sources mention linen nappies made of the back parts of father's shirts and the woolen nappies made of mother's skirts. The whole package was tied with a sash. As to small children, both boys and girls who had started walking till they were at least a couple of years old, there seems to be a tendency that the earlier the time, the poorer the family, the less modern the community, the longer a single linen shirt remained the only clothing for the child. There are many sources talking about a shirt as everyone's first piece of clothing. Small children whose only clothing was a linen shirt stayed at home and did not go outdoors when the weather was cold. They lived indoors the whole winter and if they had to be transported anywhere, they were wrapped in blankets. There are Christmas folk songs mentioning small children running barefoot in the snow to meet Christmas arriving. Many of the childhood memories that documented as late as the Second World War contain complaints about freezing and especially freezing feet when children had to graze household animals. It is unclear at what age small girls started to wear additional garments as skirts, shawls, and headwear, as none of the sources I have examined contain such information. In these drawings, we can see that the smallest child is still wearing a single linen shirt, while the older children were, are wearing more garments. Here again, um, yeah, in the photographs from the 1860s, we can also see that the more time went on, the earlier children started to wear skirts or trousers, especially for festive occasions. Footwear, however, often remained to be the last addition to one's wardrobe. Uh, here again are two barefoot children who are grazing animals. It appears that they are about eight years old and have already got more garments to wear 
however, no footwear. The other boy has got one piece leather shoes and he is wearing trousers. Most likely, this drawing shows a common practice when boys wore father's worn out trousers with shortened legs. In the next slide, we can see a small barefoot girl traveling together with her family. All adults have footwear, but the little girl does not. As footwear was rather expensive and children were growing fast, it was often not considered necessary or reasonable to make footwear for children. Many of the documented memories also mention having one pair of footwear for several siblings so that uh, they can share. On the right, we can see a bride with a square crown and two small girls in front of her. They have full sets of clothing, and these are the earliest full sets of children's clothing that are documented in sources from the 18th and 19th century. Maybe they are fully dressed because of the occasion, I mean wedding. There are fewer vis visual sources where teenagers' clothing is documented. However, it seems that after children reached 10, to 12 years of age, they started to wear clothing that was more and more similar to that of the adult members of the community. Sometimes those were pieces of damaged clothing, like the cap on the right, worn out, ad uh, worn out by adults, like the set of clothing on the left, or borrowed from adults and therefore too big, like the apron in the middle. The analyzed sources suggest that several traditions of wearing clothing by teenagers and young adults were determined not only by their age, but also by preparing to get married in the near future. There were some pe peculiar traditions that involved clothing that were observed by young people who were either coming of age to get married or willing to get married. One of such traditions involves wearing trousers. However, the visual sources suggest that boys got to wear trousers rather early. There are several written sources giving more and sometimes contradicting information. From the last quarter of the 19th century, there is a description that mentions boys wearing trousers from the age of six. There are, however, interviews with informants who refer to old times when boys got trousers much later at the age of 10 and even 16 or 18. This seemed to be unbelievable until I encountered a description of a wedding tradition that was documented in the Eastern part of Latvia. It says that if a young man wants to get married, he has to perform a very important tradition that proves that he is ready for that. Namely, he must jump from the roof of the house straight into the trousers. If he can do that, he can get married. If not, he has to wait for the next year and try again. On the one hand, this seems to be a joke. But on the other hand, it may contain evidence about that young boys really got their trousers only when they were going to get married. Another piece of evidence is a funny story telling about a young man who was not used to wearing trousers and forgot to put them on when proposing to a girl. The girl noticed his exposed, exposed genitals, got scared and refused. Earlier, we thought that this is just a joke or a severe exaggeration. However, already two pieces of written evidence seem to point in the same direction. Unfortunately, it is unclear to what time period this peculiar tradition belongs, as most of the written sources that are stored at the Latvian folklore archives are not dated. Most likely, this specific tradition was not practiced so late as during the second half of the 19th century. As to the girls, a clear sign of coming of age was that a girl started to wear a crown and literally signaled that she was considered grown up and could get married. Apparently she had started menstruating. As soon as the girl got married, 
the crown was replaced by a head covering hiding her hair, for example, a cat. The tradition of wearing a crown as a symbol of a young girl began in the 17th century and disappeared by the 1840s. So this practice must have been popular sometime during that period. If the girl wanted to get married sooner, the signs she could give were decorating her crown with flowers and or singing louder and more actively. There are, however, hundreds of folk songs where the girls sing about their crowns, how good it is to have a crown and how badly they do not want to give it away and wear a cap. Another peculiar tradition that was connected to mythical perceptions was that young unmarried girls were not advised to show their bare feet to strangers. This is apparently the age when it became most important for girls to possess a pair of shoes. Another piece of clothing that could be worn only by girls who were considered grown up and could get married was a woolen shoulder shawl with elaborate colorful embroideries. Such shawls were popular starting with the last quarter of the 18th century and they went out of fashion during the 1840s and 50s. They are several, there are several written sources talking about a young girl making such a shawl while preparing for potential marriage in the near future. None of these texts mentions how old the girls were when they started to wear a crown or an embroidered shawl. However, they refer to preparing for getting married. This may indicate that the age was approximate and being considered a grown-up depended rather on the person's physical and mental matureness, which, is, which in turn was closely connected to producing offspring and being able to take care of one's household and family. Some of my observations regarding becoming of age. It seems that although teenagers at the age of 14, 12, or even earlier already started to wear clothing that was similar to that of adults, becoming of age was usually around the age of 16 to 18. If a person had grown up, they were supposed to get married. There was no free choice of whether to do that or not. Both for girls and boys, there was no such adulthood that was not connected to getting married. Either the person got married or after reaching the age of 25 for girls and over 30 for men was considered a spinster or a bachelor. That was a negative status that included teasing and being laughed at. In the 18th and beginning of the 19th century, this mandatory preparing for marriage was reflected in clothing as all girls who had reached adulthood had to wear a crown, and if they could afford it, they were embroidering a wooden shawl. There is, however, no evidence what happened to unmarried men in regard to wearing trousers. Apparently, no sources mention bachelors walking around with, without wearing trousers. Summing up, I would like to say that the analyzed sources suggest that several traditions of wearing clothing by teenagers and young adults were determined not only by their age, but also by mandatory preparing to get married in the near future. There were some peculiar traditions that involved clothing that were observed by young people who were either coming of age to get married or willing to get married. Several of analyzed traditions could be common in a larger geographical area, or they could have been common over a longer period of time, reaching back in history. And thus, I hope, they could help fellow researchers to understand practices of other territories or time periods. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Eva. Also, I mean, for the presentation and also for keeping the time. We, we were went very fast. <laughs> you have still some minutes left, which is good because we then like reduce our <laughs> uh, yeah uh, the, the few minutes we we took to, uh, before for discussion and which makes us uh, start later. Uh, 
Is there any reaction, any questions or comments to uh, Yeva uh, presentation? Please feel free to to unmute and and ask. If not, I will allow myself to ask just about a detail I show, which was I found quite intriguing. Uh, it's this kind of uh, circular. I don't know. It's a pendant or a collar because sometimes it's appear like on the shirt, but sometimes it seems to be attached to the cloak. Uh, I. It's something I have never seen before. It's really intriguing. Is something typical from that region or <laughs> could you it's, tell us more? <laughs> yeah it's a brooch the smaller ones were usually used for fastening the neck opening of the uh, shirt and the bigger ones were used for fastening a shoulder shawl and I guess that uh, they are quite beautiful maybe I need to make another presentation sometime in the future about them Yes, yes. <laughs> they seem so big on some of these mm -hmm. uh, of these pictures. And uh, if, if I may, just a second question: uh, the, all the illustration you showed us, uh, um, in which context are they produced? I mean, are they just illustration from what like, from newspapers, from books, from cards? Uh, I don't just. Mm. Uh, most of the drawings I. I uh, showed are made by people who were interested in how to say ethnogra ethnography around them. So they were just drawing them. But uh, the photographs were made for the uh, first ethnographic exhibition of the Russian Empire that took place in 1867. So before that, the photographs were taken when they were preparing for the exhibition. Otherwise, they are. Um, not connected to special um, reasons. Only in the last uh, slide, there was a couple standing and they are also made in purposefully for um, like telling how the costumes were. That's it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any, any comment on YouTube so far. So if there is nobody wanted to ask anything uh, more, let's go. And now it's uh, our last speaker today in this session. And I am very pleased to introduce now uh, Pinelope Laliotti, who is a conservator of, uh, conservator of antiquities and works of art. Uh, so her fascination for the Greek folk uh, tradition led her to research and study the local costumes of Greece and to specialize in the conservation of textiles. Uh, since 1997, she has been a member of the Orpheus Greek Dance Group. And so not only she was participating in the performances, but also she was responsible for the editing of the group's costume collections. Uh, she benefits from many, many years uh, in uh, administra administration of cultural structures. Uh, she worked uh, in uh, numerous museums and uh, she aims to uh, contribute at dissemination of the Greek cultural industry and to the preservation of the ethnic cultural heritage. And today she will talk us about Greek traditional costumes through the perspective of women and age. Penelope, the floor is yours. Hello, good evening from me. So glad to be here with you. Should I share uh, my screen? Yes, please. Okay, can you see it? Yes. Okay, that's good. Well, clothing, apart from uh, beginning being an element of material culture, is also a language of communication. Language is an integral part of personal, social, ethnic, and national identities because it sets our cultural and social boundaries. Over time, and as the cultures evolved, the faction of, tex uh, the faction of textile shifted from a very, very simple purpose, which was to cover and protect the body, to other aspects related to values, attitude, character, position, condition, etc., so that in the end, the garment has the ability to speak for their user. So in the case of clothing, people dress in order to express their culture, religion, prestige, power, personality, self-esteem, social and cultural identity. Although clothing is considered- and ask, Your presentation is not uh, in full screen, is, is not the, the I, I don't know, it's uh, like, because we don't see the slides changing and if it's intentional, it's, it's fine. Changing. 
it's not supposed to change yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Sorry for that interruption. <laughs> Okay, so so I was uh, sorry. <clears throat> Although clothing is considered an element of material culture, it involves meaning. But you can hear me. Yes, we yes. can. We just can't see it in um, full screen. Do you have your presentation in full screen? Yes, I do. It's okay. You don't have to see me. Okay. <laughs> the presentation was, is more interesting than me. <laughs> Although clothing is considered an element of material culture, it involves meanings that must be understood for an overall picture of collective human behavior. According to Bart, the grammar is the significance of basic significance, the way or the degree of participation of the person who wears it. In modern green culture, the semiology of clothing is expressed through folk costumes, which have a great variety of symbolism and types. In sense, the costume assumes the role of a dialectical relationship between the transmitter, the one who, who wears it, and the receiver, the one who reads the message. An apparel in a whole structure from elements and rules, which if disturbed, will lead to a new structure. The examples of in symbols of communication codes in uh, Greek costumes are countless. How important it was to have the symbols uh, on the clothes was not always done unconsciously. The quality of the materials and the embroidery were invaluable signs of a social satisfaction. Foreign travelers in Greece are the first to record and display Greek costumes from the 15th century, travelers conveyed fantastic and real elements to the painters who undertook to illustrate the books of travel in person in some woodcuts, lithographs, copper plates, drawings. In the following years, painters began to travel more frequently to, to the East and the dispersions of costumes became more accurate. Depiction, sorry. Greek costumes became fashionable at parties of diplomatic circles for disguise in the theater, in albums, and publications. The information about the costume habits during the period of revolution of 1821 comes mainly from the reference of the travelers and from the depictions in representation. Penelope? Yes, Penelope. Sorry to interrupt you. We we still see your first slide. Is this correct? No, I've changed five slides. <laughs> okay, I, I oh, think no. I, 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 I think you for, okay. for changing the slides you have to go to full screen. If you I don't go, full. no, but we don't see full screen. Yeah, perhaps uh, you didn't try again. Your, okay, you have to yeah to choose the correct screen when sharing, perhaps. Okay, now you see. Yeah, but not but not full screen. Um, so please go to the. Yeah, yeah, now it changes. Yeah, you can see that now it changes. I won't go to yeah. full screen then. If you can yeah. see now. Yeah, we can see that now. Okay, it changed. Okay. 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 Foreign travelers in Greece are the first to record and display Greek costumes. From the 15th century, travelers conveyed fantastic and uh, real elements to painters who undertook to illustrate the books of travel, impressions in some woodcut, lithographs, copper plates, drawing. In the following years, painters began to travel more frequently to the East, and the depiction of the costumes became more accurate. Greek costumes became fashionable at parties of diplomatic cycles for disguising the theater in albums and publications. The information about the costume habits during the period of revolution um, 1821 comes mainly from a reference of the travelers and from the depictions in representations. These traditional costumes could be characterized as hidden codes for anyone who knows how to read the symbols, he can find a huge amount of information reflected on them. Most of the Greek folk costume types that have reached today are consolidated in the 18th and 19th centuries, and they were worn in Greece until the 70s. 
women's clothing of the time placed particular emphasis on individual characteristics, values, perspective, relationships with the opposite sex, age, marital status, knowledge of animal and plant kingdom, time, geographical origin, religious belief, beliefs, professional activity, social status, technology, etc. The strict iconography of the Byzantine period did not leave much room for depictions of the clothing choices of this period, so very little is known about the evolution of traditional clothing. In their evolution, the costume began to be consolidated with mixtures from Byzantium, the East and the Western influence. The costume question as a characteristic of a group living in Greece. There are some de generalizations that can be made about the costume and their styles. The Greek costume retains elements from antiquity while it differs from region to region. The sections of the costume set in many areas, they had a similar shape and name, but every place wore it depending on the needs of the geographical area. For example, the costumes of the mainland and of the islands are different, and with an abstract effort, women's costume can be divided into two sections of purely Byzantine origin, and the one with the Byzantine roots merges the clothes with the Western Renaissance. According to the classification and from time to time rankings, another general division of costume can be depending on the use in festive, everyday, the bridal, and based on the geographical division, into mountain, plain, uh, island, and urban. Local clothing is based on uniformity, so it offers the local, the confidence, and the comfort that uniformity offers in a conservative society without embracing the element of change, but conservative and stability, such giving magical properties in parts of the costume. The manufacture of traditional costume occupy the mothers immediately after the birth of their children, including the preparation of their dowries. Every woman from a very young age had to learn, among other things, how to process wool and was also required to learn to spin, wave, knit, sew, a brother, and generally know how to work with raw materials. With her public presence, she sought her readiness and maturity for her next level in her life which was naturally marriage. Marriage was the most important social and religious celebration in a woman's life. She was then the center of attention in the social environment the moment that the girl became a woman. Traditional costumes did not follow the fashion of the area, but they were influenced by fashion. The changes were small, the pace low, because in traditional society, any change had to have the general acceptance of the members of the community. Complete costume the woman wears when she becomes a bride. She put all her passion to create her own unique dress that she will wear uh, later in official occasions and she will accompany her to the tuner to eternity. The wedding dress was designed in details and its manufacture lasted months, resulting in a semantic uh, abundance of uh, messages which was exp expressed with jewelry and colors, embroidery deco decorative elements, and layering of fabrics and textures. The features that had in common from any region in Greece was the exaggeration, jewelry, uh, many embroideries uh, covered the whole body of the bride, making the costume particularly heavy, in some cases over 30 kilos. Women's clothing focus on highlighting the significant changes in the age of women in the society, such as not only married, but when to have children, when to become a mother-in-law, and when to become a grandmother. The costume of the young girl, it marked with elements from those of engaged, the marriage, and the new yet, the woman with children, the widow, and the old woman. Each place had its own way to an special element that marked these changes. It should be noted that these relationships are physical or mainly social aids with the various type of costumes with, which are determined by unwritten laws of the community, apply mainly to who 
to those who are worn as formal out in the society, as they used to say. The formal attire had to be in line with social age and social status. In the region of Western Thessaly, the population group of Karagunes lived there mainly. The age and the material status of Karagunes women is clearly reflected on their clothing. The most characteristic uh, of the costume uh, is the saya, is a type of a sleeveless coat from which the whole costume, the sayades or the Karagunica, take its name. The red sayas was a wedding dress whose red felt or satin sleeve characterized the bride so much that they had to be covered after five or 10 years of marriage. She who has been married for 20 years is not allowed to dress in bright colors, but she had to choose something darker. Other basic pieces are the shirt, the neckchief, the cavadi, the rasso, and the vest. Additional pieces are the apron and the headband. From the bridal and the festive costumes, there are the jewelry of the torso, the apron, and a different headband. The female apron of the wider areas also signaled the changes in the woman's life. The wedding apron was the most important, the apron that marked the changes in the woman's life. Then she had the mother's uh, apron, the mother-in-law, and finally when she replaced it with an old uh, lady's uh, apron. The good apron, the gold embroidered, was worn on official days by girls, brides, and the new brides over the second apron. The shirt has the same shape in all the variants of a Karaguna costume. It was embroidered around the neck, on the hem and on the sleeves. The sleeves of the festive or wedding dress are different from everyday ones and the Karagunes change them depending on the occasion. The ends of the sleeves and the hem are decorated with black tassels in everyday life and black with colorful tassels in the bridal and festive shirt. In Muri, the tassel was removed from the shirt and the embroidery is dyed black. The unmarried girls wore the white shirt until uh, their wedding day, about up to 20 years old. Married women at other formal in bed wore the wedding dress with the embroidery apron, adding a silverware as appropriate. Only from the shirt which a woman wore, one could define approximately her age, mainly the social one, that it was the years of her marriage. Because after the wedding, the girl was passing to another social group, the, the active and the responsible members of the community. It was no longer the physical age, how old is she that counted, but the social one, the years of the marriage. In another region in Greece, we find a very special costume of the area he does in Alexandria. The costume was customary in 50 villages of region called Rumluki in Macedonia in northern Greece. The name of the area comes from Turkish and means Greek place. The pellicular costume of a woman with the original handband is signs of the Greek origin of the place. The characteristic handband of the Rumurkial costume, the so-called katsuli, it was made of three kerchief and the legend wants to represent an ancient helmet. The children's handband was replaced by a single kerchief with dark patterns from which the girl's brains uh, project when the girl was over eight uh, up to uh, 33 years old. Entering adolescence marks the next change from the moment she enters Adolescence, until her marriage, the girl changed the hair, her, her headband. She wears the hair uh, kerchief, the cheberi, decorated with flowers and embroidery. In this headband appears for the first time the maligutari, the rich change we can see here in this photo, whose quantity of change determines the financial situation of girl's father. 
The bridal headband that starts to be worn on the wedding day is the tassel, and it's the most impressive and the most famous. As a married woman, from the moment she gives birth to her first child about a year after the marriage, the woman begins to remove decorative accessories from her hairband. As the woman grows older, the jewelry is removed and replaced by a scarf that covers the cheeks and the jaw. So we have the katsuli of the middle aged woman. The sayas of a Rumulkian costume was worn over the shirt and was usually salt sleeved. The section of sayas from the middle and the below were three and they were called obix. The two parts of uh, obix were called aprons and they were tuned over and their two ends were uh, supported in the back waist and under the belt so they that they form two embroidery triangles. This way, the back of the sayas looked like it was all decorated. The girls first wore a saya when she was reached when she reached the age of 15, and it is considered that it's, it's the age that it, she can be married. The role of the bent aprons was to show off the luxury of the woman. So women wore aprons uh, weekdays and holidays until it was decided it was time to stop wearing aprons. For example, a woman with many children was not allowed to have a false saya, and when she was asked, she typically asked her that she is too old and she cannot fold the aprons. The same was true for those who had, be, uh, who had become mothers-in-law or had some grief in the family. The kerchief of the costume was a square uh, fabric uh, with an opening uh, in the middle. The way the kerchief was, wo was worn was different from a married, from a mother or another woman that uh, the way unmarried young women wore it. Those who had many children and were married for many years had to close their necks in front of the chest so that the color set would not be visible, which was done by the young women who were proud for their youth. The other woman, on the other hand, wrapped her neck in a dark blue or brown sweater and tied it uh, at her chest so in the ages were, were visible. In the island of Carpathos, in the village Olibos, the firstborn daughter of a large uh, landowner, before getting married on the big holidays and in some special uh, events, wore a gold jewelry, the Colaina. The circle of Colaina closed on the day of her wedding which she wore it for the last time, and then she kept it away until she had a daughter, and the circle will start again from the beginning. A girl who was uh, wearing colaina, uh, it was the firstborn, and she had a real estate, and it was a way to express it by wearing this jewelry. On the island of Corfu, the vest of the female costume, the so-called pisli, is a compliment of a wedding attire, a gift from uh, the groom to the bride and followed her to the festive appearance of the woman for the rest of her life. The jewelry that accompanied the wedding or the festive uh, costume were uh, many and precious. During uh, um, a woman uh, lost uh, her husband, they threw the ornaments and uh, they wore black uh, head scarves or a black ribbon on uh, the white slips of the head and. Uh, if their husband died young, they put in the coffin the red ribbons of the headband. In the island of Astipalea, the set of the bridal dress was cotton long with white embroidered sleeves and hem. Also, on the hem, the depiction of the embroidery were interwoven with tradition and condition of the woman who wore the set. Her father's profession was uh, the one that mainly gave uh, the theme to the boundary. For example, if the father was a culture brinder, then the daughter embroidered similar images with sheep. If she, if he was from Egypt, she embroidered camels and so on. 
So we can find out that the costume was were usually made and brought at home by themselves and the women of the family. Although the handmade way of making the costumes and the financial uh, situation of the family makes the costume unique for each woman, however, she could not escape from the dress type of each place. The semantics and the codes of the, her age and the marital status of the woman wearing the costume must be recognizable. In a strict and traditional society of the time, the woman was essentially obligated to wear her age. The most important moments in woman's uh, age, calls that uh, are imprinted on her costume, are when she reaches the age of marriage, reproduction, mother-in-law, and widow. The marital status, the financial situation of the father or the husband, in sense in the position of the woman in the society, was determined and reflected in the clothes of the time. The attire of the woman of the time was determined by social conventions and so on. I think we have changed until now in Greece. <laughs> I hope. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Penelope, for this very rich presentation. And thank you also for keeping the time. You had a lot of uh, material and you go smoothly through. So <laughs> thank you. I was happy I have not to cut you and, and to follow you until the end. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think we see, it's really fascinating to see how in many various regions of Europe, we see that like the headdress is something which like is really an important object of expression of, of uh, feminine identity. I think yeah. this is the most uh, important I think. Uh, yeah, I think even coming back to what Francisco showed is this like the morning also, yes, it's like, yeah, since ages. We, <laughs> yeah, independently of, of the time and, and uh, area, it's, it's really fascinating. Uh, does anybody has any question or comment to the presentation of Penelope? I will just give one minute more to, to check YouTube because I think they have just still short lag. But if not, I will not go on with any concluding remarks for today. I would just very uh, warmly uh, thank all the speakers from the last session, but also from the three other sessions we got yesterday. I think it was a very rich uh, rich day uh, full of very fascinating presentations uh, and think to yeah many elements to think about and to discuss uh, I must ask is Francisco because I don't know who between Francisco of, of, or Paula is managing the zoom because I think like if Francesca and Petra would like to finish their discussion I'm okay with that but if that implies that Francisco has to stay longer and manage YouTube perhaps no I can I'm managing zoom. So Francisco okay. can cut. Yeah, I think, we can YouTube. free you because Francisco was not supposed to manage that, and he was so kind and helped us today. So, so yeah, perhaps we can just like yeah, if, if you want just to finish this uh, very interesting discussion about the yeah possible recycle of this uh, inwoven clavi and and other um, woven patterns, yeah. Yes, I I would like to ask. Uh, um uh, professor Petra <laughs> inside. To me, she's a professor. Petra, Petra, Petra. Petra, Petra. Uh, I I would like to, to ask you if you could uh, in tell me uh, the works in which you have established that. Uh, during at least classical times, uh, clavi were woven and not um, sewed. To me, it would be uh, very important. Very useful. Even yes. if it looks like something irrelevant, but on the side of law, it is. Mm -hmm. I see. <clears throat> Because I have noticed that many other scholars were all, um, I don't know, going from one theory to another. None of them uh, were consistent to each other. Mm. Yeah. But if I, you I, if you like, I, you can think about it. And yes, I will. I will think about it. 
I will think about it and then I will uh, com uh, compile some uh, bibliographic okay. in, uh, suggestion. Uh, as I mentioned in my paper, I, the, what I introduced in my paper is not uh, very uh, new or genuine. There, there are a lot of scholars which were working with all these um, uh, ideas and the, the change from um, weaving to, cha uh, to shape to cutting to shape. This is a very old story in, in textile archaeology. This is not new. Yes. Um, but I will um, send you some uh, bibliographic uh, references. Yes. Yes. Do you, do you need um, my email? Um, yes. Okay. Uh, I, I can. Yeah, you can send it by chat, or I think you will find it in this Euro web mailing. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So we will do it this way. Yeah. Okay. And from an archaeological perspective, I would just like to add that I mean I find it uh, completely normal that I mean it was a time-consuming activity, and we can imagine that. Some parts of the tunic were worn with the time, and so of course, uh, given given the the, the time uh, you know necessary to woven this uh, clavi, it seems to me very logical that at some point the, the, this precious part was like cut and sewn on a new tunic. It was, of course, it was not the same value. I think if you sew a band instead of weaving uh, woving it in. But I would think it would be not something which I found shocking or like unreasonable to think about, yes? Because we are aware, I think, even in the archaeological material that many like more precious pieces, they were reused, yes? Kept and reused. So yeah, in this way, it can make sense for me. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. So thank you very much to all of you. And uh, you. I hope uh, we will meet again tomorrow at yes. 9 uh, Central okay. European summer time. <laughs> Thanks to everybody and enjoy your thank evening. Thank you so much. Yes. See you tomorrow. Uh, I would like that I won't be able to attend the other two days because I have previews heavy engagements um, at university. So I apologize. No uh, worries. No worries. I think we are all very, you know, we have all tight schedules today. Also, Cecily had to leave earlier. It's perfectly normal. But we thank you. We had your presentation okay. today. It was okay. a very good contribution. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you all. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.